prologue. Clan Sable had an eye for spectacular locations, and in a court jaded by centuries of tinsel and frippery, the talent had a certain dark appeal. At the very least, their choices would spark off a frenzy of one-upmanship as the other fairy clans sought to offer wilder, madder thrills. Acheron had been a choice of genius. On this plane of existence, the entire universe seemed to be trying to smash itself to pieces. A vast infinity of air suspended countless turning cubes of iron. The sepia-tinted atmosphere sizzled with electricity as lightning arched insane shapes between the cubes, leaving brilliant violet trails scorched on the eye. The cubes were tiny worlds, and the worlds tumbled like dice. Here and there the cubes collided, the noise ringing through space like titanic bells. Fragments of iron and helpless little bodies went tumbling free into space, while far away... Wars and violence went ever on. The place stank of lightning strike, of the hammer and forge reek of the smashing cubes, and the rusty stench of blood. The Seely Court was unconcerned. They were the fairy, the deadly sword point of a secret world. Although Queen Titania and the Sylvan Powers held state in distant plains, they used the fairy as their hands, their eyes, and their ears. Sinking deeper and deeper into their introverted world, the sylvan powers now scarcely knew fantasy from reality, and left the power of the Seely court in the hands of the clans. Fairy control over the sylvan powers was absolute, and with power came intrigue, plots and plans, schemes and dreams, Wrapped in glorious isolation, the Seely Court posed and schemed in a frenzy of activity that filled the centuries with a comforting illusion of activity. Sitting languidly upon outcrops of jagged iron and rust, today's gathering had eyes only for the conflict being fought at the bottom of a crater just below them. Two combatants, both male fairies, fought and posed in the battlefield. Small, lithe, and winged like dragonflies, the creatures battled viciously with sword and magic. The duelists were slim and elegant, with clothing gleaned from a dozen exotic planes. Holding absurdly thin little swords, they stood and flung spell after spell at one another in a display full of flash and glory, but rather empty of blood. Spellfire lit and stained imperfections in the metal of the crater, making it glow brilliant green, lavender, and orange. Here and there a fairy gave an appreciative patter of applause, while mortal servants poured out tinctures of fairy wine. Today's duel served as a welcome little diversion. Ushan, lord of Clan Sable, sat beneath a fan waved by one of his servants. It amused him these days to be attended by female orcs, their bestial forms draped in courtly finery. A man much in love with his own image, Ushan raised his glass to another fairy, who wandered over, keeping his eyes upon the fight. Ushan's comrade drew himself up on a stool that had been covered with a lucrata skin. He accepted wine from a serving girl and said, My lord Ushan, my lord Fane. Silver-haired, Ushan had today dressed in robes of animated flame. I trust Acheron suits you well. Well enough, well enough. Lord Fane affected spectacles and a pointed beard, considering himself to be the greatest scholar of the Seely Court. He gave a quiet flutter of his wings. Can you recall the reason for this duel? The usual. Insults. Women. Lord Ushan seemed more interested in watching the slow tumble of a distant iron cube than following the duel. Who remembers? The participants, perhaps? Carefully watching the nearest duelist, Fane slowly stroked at his antennae. Your man Tarquil has quite a touch. Do you have hopes for him? Watching the boy, Ushan appreciatively sipped from his glass. 
His technique has improved. I believe him to be the best duelist in the lower court. He is your sister's son? Lord Fane steepled his fingers, carefully watching the two fairies below as they stabbed spell and counterspell at one another. He likes killing too much. Not a bad thing in a noble. We see too many milksops in the current generation. Too little thirst for blood. Ushan relaxed. All about him spread the seely court, the nobility of fairy. Small winged figures, some remaining elegantly in form and others changing shape as they pleased, lay scattered languidly about. The inhabitants of Acheron had wisely fled. Few creatures ever mistook a fairy for one of the lesser forest folk and escaped to tell the tale. In the crater, spell followed spell. The two battling fairies flew and circled, invisible one moment, then outlined by detection spells in the next. Etiquette demanded non-lethal spells, yet Ushan's nephew stabbed these spells home with vicious intensity. He slammed his opponent back against the ground, sending the fairy skidding along hot rusted metal. Lord Fane narrowed his eyes as he watched the combatants. Splendid isolation is an illusion. We have wasted our intellects on self-aggrandizement. A superior being is allowed aggrandizement. Ushan shot a dark glance toward Lord Fane. Our intelligence makes us strong. The mark of intelligence is the ability to adapt to unseen changes. The mark of intelligence is to prevent the occurrence of any unseen changes. Ushan's lavender eyes sparked. Events are merely sculptures of action made in the medium of time. We can control and shape events to meet our own needs. We are not mere butterflies to be blown along in the winds of any random storm. Matching cold anger with disdain, Lord Fane smoothed his beard. We have already produced one dark goddess from our ranks. She too believed that events could be controlled. All it won her was an eternal prison. Ushan made a sharp motion with his hand. The fairy queen of wind and woe was not a topic for open discussion. Clan Nightshade saw to it, and good riddance to her, and them. A heavy sigh escaped Lord Fane as he sat back in his seat. He took more wine and swirled the amber liquid slowly in his glass as he said, We must speak of Clan Nightshade. Ushan slowly turned a frosty gaze upon the other fairy. They played for power, and they lost. The lesson has kept the lesser houses in line. Once the greatest of fairy houses, Clan Nightshade had been exiled for centuries. Clan Nightshade is no more. Fane speared Ushan with an acidic, mocking gaze. Clan Nightshade is alive. Your clan Sable is aware of it. We are all aware of it. Only a fool would remain ignorant of a potential ally or a potential enemy. They are no longer of the court. Lean and elegant, Lord Ushan held out his glass to his towering serving girls. They have adapted to other worlds. Why should we care for what Nightshade does? Clan Nightshade now has a great deal of experience in the outer worlds, in the material plane in particular. Experience and knowledge are weapons, Ushan. Without weapons, the universe may overtake us, intelligence or no. Lord Fane set his glass aside. Clan Nightshade clipped the wings of the Queen of Wind and Woe. It is a skill we may soon need again. Fane, we have no need to go chasing demons in the outside world. Fane tapped his index fingers carefully together and replied, Yes, we're all too skilled at breeding them from within. The fairy tugged straight his long goatee. If we do not curb the habit, 
It will be the death of us. In the crater below, Ushan's nephew scored a hit, smashing his opponent from his feet. Ignoring the duel, Fane rose to leave. Ushan immediately shot to his feet, his wings spread in fury. Clan Nightshade are outsiders. They are not of the body. Then we need ties. Fane turned away. A means of welcoming them truly back into the family of fairy. It cannot be done. It must be done. The council meets before the Queen Titania tomorrow. I shall propose exactly this. That nightshade be brought back from its exile in the wilds. Ushan flexed his fists, only to feel Fane's voice derisively caressing his rage. Truly, Ushan, turn your intelligence to the task. A new age is being born. Fairy must survive it. Lord Fane rose into the air. We need tools, Ushan. We need weapons. The fairy scholar faded into invisibility and then departed. Left alone with his serving girls, Lord Ushan sat in stony silence. In the crater below, Tarquil wiped his blade above his kill and looked up to meet his uncle's eyes. His thin mouth twisted into a smile. Common Year 588 1. Autumn had stripped the maple trees of their green leaves, carpeting the forest in a deep, damp carpet of flame red and russet brown. The smell of damp and mold was everywhere, strangely fresh and enervating. A man dressed in armor made of black dragon scales plodded silently along the road that meandered through the trees. A shimmering black hellhound pelt hung down his back, the canine's head sitting atop the man's helmet and grinning madly with bright white fangs. The man's hand rested upon a huge sword that jutted through his belt. Heavy hiking boots, a backpack, a coil of rope. It was the equipment of a man who marched fast and slept rough. Shaven-headed, powerful, and suspicious, the Justicar marched his tireless march, his eyes watching the forest for the slightest stir of life. Hovering gaily in midair beside him, wearing an outfit to make a mother scream and a father reach for weapons, Escala the fairy whistled a tune. Two feet tall, her long blonde hair shining straight and free, the fairy traveled without a worry in the world. Along the road behind them rumbled a mule cart driven by a little man with an axe-beak nose. On the cart hung a banner reading, Transports to Adventure. Polk, the teamster, drew in deep breaths of satisfaction as he looked about, as if the forest were a personal construction project in which he took huge pride. Beside the cart padded Enid the Sphinx, brown-haired, smothered in freckles, and enjoying the dappled forest sun immensely. They followed an old overgrown road lined occasionally with the heads of sunken statues, the granite faces of ancient kings frowning down at the travelers. Sparing the statues a brief glare of annoyance, the Justicar adjusted the fit of his hellhound and gave a seething growl. Their road map had finally been found. Polk had been using it as a wrapper for a greasy pile of ham sandwiches. As it turned out, their destination, Homlet, was not in Keoland, as Polk had claimed. Instead, it lay three hundred miles to the northeast. Juss was lost, bruised, battered, and had almost been eaten by a hydra a few miles back. This was not one of his better days. Nursing righteous indignation, Juss shot a dire glance back at Polk where he rode upon the wagon. Keoland, indeed. Happy as a clam, Escala simply shrugged and said, Get off his case. So he got the map upside down. It's the Flaness. With these kind of place names, anyone could make mistakes. Escala happily fluttered her wings. We'll just go north for a few hundred miles, and bam, we'll be in Homlet. Unperturbed by the detour, 
Escala, Polk, and Enid simply seemed to look forward to the journey and enjoyed the views. More concerned with safety, food, shelter, and keeping his companions alive, the Jostakar looked about the forest and seethed. Kieland. I've never been to Kieland before. Well, these autumn leaves are neat. Flying backward, Escala plucked at a huge red maple leaf. Feels kind of homey, like I've been here before. The fact that they were totally lost had made no impression on her. Just looked at her with one raised brow and asked, Have you been here before? Uh, I don't know. Trees? Yeah. Leaves? Yeah. One patch of forest is really pretty amazingly like another. Escala turned around in midair as she flew. But this? She gestured at the slowly crumbling remains of a long-fallen statue. This could be familiar. I know I've seen statues like this somewhere before. I mean, kind of similar. She darted forward down the road. Hey, I know. Let's follow the road. It must lead to a town. Escala, we are following the road. Oh, Hoopy. The road turned a bend, and a row of thatched roofs suddenly met the traveler's eyes. It was a village long deserted and left to the weeds. In a wilderness of deserted buildings, only the squirrels reigned. Cottage doors hung open, some creaking slowly like the sagging bones of the dead. Other houses simply lay cold and empty with thistles sprouting from the thatch roofs. The squirrels sped and flitted from roof to roof, wall to wall, perching atop rusted wagons and twittering atop abandoned plows. They even perched on the faded sign of an old tavern, making the painted boards sway slowly in the wind. War had come and gone. The village lay abandoned, the inhabitants having been wise enough to retreat before powers they could not resist. The buildings were still intact, but were now home to only an occasional nest of sturges. As Enid padded her way down the weed-ridden street, Polk the teamster reined the car to a halt. The sudden silence was deafening. Grim and tired, the Justicar plodded over to the tavern and prodded the door open with his black sword. The gloomy taproom was deserted, all except for a family of voles. Cinders. The hellhound searched with senses far sharper than any mortal's. Sturges, tree hoppers, moss, mold, mouses with tailses, rain puddles, little spiders. No movement. No monsters. No magic. Joss knelt to carefully examine the street. The hard-packed earth was carpeted with weeds, none of which seemed bent or broken by the passing of feet. And no tracks. Hey, look at this. It's a dead elephant. Escala hovered over a broken cottage. Wow, ivory. We could find a fortune in ivory. Joss walked over to the girl and looked at a row of crushed and shattered houses. Lying sprawled amongst the fallen walls was a huge skeleton, easily three times the size of a man. The skeleton's feet were wrapped in moldering boots. A tree limb had served it for a club. It lay long dead, furred with moss and with dandelions growing from the sockets of its eyes. Escala darted above the houses and rubbed her hands in glee. There's another elephant over here! And another! They're not elephants, Escala. They're giants. How do you know? A remarkable lack of elephant-like properties? Joss levered a flaking piece of bone from the top of a giant's chin and passed it up to Cinders. I judged them about sixteen feet tall. They must have driven off the villagers. Sitting on a rooftop, Escala went into a sulk. Well, they could have been elephants. Escala, there are no elephants in the Flaness. How do you know? I'm a ranger. Trust me. Whatever had happened to the village, 
It had happened many years before. The place was clean, no dangers, no enemies. With a heavy sigh, the Justicar unfastened the paws of the hellhound pelt from his neck and drew cinders from his shoulders to shake the dust out of his friend's fur. The big man walked back and sat down on a mounting block outside the tavern, unfastened his helmet and let it crash down into the grass, then began to carefully brush the hellhound's fur. Cinders's tail thumped as the dogskin grinned its mad piranha grin. Camp. Start fire. Yep. Guess we can. The Justicar, a ranger who had fought a savage war against injustice for more years than he cared to tell, spread his friend out across his lap. A big curry comb brushed the hellhound's fur to a brilliant shine. Tired and with his ribs aching from a hydra's bite that had failed to pierce his armor scales, the Justicar rose heavily to his feet. New territories meant new work. There would be towns here, meaning inequality and injustice. More than enough labor for a mortal man to do. Night's coming, he announced. We'll stay in the tavern. It's big and we can block the doors. Polk, get the mules under cover before the Sturges get them. Enid, see if there's any water down that well. The ranger retrieved his helmet and his hellhound skin, then shoved open the tavern door. Check every room. Keep your eyes open. If there's trouble, call me. Inside the tavern, heavy ceiling beams were still hung with bunches of dried herbs. A single iron pot lay overturned beside the hearth. Joss strode ahead of Escala, checked the kitchens with their pot hooks and empty pantries, then clumped upstairs to check for lurking terrors. A single sturge, Big as a small dog, feathery and shaped like a mosquito, fled in terror out a window of the master bedroom. Just banged the shutters closed, then turned to make his way back downstairs. Escala sprang into view beside him, shedding invisibility with a barely audible pop. Her long blonde hair shimmered like golden silk as the fairy toyed with it nervously in her mouth. Hey, Jos, good fight with the Hydra back there, huh? Really livened up the day? I mean, you look at a place and think, Gee, now here's a dead spot. She wavered nervously, keeping out of reach. Bone tired, just sat down on the steps, wincing as his bruised side twinged. He unclipped the shoulder fastenings of his dragon scale cuirass, unbuckled his sword belt, and let the whole ensemble crash heavily to the ground. You and your hydra. Damn thing almost stove in my rib cage. Yeah, but you're not mad about it or anything, are you? The girl hovered back and forth like a nervous bee. I mean, it just lets you see how cool this journey is. Danger everywhere. And I'm sure we can find some injustice just dying to be, um, be justiced and stuff. The Justicar pierced Escala with one dire eye and said, Escala. We just found a twelve-headed hydra in a watchtower. That's enough activity for today. Going into a magnificent sulk, the fairy kicked at a dead woodlouse on the floor. You're mad about the hydra. I knew it. Why does it have to be my fault? Unamused, Just looked levelly at Escala. You swiped scrolls from its treasure hoard, didn't you? Only one. I thought we had decided not to go herring off on our own. Juss's words had the damning weight of common sense. What did I tell you about wandering away where I can't protect you? Stung, Escala proudly sat her little bottom on a broken stool. I wasn't wandering. There was a plan. Sniffing, Escala tried to weasel her way out of making an apology. I am a ruined exploration professional. Do I want my comrades to be burdened by useless side trips? Escala placed one hand loftily upon her breast. I was merely attempting to add to party assets without slowing your travel time. The presence of the Hydra was simply an unforeseen variable. You screwed up. 
as Scala regarded her friend through leveled lashes. I am a fairy. Fairies do not screw up. We just have occasional bouts of adverse results production. Uh-huh. Well, at least you got a spell scroll out of it. Just found a dried apricot in his pouch and gave the girl the bigger half. Are the rest of the pixies in the forest just like you? Nah, I'm the cute one, one of a kind, and I'm sure as hell no pixie. Escala stood, turning to clench her rear. See those lines? Pure thoroughbred. Just lifted one arm experimentally and gave a wince. I think I hurt. You think? All right, I do hurt. The man planted a hand beneath his sweaty tunic and shoved a healing spell into himself, the magic crackling like a pine cone in a fire. That damned hydra almost killed me. He never laid a glove on you. This is just a trail sore. A scholar whirred up into the air. Hey, we found a tavern. I bet there's a bathtub here. The girl called out of a window. Hey, Enid, was there water in that well? The Sphinx was sitting in the tavern yard, eating a freshly killed sturge. She guiltily hid her meal and cleared her throat. Um, yes, there was. Well, find a bucket. We've got work to do. Escala hung her head out of the window and frowned at the Sphinx. Are you snacking between meals again? No. Enid, stop it. How are we going to land you a nice Andro Sphinx if you won't listen to your fashion advisor? The fairy leaned through the window sill. Check my bags on the wagon. Have we got any fairy cakes left? One. Hoopy, we can have it with dinner. Oh. Enid peered into a leather bag. It's a bit green. I like them green. Ah. Uh, it's a bit greener than you like. Enid tilted her head. Actually, it's really kind of furry. Escala opened up her arms. It's fungoid enriched. Just bring it in. The fairy turned happily to Joss. See, J-Man, you just relax. Auntie Escala will take care of everything. A nice bath and a kept a fairy cake. Enid can walk on your back. She'll keep her claws in this time, I swear. The Justicar expectantly raised one brow, waiting. Escala turned, muttered beneath her breath, looked at him sourly, and finally sniffed in irritation. All right, all right. I'm sorry about the Hydra. Not that it was my fault. Evening in the abandoned village had a certain picturesque quality that soothed the soul. The quiet roofs and empty streets caught the light of sunset just so. The plaintive hoots of sturges echoed through the trees. Wood smoke drifted beautiful blue curls against the evening sky. Somewhere in the background, a delicious smell of cooking stole through the tavern, making mouths water and all thoughts turn to supper. In a stone room at the back of the kitchen, a giant wine barrel had been converted to a makeshift bath. Sitting like a ponderous leviathan, the Justicar let his shaven head jut over the barrel's rim. Hot water steamed, heat soothed, and he seemed uncertain whether such luxuries really befitted his role as defender of the weak. Escala sat in a copper pot, seething like meat in a stew. The fairy, who always read in the bath, was flipping through the scorched pages of a book rescued from the Hydra's lair. It hovered in midair, held by the effects of one of her spells. The book was ancient. Escala became more and more fascinated by the pages, and even managed to lose interest in the delicious smell of frying meat coming from the kitchen a few feet away. After several long minutes of relaxed reading, she set the book aside and used an old toothbrush to scrub in an itchy spot between her wings. With her foot drumming the bottom of her bath like a well-scratched dog, she looked over to where the Justicar's head floated amidst the steam. She gave a satisfied sigh and swam closer for a better look. Hey, Jus, 
Do you have to shave your hair a lot? I mean, is it just a once a week thing, once a day? Whenever. Joss moved and a vast swell of water spilled over the edge of the gigantic barrel. It's not important. You know I could wax it for you. Smoother finish than shaving. I just shave it to be practical. Yeah, right. And in no way to project a monastic, ruthless appeal. Escala dipped her brush in her bath and scrubbed at something beneath the waterline. But hey, there's candles and stuff here. We can do wax. Escala, there aren't enough healing spells on all the flanasse to let you wax my head. Trying to get on with the business of his bath, Joss sniffed suspiciously at a piece of soap, flower-scented and taken from Enid and Escala's private stores, then awkwardly began to scrub his feet. Good book? he asked. It's a spell book, she replied. High level. There's only one or two bits I can understand. Escala made a little sign with one finger, retrieved her book, and turned a page. Little flakes of burned parchment showered onto the floor. I might be able to salvage something useful and get a few new spells out of it. Just raised one shaggy brow and said, How do you get more spells? Will you have to go see your teacher? The change in Escala's countenance was infinitely subtle. Only someone who knew her well would ever have noticed the pallid stiffness of her hands. I don't have teachers. Pages closed with a cold snap. I work alone. The subject lay where it had fallen. Joss had hounded countless clues to ground before now, but he knew when to leave well enough alone. Escala's past was a line drawn across her soul. The period before she had taken up with Joss and Cinders was something she preferred to forget. Joss threw a washcloth at her. It hit with a satisfactory splat. Spell copying is expensive. Don't you need gems to grind into ink? It's no problem. Escala peeled the wet cloth away from her face and looked into the kitchen. Hey, Polk! Do we have any gems? Enid and Polk had just pulverized gems in a pestle to make Enid's next stun symbol papyrus. Freezing guiltily, Enid covered the pestle with one paw and said, Uh, no. Damn! Escala rested in her tub with her pretty pink feet steaming out in the open air. Polk, go look at my bags, will ya? Indignant at being disturbed, Polk slammed pots and pans about the kitchen table, putting the powdered gems dangerously close to the seasonings for the night's meal. "'We spent em, girl!' shouted the teamster. "'That's what treasure's for! Supplies! Essentials! Gifts to the needy and glory to the gods!' The fairy pursed her mouth. "'You spent it on booze, didn't you?' "'Essential exploration assets!' Polk waved his hands. An evening drink by the campfire is a prime piece of any adventure. Just read the literature. Pork, one of these days you're going to get such a pinch. Escala irritably went back to her book. All right, I'll use the burned version for now, but we need some gems, just little semi-precious ones. Just reached out with the point of his sword and tugged a hanging blanket back into place sealing the bathroom off from the kitchen. If I find any lying around, I'll let you know. With an expressive little sigh, the fairy slung her hair down the back of the cooking pot. She leaned her head against the rim of her bath and paddled with her toes. My water's getting cold. Can we get cinders in here to warm it up? Near a bath? Remember last time? The last time had been in the city of Trigal about two months before. The trouble of dunking a wailing hellhound skin into an unwanted bath had been amusing, to say the least. Escala chuckled, then suddenly discovered that she was sitting on her scrubbing brush. You know, for a refugee from the abyss, that dog can be a real coward. The girl lay in her bath and smiled. 
Do you think they ever replaced that ceiling? Remember the noise he made? I remember. Rolling her head, Escala slyly regarded her shaven-headed friend. Hey, J-Man, that was the first time I saw you getting out of the bath. Just decided not to comment. He propped his sword within easy reach and reclined once again. Unperturbed, Escala leaned over the rim of her pot and gave a feline little smile. You have two cute little dimples in your ear. Just glowered. That is called muscle confirmation. That just happened to be shaped like cute, itty-bitty dimples. Just nursed his pride with a sniff and rearranged his sword again. There was something odd about the village, something disquieting. Just knew Cinders had sensed it, though the hellhound had seen nothing invisible. There were no traps and apparently no creatures lurking underneath the floors. Yet there was a sense of imminence, as though something dark and sinister had the place on its mind. For her part, Escala had no suspicions. She seemed to have other troubles on her mind. Coming to the edge of her bath, she looked out of the cooking pot at the Justicar. This is kind of a nice place, though, huh? The girl waved a nervous hand about the room. It's a convenient little stop. Did you see all the squirrels? Those things are really cute. Very. I like them. Too bad we can't stop. We should get out of here first thing tomorrow. Escala sighed and sniffed the delicious smell of frying in the kitchen. I thought we only had hard tack left. What's for dinner? Just eat it. You'll love it. The fairy squirted water through her clasped hands. So are we leaving at dawn? Maybe. The Justicar heaved a sigh. Polk's gotten us lost. We'll have to circle around, find a settlement, and figure out just where we are so we can plan a route. Will it take long? The Justicar rose half out of his barrel, stretching and cracking his shoulders. His skin was pale where his armor always covered him, but his head and hands were tanned. You're very keen for us to keep heading for Homlet. Yeah. The fairy shrugged, sat up, and began to wring out her long blonde hair. There's something weird about these woods. Something... I don't know. It makes me feel creepy. I just want to get out of here. The girl sighed. I want to go to Homlet. We've got the deeds, man. Still... I want to make sure no one's really unhappy about it or anything. No one's unhappy. Just watched Escala for a long moment, strangely pleased by the efficient way she wound her wet hair into a towel and tied it into a turban. Most everything has good in it. You just have to know where to look. With her slim, naked back to him, Escala's little wings gracefully fanned themselves dry. I've never really been told that I have much good in me. Joss knew when to listen. He rose out of his bath and sat with a towel wound about his middle, leaning forward onto his hairy knees and watching her in silence. Slim and strangely graceful, Escala quietly wound herself inside a towel. She turned to look over at him, her face thin, her shape tiny and vulnerable. I've lived alone for a long time, Joss. A long, long time. The girl turned away and pulled her towel tight. Thanks. You know, just for... for stuff. Joss studied the fairy for a long, quiet moment. She fidgeted with her towel, staring at a puddle of bath water on the floor. Joss had never gotten on particularly well with people. He did what he had to in order to follow clues, sift information, and feel the pulse of a town. But his days and nights were spent in the company of his own thoughts. First Cinders, and then Escala had come to knock on the doors of his citadel, and now his days of solitude were over. Trudging damply over to Escala's side, the man took her small hand into his fingers, squeezed softly, and then turned to wander off and find his clothes. Dinner's done. 
Escala looked down at her hand and gave a rueful little smile. Wavering up into the air, she flew off in search of cinders, hoping he hadn't eaten too much brown coal before blowing her hair dry. Polk ran past her through the kitchen, holding plates of surprisingly glittery-looking meat. There was whiskey in the jug and a fire in the grate. All in all, it seemed the village offered them a cheery night. With the kitchen now deserted, an eerie quiet fell. Outside on the roofs, the sturges hooted plaintively for blood. Ashes hissed in the stove, and an old brown tea kettle leaked steam into the breeze. Above the stove, there was a subtle stir of motion. A wisp of smoke in the chimney swirled, then crept out into the light to hover just above the floor. A single eye solidified in the smoke, and then a long, trunk-like snout sniffed and snuffled at the tabletop. The smoke creature drifted carefully along the table, then flowed down onto the floor. It sniffed at the giant wine barrel with its cloudy water. A scent caught the trunk's attention. The eye swiveled, blinked, and the creature hovered above Escala's deserted bath. The trunk sniffed deeply at the water, while the eye carefully examined the old rusty pot. A single golden hair lay floating in the water. The smoke creature carefully picked up its find, examined it carefully, staring at it inch by inch, then gripped the strand tight. A sudden noise came from the door. The smoke creature made a splash as it tore across the room and shot back up the chimney, fleeing into the night. Padding into the kitchen with an empty bucket hanging from her mouth, Enid blinked, then put down her bucket and frowned. She lumbered into the room, sniffing carefully and following a smoky trail that wound across the table and over toward the baths. Escala's voice pealed in from the taproom behind her. Enid, come on, hun. We have to rinse all this gem powder off the food before it sets. Her freckled nose snuffling, Enid creased her pretty brows into a frown. Wait, there's something here. The catwoman peered suspiciously at the chimney. Something's up the chimney. It's just a sturge. Don't worry. I blocked the chimney with a metal grate. Escala, still resplendent in a pair of little towels, popped into the room. Come on, let's clean off this fried rabbit or whatever it is. Then we can beat Polk with a stick. Reluctantly, Enid filled a bucket from Juss's bath, then turned to go. With a last look behind her, she padded back to the tap room to join her dinner and her friends. Two. Morning stole over the old bleached giant's bones and crept cat-footed through the tavern windows. Ashes cracked in the tavern fireplace. Huge and fuzzy, Enid slept beside the fire, flexing her huge talons in a feline dream. Polk snored like a sawmill, curled protectively about a big stone whiskey jug, and muttering occasionally in his sleep. The Justicar opened his eyes slowly, carefully searching out the room. Curled against his ribs and bundled in an old beaver skin, Escala slept happily. She made little chipmunk noises, unwilling to keep quiet even in her sleep. Propped above them on the back of a chair, Cinders grinned his crocodile grin, keeping watch over the room. All seemed quiet. All seemed still. Something was wrong. Cinders' ears stiffened. In perfect rapport, Joss and the hellhound listened to the air currents in the quiet room. Joss could sense no movement, no presence hovering in the room. Cinders had given no warning of illusions, invisible creatures, mysterious scents, or noises. Yet, there was a sudden sense of movement. In a blur, the Justicar's sword hissed through the air above Escala, the black steel clove emptiness, and the room seemed still once more. Cinders. Sitting in bed, his huge sword gleaming in his hand, the Justicar breathed slowly as he sensed something strange in the air. The hellhound sniffed at the air, his red eyes gleaming dangerously. 
Magic. Where? Gone. Joss rose and began jamming on his clothes. Beside him, Escala rolled into the warm space of his abandoned bed. Joss slid into his black armor, the straps simple, well-tended, and efficient. You were asleep? Cinder's snooze. The hellhound cautiously searched the room, seeming annoyed at himself for sleeping. Magic soft, didn't smell. That's all right. It might have been a scrying spell. Certainly there was no physical presence. No creature mortal, immortal, or undead could sneak past cinders. Joss buckled his helmet into place, swept the pelt about his shoulders, and settled the hellhound's head atop his helmet. The big man nudged at Escala with his foot and whispered, Escala? No one wears underwear with these, Dad, I swear. The little fairy sat upright, a look of blank wonderment upon her face. With his attention on the windows, Joss moved carefully over to one wall. Escala, there's something spying on us. I'm going to investigate. Wake the others and stay alert. Silent and grim, he went hunting. Yeah, replied Escala sleepily. Her eyes were wide open as she sat in her bed of beaver fur. Joss gave her a glance, nodded as he saw her awake and alert, then slipped stealthily into the dawn like a wolf upon the prowl. Behind him, Escala stayed upright in bed, eyes staring blankly at the wall. But if it was orange, how would they put wheels on it? The fairy fell backward, continuing her rather strange little dream. At her side, a fresh bouquet of flowers suddenly gleamed in the light. Delicate champagne roses, still frosted with dew. Escala turned over in her bed and breathed the scent of roses. Tucked into a ball, the little fairy smiled and hugged her pillow in her sleep. In the cold light of dawn, a soft mist filled the village streets as sunlight warmed the night's dew. Even the old gray thatch on cottage roofs seethed with steam as the warmth of morning set in. The Justicar stalked carefully, scanning for the slightest marks upon the silver frost. He walked only in the lee of the buildings where the dew lay thin and unfrozen. He kept low, moving as stealthily as a rustle in the breeze. To the north, somewhere along the old weed-grown road, smoke was rising slowly in the dawn. Light, clean smoke. Probably kitchen fires. Just filed the information in his head, never once ceasing his careful search of the ruined village. Pausing at the huge skull of a long-dead giant, Just watched the empty streets. Magic. Cinders let the air run across his nose, his ears pricked up into wicked points as he searched for signs of life. On the roof, one house to left. More magic. House roof on right. The grass outside the tavern dripped. Something had brushed the frost and set it melting. The Justicar knelt, scanned the roofs above, then carefully examined the grass. One shutter had been opened, just a tiny slit scarcely large enough to admit a cat. Caught on the wooden shutter, a thin silken thread drifted in the breeze. Blue and almost metallic in color, the tiny thread now hung like a microscopic banner. Joss left it where it lay, narrowed his eyes, then faded behind a stand of dead dry weeds. On the rooftops above, nothing moved, but he could feel something there. Traveling with Escala had taught him the knack of seeing the faint ripples where an invisible creature passed. On the thatching, the neat array of straw wavered slightly, as an unseen creature shifted its stance. It could not help but have seen him. Just deliberately rose, passed his gaze across the rooftops as though seeing nothing, then went walking slowly down the open street. Above his helmet, Cinders grinned a gleeful, manic grin. The two partners moved quietly down the street. Obligingly, 
the attack came from the roof just above. A blinding light stabbed downward. The Justicar whirled, put his back to the blast, and hunched as a fireball exploded all about him. Cinders' black fur took the heat of the blast. The Justicar was already on the attack. Burned and streaming flames, the Justicar leaped through the dissipating fire, his black sword already clearing its scabbard. Cinders' head swung, and a vicious column of flame shot from the hellhound's jaws to blast the rooftops above. Something screamed, and suddenly a shape materialized. The tiny blue figure staggered, beating at itself. It shifted shape, changing even as it dropped out of view. Leaping across broken roofs, the blue-clad figure seemed nearly human, but it was only two feet tall and sported a pixie's wings. Long black hair streamed in the wind as the creature landed on its perch and turned a look of hatred at the Justicar. The creature wore a cloak that had been sliced almost in half, a cut long and precise. Scorched blue threads trailed from the damaged cloth. Cinders fired again before the creature could finish the spell half-woven on its lips. It dodged aside, taking a painful blast of fire. The creature turned invisible and fled, speeding so swiftly through the leaves that twigs shattered as it passed. Thatching gave a single tiny crack. Just dived through a cottage window, just as a spell thundered down from another roof farther along the street. The second visitor had opened fire, missing Just but collapsing an entire row of houses. The assassin leaped from roof to roof, invisible and fast, then sped over to the rubble. Mud and wattle steamed. Thatch burned. Hissing, the assassin pounced upon a rooftop and tried to catch sight of its prey. A black sword blade erupted through the thatch, ripping a line of blood from the invisible assassin. The creature screamed a feminine scream, rolling aside as the black blade stabbed through the roof again. The Justicar burst upward through the straw, roaring like a mad god as he plowed the black blade through empty air, trying to cut his invisible assailant down. Visible at last, the assassin briefly took the form of a pixie and then suddenly became a spider with butterfly wings. The winged arachnid managed to tumble sideways and stab out a spell that filled the street with shards of flying ice. The Justicar disappeared in the hissing torrent of razor-sharp frost, and a triumphant laugh rang out. Seeing its spell strike home, the intruder hovered and laughed viciously, peering through the ice clouds and looking for its victim's corpse. Streaming blood, the Justicar flung himself upward from the ice cloud, scything his black sword downward at his enemy. The spider creature screamed and tried to leap aside. The sword tip narrowly scored a cut across its back, springing blood into the air. The spider creature sped aside, landed on a roof ridge, and cocked back its limbs to summon energy for another savage spell. Joss! The entire house the creature stood upon exploded. Hovering outside the tavern, clutching her beaver skins about her shoulders, Escala snarled and blasted energy into the distant hut. Her enemy dodged, spider eyes wide. Blinded by the power discharge, Escala ripped her spell sideways in pursuit of her unseen enemy, gouging stones from walls and sending thatched roofs tumbling in a cloud of straw. As the flying spider fled into the ruined cottages, a swarm of little golden bees sped out from Escala's hands. The magic insects swirled in a mad shield all about the Justicar. As a lightning bolt stabbed out from a ruined house nearby, the bee swarm darted and swatted the energies aside. Escala snarled in glee as she saw a dark shape run flitting through the weeds. Hey, spider! Suck on this! Escala slammed her hands toward the ground, and a savage ripple tore the earth toward her enemy. Black tentacles writhed upward from the street, lunging for prey. With a curse, Escala's enemy dived through a garden archway. Light flashed and the assassin disappeared. The hungry tentacles slammed against the archway and tore it to shreds in a petulant burst of anger. Stones cascaded to the street. Maddened tentacles thrashed. Clutching a bleeding shoulder, the Justicar hunched in the street, his face savage, golden bees still weaving about him in a dancing shield. Magic flashed as he shoved a healing spell into his shoulder, then another into his left hand. Burns and wounds closed over. 
Ignoring the hurt, the big man straightened and looked toward the thrashing tentacles. Thank you. The dancing bees faded and disappeared. Escala settled down to land upon Juss's unwounded shoulder, pulling her beaver pelt about her naked skin. What was that? Spies. Juss lifted his sword. The tip showed a brief sheen of blood to which a fine metallic blue thread adhered. There were two of them. Shapeshifters. Shapeshifters? Escala carefully lifted her hand, and spellfire shone. She coldly and efficiently scanned the village. Nothing. They're gone now. Joss examined his black-scale armor where an ice bolt had punched a ragged hole through the shoulder and into the flesh beneath. Small, magic using. One of them looked like you. Like me? Dismissing it with a quirk of her brow, the fairy gave a superior little smile. That's really unlikely. Small humanoid, wings. Escala turned to take a sharp look at where her foe had disappeared. She stared for a moment in puzzlement, then shrugged and dismissed the whole idea. If it was a shapeshifter, then it could be anything. The girl shivered in the cold and tugged her beaver skin tight. Are you all right? It will pass. It's only pain. Jayman, did I ever tell you that you're my hero? Escala ruffled Cinders' fur, patting both of her friends on the head. Let's get indoors. I forgot my wand. And your clothes. Hey, man, I just woke up. The girl opened her hands in protest, then made a grab for her beaver skin. I rescued you. So you didn't rouse the others as I told you? Sure I did. Escala rolled her eyes. They all fell back to sleep. You know those guys. Not a dedicated bone in their bodies. Right. The Justicar took a careful look at the weeds, frost, and buildings. Hellhound flame, magic spells, and tentacles had combined to obliterate any hope of tracks and evidence. Cinders, anything still here? Gone. All gone. The Hellhound watched a cottage roof burn and happily wagged his tail. Burn, bad guy. Funny. Joss reached up to pat the hellhound and said, Good boy, you just keep burning them. The threesome trudged back up the street, Joss stepping over the ruins left by Escala's tentacle spell. The big man looked at the spell's remnants and gave a grunt. Good spell. You like it? Escala preened. She sidled closer, waggling her brows. Hey, Joss, I finished reading that spell book. And? We got stone skin. Stone skin? A spell. Oh, it's hotter than a volcano. This one you're going to love. Escala rubbed her hands together. I just need a teeny little ingredient or two. You reckon we can find some diamond dust somewhere? The Justicar looked at the girl and said, We have exactly eleven gold pieces left. Eck! Escala crossed her legs as she sat on Juss's shoulder. Well, if you see any diamonds, give me a yell. We will not steal diamonds. Steal? Planting her hands at her breast, Escala goggled at the mere thought. Would I steal? Yes. What? Escala puffed up, feeling her honor impugned, but lacking evidence or moral ground to stand on. For your information, when fairy girls take something, it's lovable. It's not stealing. No diamonds. Well, unowned ones, then. You know they grow in the ground somewhere. Escala, Juss, and Cinders stared once again across the quiet roofs. The fairy drew her brows into a frown. Shapeshifters, huh? We must have pissed someone off mightily. Someone has plans we must be interfering with. Joss flexed his hands. Be careful. Outside the tavern, the open street offered the best view of the surrounding land. Smoothing Polk's map under his hands, the Justicar looked thoughtfully at his painted lines and squiggles. 
the map was hopelessly inaccurate. The party's position could be virtually anywhere dozens of miles from where he imagined them to be. To the southeast lay the sea. To the west lay a ruined castle in which Escala's hydra had made its lair. Northward, many hundreds of miles away, lay Furiandi and Hamlet. Keoland was a broad kingdom. The forest supposedly served as its southern border, although the map seemed to be made mostly from wishful thinking and pure guesswork. The road through the village seemed old and abandoned, yet perhaps it led to another settlement where they could find directions and purchase food. The smoke he had seen earlier in the morning seemed to suggest that there was some sort of settlement nearby. Joss amassed his information swiftly and methodically, while behind him ash cakes baked in the tavern's hearth for breakfast. Blowing through his scraggly mustache, Polk watched disapprovingly from afar. He finally marched out of the tavern and took position behind the Justicar's map. Just folded the map without bothering to look up. Polk, shut up. What are you reading for, son? You're addled, touched in the skull. Polk squared his silly hat upon his head. This is a time for action, boy. A time for sword and blades and magic. Polk stamped in impatience at a student who seemed to be eternally dim. Never mind the maps. Let instinct be our guide. Polk, you have personally managed to put us at least three hundred miles off course. The Justicar's voice rumbled in an ursine growl. Let me tell you just how much I respect your instincts. Cinders lay spread across the table, his shark-toothed grin gleaming with a piece of coal between his jaws. The Justicar borrowed a coal flake to draw on the map. May I? Welcome. Polk. Joss drew a circle around the supposed location of distant Hamlet. We have just been attacked by something that seemed really annoyed. The ranger tapped a finger on the map, guessing at the possible flow of local rivers. I'm in favor of moving very carefully and fairly swiftly, looking for inhabited villages and keeping our heads down while we see who might want us dead. Enid had found a tall stone tower at the edge of the village. On tables dragged from a dozen houses, she had begun laying out scrolls, riddles, books, and parchments found on an eventful journey from Trigal. More loot from the ruined castle's library gave her even more toys to play with. Plain and sweetly curious, she was reading through her books and thoroughly enjoying herself. She looked over the edge of a scorched volume, raised her brows, and said, Aren't we staying here, then? I was so looking forward to catching up on a book or two. Someone apparently doesn't want us to stay. Joss stored the map, patted cinders, and then cocked one brow as a strange noise came drifting from the tavern door. Light-hearted, happy singing astounded one and all. It came pure and sweet, a girlish voice without a trouble in the world. Through a window, Escala could be seen hovering in midair. She had fixed her hair and wore a beautiful silk costume bought in Trigal. She primped herself happily in a mirror, then turned a little pirouette. The fairy drifted lightly out into the morning air, twirling merrily as she came. On seeing Juss, she paused, made a knowing little smile, and then hovered at his shoulder with her head tilted to one side. She smiled secretly at him for a moment. Finally, to everyone's shock, Escala kissed him on the ear and said, You're most welcome. Juss stared in wonderment. The fairy hovered, looking at him with a strangely satisfied smile, and then fluttered back into the tavern. Cinders' red eyes gleamed. Fairy, give a kiss. Fairy, give a kiss. Juss's ear tingled. He actually turned a strange shade of reddish pink. Polk joined him in staring at the tavern door. The teamster cleared his throat into the silence. Spring? Enid blinked and said, Autumn's only just begun. Maybe fairies get it early. Oh, dear. 
Joss wonderingly touched his ear, still red hot from Ascala's kiss. He blinked, shook himself, then swept his maps efficiently underneath his arm. All right, let's get fed. There's smoke about three miles to the north. We'll leave in ten minutes, head north and investigate. Enid, if you want to organize your books, you might want to stay here while we go to town and fly after us in a... Just sniffed at a strange odor. In... In a... Something was frying. Possibly bacon. Possibly honey. A sickeningly sweet stench redolent of dental cavities coiled about the village roofs. A pan banged noisily from the tavern room, and Escala's voice pealed into the street. Breakfast! Come on, adventurers! Get it while it's hot! Enid and Polk uneasily looked at one another. The Sphinx looked a little pale as she said, Escala cooked? She cooked? Polk bit his lip in trepidation. Well, ah, uh, she is a girl. I kinda guess all girls can cook. Escala had a metabolism like a hummingbird. Her concept of a happy breakfast had enough sugar in it to turn grown men into gibbering loons. Joss gave a sigh and tightened up his sword belt. This could be interesting. Enid blinked and said, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Inside the tavern, Escala had laid out a dented old serving platter full of food. She hovered above the table, pleased as a cat swimming in cream, and very ostentatiously primped a vase of champagne roses at the center of the table. There was honey in a pot in the pantry, and we still had sugar, so I made cakes and bacon. Breakfast gleamed beneath a sweet glaze of sugar crystals. Eat hearty! Everyone stared at Escala's creation, which sat there gleaming under an ocean of syrup. The fairy personally made sure that everybody had a helping. She put extra syrup on her own plate, dipped whey bread into the mixture, and crammed it straight into her mouth. It was good. Try some. With painfully polite expressions, the fairy's companions all tried the meal one by one. It had a jolt like an electric eel. Everyone made a great show of swallowing and nodding, making a scala beam. The fairy had brewed tea in a big rusty kettle she found in a cupboard. The resulting brew was colored half by rust and half by tea leaves. She happily poured the mixture into tin mugs for one and all. Polk sniffed at it, looked at the Justicar with the eyes of a man who has just been handed hemlock, and watched Escala as she went about her chores. Aren't you drinking any, girl? Oh, no. Tea makes me hyper. Sitting beside her bouquet of roses, Escala sat on her hands and happily watched Joss as he ate. In his time, the man had been stabbed, cut, burned, bashed, bitten, clawed, and gnawed upon, so this seemed comparatively mild torture. He stoically drank the tea and ate the food, consuming it slowly and carefully without batting an eye. Escala primped the roses again, looking about and hoping that everyone noticed the flowers. She then came whirring over to land at Juss's side. She looked at him with a wry fondness and then chucked him on the chin. Juss, about the rescue thing. That's... that's just so sweet. You never thanked me like that before. Just frowned, wondering why women had to fix upon the most strange little things. I've thanked you before. Yeah, but you never made it so obvious you meant it. The fairy giggled, then chucked him on the chin again. Well, you didn't have to go to all that trouble. Joss bit his lip. All he'd said was thank you. He wondered how she would act if he'd given it to her in writing. With a shrug, Joss turned back to his tea, managing to ignore the strange deposits floating on the top. Escala leaned forward and lowered her voice so that only he could hear. Ah, uh, Joss, 
I'm aware that I sometimes cause a few difficulties, so I'm going to try and think a little more about how you feel from now on. I promise. She crossed her sleek cleavage with a finger. Partners? Just looked at her, fond but puzzled. He held up his finger so that the fairy could clasp it in her hands. Partners. She seemed relieved to be free of the burden of true confessions. Escala slung her ice wand over her shoulder, dragged her collection of scrolls and spell lists over to Juss's backpack, and stuffed them inside. Her roses were carefully taken outside, where Polk helpfully installed the vase upright between the blanket bundles. Escala tidied the blooms, clapped her hands and rubbed them together, and seemed eager for another challenging day. Right, so we're off to look for locals. Should I go invisible and take the point? No need yet. Just stay close. Joss intended to walk into town in as non-threatening a manner as possible. Enid, are you staying here? I think I might. There are ever so many books to organize. The Sphinx padded over from her work tables with a little rolled papyrus in a tube. She dropped it into a scholar's lap. Here, stun symbol. My last until we get more gems. Sorry that it smells of squirrel. Escala blinked. Squirrel? She means rabbit. Joss had already hidden all evidence of last night's feast. Enid, be careful. Follow the road to catch up. Have fun in town. The Sphinx waved goodbye as Polk's wagon rumbled off down the trail. Enid's freckles shone like stars as she smiled. I might find you a sturge for dinner. Three hours later, the Justicar lay against a tree trunk, carefully surveying a crumbling pile of stones. A fountain poured sweet water into a broken moss-covered font. A chapel lay half-crushed beneath the weight of a fallen tree. With cinders on his back, Joss lay hidden in the shadows, carefully testing the area for any hint of danger. The hellhound's red eyes gleamed as he thoughtfully sniffed the air. Magic. Very recent. Same scent as this morning. Same type. Fancy. Cinders sniffed the air. Gone now. Leaves shifted as the Justicar came out of cover. Stealth had long served as his deadliest weapon. Moving to circle the fountain, he scanned carefully for tracks. A tiny scuff marked the fountain's moss. The moss oozed water. Just touched it with his fingertips and thoughtfully sniffed before raising his hand up to Cinders's nose. The hellhound thoughtfully savored the air. Elfy fairy pixie smell. A patch of empty space over the far side of the clearing shimmered as it dropped down through the trees. Hey, guys, you see anything? Nothing, Just shrugged. Yet. Hoopy! Escala popped into view in midair. At a loud summons from Juss, Polk's wagon came rumbling down the road. Now mostly empty, Polk insisted on dragging the vehicle behind the party in the hope of filling it to the brim with jewels and gold. While the vehicle arrived, Juss spread out his maps at the rim of the fountain and rubbed at the harsh stubble on his chin. All right. According to the milestone, this is Agnes's fountain. The map puts that just at the north end of the Dreadwood. He folded the map away, then uncorked his drinking flask and took a swig of beer. That smoke we saw is about half a mile away. Escala? Joss held out his beer flask and swirled it, expecting the girl to take her share. After a minute, he frowned and looked at the flask. No, Escala. The fairy stood on the fountain's edge, with her hands clasped behind her back, her head tilted and her face in a knowing smile. She walked artlessly on tiptoes, making a pair of prancing little steps towards the Justicar. 
Ojos, Escala's voice slyly sung. Look what I just happened to find over by the fountain. The girl held out a small package, all tied up with ribbons, and waved it in the air. A box of sweets. Puzzled, the Justicar and Cinders recoiled. The Hellhound sniffed suspiciously at the package, stiffened his ears, and wagged his tail. Sweeties. Escala waggled the box slyly in midair. Aren't I the lucky one? Let's share them, shall we? Throwing his mule's reins aside, Polk landed beside the fountain with a thump. Sweets! The man instantly took one from the packet. Best tagle toffee! The fairy shrugged gaily and said, I just found them. Guess we might as well share. Joss raised a brow as he inspected the package. It was just lying there? Of course it was. How strange it should be right there where I could find it. Escala shot a sly, amused look at Joss. I ain't beginning to feel a little spoiled or a little pampered. Joss took a morsel and let Cinders sample it. The hellhound smelled no poison or magic in the sweets or on the box. Walking aside to suck on one of the morsels and puzzle over events, Joss found himself pacing back and forth beside the ruined chapel. Cinders, did you see a box there when we arrived? No box. The hellhound grinned his manic grin. Maybe fairy keep as present. Give to friends for treat. Yeah. Just rubbed at his bristly scalp. Why was she being so full of gifts and song today? If she'd bought treats all the way back at the last town, why save them for this exact moment? Was she planning something? And she screwed up again? Just paused. Was she going to leave? The thought caused an instant hollow pit in Juss's stomach. He turned, but there sat Escala, laughing with Polk. Irritably jerking his usual grim persona back into place, Juss marched back to his companions and stood with them by the fountain. Right. We found sweets. Escala tilted her head to look at him out of the corner of her eye. Right? So it's just lucky. Just kept his eyes on the forest. There's no reason to read anything into it at all. The fairy steepled sticky fingertips. Yep, quite right. She bit her bottom lip and peered across her shoulder at the Justicar. Unless someone wanted to say something special. Just folded his arms. No. Fine. Escala twiddled her wings. Fine. Guess there's nothing to say. Nothing. Good. Polk was busily stuffing sticky sweets into his pocket for later. Oh, I've got something to say. Shh. Escala shot the little man a glance. Silence is golden. Grandly dusting herself off, Escala drifted up into the air. She bowed, ushering Polk, Juss, and Cinders onward, slipping the uneaten treats into the back of the wagon for later use. Taking the lead, Joss marched on down the trail, his brows drawn into a heavy frown. He looked back across his shoulder and saw Escala riding between the ears of the wagon mule. She slyly waved her fingertips at him and gave a very knowing smile. Annoyed, Joss hunched forward and kept his eyes searching for trouble on the road. Above his helm, Cinders contented himself with making sucking sounds and mumbling a strange little tune into the ether. Just cocked an eye toward the dog. You're eating one? Scorched almond. It figures. Three. A shabby assortment of heaped stones, masquerading as a town, sprawled across the forest path. 
a substantial settlement had apparently been razed to the ground and then rebuilt by people big on enthusiasm but small on engineering skills. There were hundreds of shabby tents and lean-tos in the shelter of the older ruins. The sign outside the village had been painted upon an old scarred shield. It read, Sour Patch, Good Food and Liquor. The village had been cobbled together out of rotten canvas and old scrap. Bark huts half tumbled into open sewers, and hundreds of dispirited peasants shuffled down the dirty streets. More and more people were arriving, all of them ashen, dressed in rags, and carrying everything they owned upon their backs. Long lines formed at wagons that were dispensing bread and gruel. Children were crying, and the air stank of human misery. The streets seemed overcrowded with the hungry and the poor. A gibbet hung empty at the center of the village, attended by two guards with rusted armor and faces redolent of brutal stupidity. As the Justicar stood looking at the squalid, crowded camp, a figure bowed down with wood trudged close nearby. Dropping his load, the newcomer looked from just to the village and back again. Don't go, friend. Just looked at him and asked, Where? Sour patch. The woodcutter had a donkey, and the donkey carried a hundredweight in fresh cut wood. Bad look. Don't stop. Turn back. And go into the woods? No. Turn back to Kjolund. The woodcutter gave Juss a sharp look of panic. You mean you came through the woods? From the coast. Friend, you're mad. The man worked solidly to make a pile of timbers. I'm here because the Baron paid me. He paid me because the king paid him. We're running supplies here to the refugees. If they're fool enough to settle here, then they have to have a chance. Standing and carefully looking over the crowded shanty town, Just fingered his sword. Refugees from what? Raids. Something's been clearing out all the villages in the river valley, sweeping them clean. No one left, no warning, no trail. It's like the gods just up and took them. The woodcutter finished his work and wrenched his donkey around. Everyone's fled the valleys. Some merchants offered free land to refugees, but no one thought to ask them where the land might be. But the dreadwood. The man looked at the forest and shook his head. Even the valley's better than that. Only a fool goes near the dreadwood. He made to leave. Joss extended one big hand and held the donkey's bridle. What's wrong with the dreadwood? Cursed. Bad luck. Was never meant for mortal man. It's a haunted wood. People say things in there. People disappear. Agitated, the woodcutter looked in fear at the trees. Five, six years ago, giants wiped out all the villages, killed everything that moved. Now it's happening again. You marked my words. Bad luck in the dreadwood. The man wrenched his donkey free from the ranger's grasp. Bad luck. The woodcutter left fleeing down the road at the best speed his little donkey could manage. Emerging from her hiding place in Polk's cart, Escala rubbed thoughtfully at her little freckled nose as she watched the woodcutter depart. What was he drinking? I don't know. Joss hitched his belt. Someone's running this camp as a scam, maybe trying to repopulate some junk land. Keep a lookout for trouble. Half-orcs and slovenly humans kept watch over the refugees. The guards ate meat and drank wine while refugees lined up for stale bread. Just took one look at the village and seemed to swell with predatory energy. Cinders. Magic. Cinders' fur lay low and his fangs shone evilly. Old food. Raw hides. Smelly stuff, hot iron, half-orcs, 
bugbears, ogre sting, and elfy pixie. Elves. The Justicar used his thumb to loosen its sword in its sheath. Keep your eyes open. There's work to do. Choosing invisibility as her best option for sneakiness, Ascala hovered in the air nearby. Gilland looks like a good place to be well away from. What's that awful smell? Just shrugged. Half orcs, ogres, bugbears, raw hides, hot iron, and open sewer, and some elves or pixies. Elves? That's what Cinder says. The Justicar felt the fairy giving a happy shrug. Whoopee! Well, he should know. The girl's wings buzzed. Any idea where we look to find our shape-shifting spies from this morning? If they're here, we can find them. Huge and brooding, Joss scanned the streets. Stay invisible. You can rest in the backpack if you need to. Joss settled the hellhound into place upon his helm. Are you all right, Cinders? Burn. Burn. Later. Don't annoy the locals until we have to. Just turned around, but Polk's wagon already stood abandoned at the edge of the road. Moving at an astonishing rate, Polk had already mounted the steps of a rubble pile that masqueraded as the local tavern. Ignoring the sounds of a fight from inside, Polk tightened his belt, slapped his hands together, and rubbed his palms in glee. Just gave a heavy ursine growl. Polk! The teamster turned, incredulous that the others were not following him to the tavern. Son, it's a tavern! Polk, we are not here to drink. But it's a den of iniquity, boy! Appalled, Polk waved his hands in the air like a maddened bird. We can't just pass it by. Dens of iniquity are part of being a hero. Here's where you defend a maid, find a clue, buy a treasure map, start a brawl. Think of the possibilities. Polk, the only adventures that ever start in taverns are usually ones that involve puking or collecting genital lice. Just tied the wagon in place and took a long, hard look at passers-by, making sure they knew that he would remember their faces. Glowered at by a six-foot-tall man wearing a hellhound skin, most pedestrians elected to walk hurriedly away. We are going in for one drink while we skim for information. Just sniffed the scent of roasting meat and gave a prim lift of his chin. And perhaps a bite of something savory. And then a fight? One fight per day is enough. Just shouldered his way in through a door made from an old blanket. As he passed, Polk gave an unhappy sigh. That boy has no idea of how to be a hero. It just ain't in him. Escala's voice laughed from empty air. He gets the job done. I tell him again and again, it ain't what you do, it's how. Polk swept the blanket aside to allow a scholar to pass. You know, it's high time that boy took a grip on his responsibilities. The Sour Patch Tavern sold only two types of food, raw and burned. The beer smelled like old laundry, but Polk drank it nonetheless. Escala contented herself with lounging inside the Justicar's backpack as it sat beneath the table. The ranger's wineskin had yielded a last few drops of decent beer, and there were still sweets aplenty. The girl reclined with her little feet crossed and her arms behind her head, thinking sly, warm little thoughts as she watched the Justicar. Joss loomed at the bar, shaking down the locals for information. This was where the guards lived and drank. Teamsters bringing food to the shantytown and sharks keen to fleece refugees of their cash all came here to spend their coin. The crowd was loud, the room smoky, and the jokes were rich with filth. A half-orc seemed to be giving just trouble. Probably not the best choice the half-orc had made in his career. The Justicar's patience was remarkable, but would eventually wear thin. 
enjoying the interval between the disappearance of rational, talkative Juss and the appearance of Wrath of the Gods Juss, Escala smiled. The ranger had an endearing habit of tugging his grim persona about himself like a cloak. He enjoyed it like an actor living for a good role in a play. But from time to time, Juss could be persuaded to drop the facade. And then a rather interesting man began to emerge. Escala had rolled onto her belly amidst the warm depths of the backpack, when quite suddenly a hand began groping at her rear. Escala jerked away, whirled about, and scowled. A hand had snuck into the backpack. The hand was attached to an arm, and the arm had somehow ended up affixed to a pimple-smothered thief with protruding teeth. The thief groped about in the backpack looking for anything valuable, and kept himself hidden under the table. Escala gave an amused little smile. She watched the groping hand, cracked her knuckles loudly, and then went to work. Working carefully and with his eyes peering under the table toward the Justicar, the thief frowned as something touched his wrist and then jerked tight. He scowled, looked down at the backpack, then almost expired as he saw that the bag now had evil eyes and horribly sharp teeth. With a noise like a whip crack, a long, rough, rope-like tongue wrapped around his arm, holding it in place. Talking with its mouth full, the bag gave an evil little roar. Me magic bag of gnawing! Now me feed! Feed good! Serrated fangs gleamed, the thief screamed, and quite suddenly a flash of magic sparkled in the air. With a bang, a weasel appeared beside the terrified thief. The weasel wrung its paws and pranced in concern. Don't move! One wrong twitch and pow! It'll rip your arm off! The weasel moved to hastily survey the thief's arm. It's all right. I'm the magic wishing weasel. I've got the bag held in a spell. Don't make any sudden moves, and you might get out of this alive. Pale with fright, the thief held his arm rigid, the bag's tongue holding him trapped. He stared at the backpack's fangs in fright. M magic wishing weasel? Well, you wished for a way out of this, right? The weasel opened up its front paws. So what are you complaining about? I happen to be passing, so I'm on the job. Unless you want me to go. The weasel snapped its fingers, and instantly the backpack roared and yanked the thief's arm deeper into its maw. The thief gave a pathetic bleat of fright. No! Stay! Just get it off me! Get it off! Sure, fine. The weasel clicked its fingers again, and the snarling backpack subsided. The magic wishing weasel leaped onto the thief's frozen arm and inspected the backpack's hairy tongue. Hmm, all right. Simple to fix. You've got one hand free, right? You want me to cut the bag? The thief groped hastily for a knife. Fine. No! The weasel hurriedly waved its paws. You'll enrage it? No! In a case like this, you have to make use of natural strategy. Natural strategy? Trust me, kid. I'm a weasel. Traveling in a sinuous roundabout route, the weasel ended up upon the thief's shoulder. It tapped its paws together and gave a brief flip of its tail. All right, kid. We have to make nature work for you, not against you. The bag shifted its grip, trembling as if about to break its restraining spell, and the thief swallowed in fright. Magic weasel, help me! All right, kid. Now listen. The weasel looked down at the thief's bulging purse, then stood aside. I've got it held for a while. To escape the bag, you have to trigger its gag reflex, but not by putting a hand or a tool in there. Oh no, that thing senses anything big in there, and it'll rip your arm right out of its socket. Drawing a brief sketch in the dust, the weasel chattered on. There's one patch at the back of its throat that can trigger the gag reflex. You have to hit it with something heavy. Something small, dense, and solid to make it spit out your arm. 
the thief immediately threw an empty beer stein into the backpack. The magic weasel gave a tired sigh. No, something small and heavy. Very small, very dense. The weasel rapped on the thief's head. You understand dense, yeah? What? Nothing. You want brains, don't come to the flaness. Sketching out a diagram in midair, the weasel tried to educate the thief. Look, there's a little tiny slot at the bottom of the bag. All you do is drop little heavy things in there in the hope they'll go through the slot. Little flat, heavy things. Small, flat, round, heavy things. The thief blinked cluelessly, and the weasel gave a snarl. Look, just drop coins into the bag or it'll nibble your knuckles off. Fumbling in haste, the thief grabbed for his purse, undid the drawstrings with his teeth, and sent a tumble of gold coins spilling down into the backpack's toothy mouth. The carnivorous backpack scowled, mumbled, then suddenly gave a great cough. Feeling his arm held in a briefly loosened grip, the thief jerked his hand free. He immediately threw himself as far away from the backpack as possible. Frustrated, the backpack gnashed its fangs and grumbled. Meanwhile, the wishing weasel slapped the panting thief on the back in congratulations. There you are, free as a bird. Grinning, the weasel began to prod the thief out from under the table. Now go on, scram, off you go, borrow some money, have a drink to celebrate, and maybe consider a change in career. Pale with fright, the thief still had eyes only for the gnashing backpack. Th thank you, magic wishing weasel. The man withdrew into the tavern light. How can I repay you? All in a day's work, kid. No need to thank me. Just naff off. The weasel suddenly bit its lip and scuttled closer. But if anyone was to ask, say, just for argument's sake, if a really big shaven-headed guy in black armor wearing a hellhound skin, if a guy like that asked what happened to your money, You'd say that you chose to put it in the backpack, right? The thief rubbed his bruised wrist in fright and said, Roy, right. Great kid, now scram. The weasel crept onto the table beside an incredulous poke. Nice kid, but a brain the size of a peppercorn. Polk looked at a skull of the weasel in confusion and asked, Was that boy a thief? Nah. He came to make a donation. I think we must have made about fifty gold pieces out of him. Escala dropped her illusion spell from the backpack, which returned to being a plain old leather pack. The tongue of the beast, a disreputable length of cord, was stuffed back into the darkness of the pack. Escala shifted back into her usual form and rummaged about inside the backpack to find her discarded clothes. She was tugging her leggings into place, when a heavy presence made itself known outside her sanctuary. Escala? It was an unsolicited gift. Escala jammed her head out of the bag to face the Justicar. Ask him. He gave it to us on his own initiative. Joss squatted on his heels beside the backpack and scowled. What? Oh, nothing. The fairy saw Joss's look of confusion and gave a nervous twiddle of her wings. Nothing at all. Did you get any information? Enough to know we don't want to eat whatever that is cooking over the fire. Joss slowly cracked the knuckles of his left fist. This town needs justice. Well, I've been redressing the balance and doing my bit. Escala finished tugging her long leggings onto her feet and wriggled her elegant bare toes. So, are we staying or going? Going. Just tried not to breathe the tavern stink. These are lower-level predators. The disaster in the valley is giving them the chance to prey on these refugees. The man's face was a shadow beneath the jet-black hellhound skin. Kill the head and the body has to die. The Justicar swung the pack onto his back, and Escala stayed inside for the ride. Above her, Cinders' tall ears stood proud. With her hands folded behind her head, Escala wriggled on her bed of misappropriated gold and sighed. That's the man. Walking heavily through the tavern, 
just heard the excited yell from the door ahead. He stopped and saw a skinny, pimple-smothered man, backed up by four huge half-orcs, dressed in rusted armor. The leader of the armored brutes seemed strangely hunched and bestial. Part bugbear or part ogre, he had a skin covered in scabs. The smaller man swelled in righteous fury and roared, "'That man there! He has a carnivorous backpack! He uses it to extort people!' The thief waved his hand. "'He's in league with the takers! He's here to scout for the pale lady!' The four half-orcs instantly started forward. Polk immediately took a big step to one side, carrying himself away from the Justicar as he opened up his chronicles and dug out a fresh pen. Behind him, the whole tavern crowd arose. At least twenty thugs, mercenaries, brigands, and rogues surged to their feet. Just walked toward the huge, misshapen figure of the senior guard. The big ranger scratched his stubbled chin and scowled. Who's the pale lady? She runs the takers. She clears the valleys. The half-orc hissed and flexed its claws. Yelling to his men, the guard began to draw a scimitar. They're takers. Hang them. Joss felled the beast with a lightning-fast left jab. The half-orc flew backward into his men, sending weapons flying and armor clattering. Another soldier grabbed his comrades by the shoulder and hurled them to the floor. Down! The half-orcs threw themselves flat. Behind them stood two more bestial soldiers, each leveling a crossbow straight toward the Justicar. Fangs spread into grins as the men swung their weapons onto target. Cinders' huge teeth gleamed. Hello. Flame blasted through the doorway, slamming the crossbowmen back into the street. Cinders' flames sheeted across the half-orcs on the floor. The hellhound screeched in happy bloodlust as screams filled the air. Burn! Burn! A sword hissed toward Juss's head. The big man ducked and landed a massive kick into the swordsman's guts, folding him in two. Inside the tavern, men scattered aside in terror as Cinders' nostrils trailed little flames. One man hammered a spell at the Justicar, a charm spell that twisted aside from the shielding influence of the ranger's magic ring. Just strode forward with a roar, and tavern-goers scattered and fled out the back door. Escala popped her head out of Just's backpack, looking toward the open street. She paused for one thoughtful moment, then opened up her hands and molded an arc of sizzling electricity between her palms. She sped the spell through the door. A lightning bolt flashed into being just outside the doorway, sizzling perpendicularly left and right. Unseen voices screamed and wailed. Escala dusted off her hands, having eliminated an ambush party waiting just outside the doors. Flattened against one tavern wall was the thief. The man quaked in terror as he stared at Escala and the Justicar. He took one long look at Escala, shook his head in absolute terror, and slid to the ground with his eyes rolling upward in a faint. Unused to her beauty being so sadly reviled, Escala dusted off the smoking palms of her hands and said, Next time, just listen to your friendly neighborhood weasel. The tavern seemed deserted. Escala flew out of the backpack and went to search her victims for loose change. Are we done yet? I hate taverns like this. Josh shook his stinging left hand. The half-orc's jaw had felt like it had been drop-forged out of steel. Let's go. Sure, just a bit. Escala surfaced from amidst a pile of smoking half-orcs. Hey, a gold tooth? You got any pliers? Escala... Your dagger will do in a pinch. Escala! Just kidding. The fairy waved her hands in innocence. Lighten up. We came, we saw, he toasted butt. Just another typical day. Joss snared her by the wings and dragged the girl outside. Let's get moving before their pale lady takes an interest. The ranger shot a look at Polk, who was taking a hasty body count. Polk, move! Just strode onto a street that now seemed deserted. A last few people were fleeing into their homes. 
Joss threw Polk into the wagon and wrenched the mule into motion, whacking the creature into a trot and running heavily alongside. Still busy with his books, Polk tottered up numbers and beamed in delight. Not bad, son, not bad, Polk tried to make a note in his ledger. I make it sixteen at least. Joss clung onto the mule's mane as he lumbered down the road. Shut up and drive the cart. Polk closed his book with a loud bang. One punched, one kicked, six burned, and eight fried. Escala clung onto the sides of the cart, her hair streaming in the breeze. And one just kind of fainted. So that's seventeen. Just looked back over his shoulder and said, Polk, what are you doing now? Keeping score. Every group of heroes has to have a score. Four. A side trail led off the main track. Forced to slow down, the Justicar cursed the mule and cart for the thousandth time as he swung them onto the new route. Hanging back as the cart blundered onward, Joss swept the new trail with a severed branch and retreated away from the main track. Escala sat atop the cart, counting a little pile of gold. She smiled at Joss, holding up one of her glittering trophies. The Justicar growled under his breath, swept the trail clean of cart tracks, then walked irritably along at the wagon's tail. A mile down the track, Joss allowed the mule cart to slow to a halt. Wheezing like broken bellows, the mule staggered forward to a little stream where it stood hock-deep in water. Polk took the chance to uncork his whiskey bottle. The little man took a swig, sighed, sealed his bottle, and then sat up in his seat. When do we go back to town? Your ruse must have worked, boy. The soldiers will be out searching, so now's the time to head back and face down their leader with cold, hard steel. Annoyed, Joss glared at the little man, half tempted to harness him next to his own mule. Polk, we're not fighting anyone. But they said they knew a pale lady. Were she good, she'd be the fair lady. But pale lady? She just has to be evil. They thought we worked for her, Polk. Shut up and drink. The glade seemed peaceful, deserted and quiet, Little birds twittered amidst the brilliant red autumn leaves while the cups of fallen acorns shone twinkling in the sun. Water flashed and sunken leaves lined the stream bed with red and gold. The Justicar stood, feet planted wide apart, and his gaze speared Escala. The little fairy raised one brow and pointed at herself in inquiry. Joss answered by crooking a finger in her direction. Escala, a word. Deliberately innocent, Escala drifted into the air and kept pace with Joss as he stalked beside the stream. Already guessing virtually everything he needed to know, the Justicar turned toward Escala. The tavern? Rubbing her hands together and looking a tad embarrassed, Escala shook her head in wonder. Yeah, some place, huh? Sad how some people just take an instant dislike to you for no reason at all. Unamused, Joss held her in place with a scowl. You promised not to cause any more trouble. Oh, but it's an endearing kind of trouble. Escala made a sheepish grin, then pranced in midair in front of the Justicar. It's lively. It's fun. You'd miss it if it wasn't there every day of your life. How's your hand, by the way? Hurts. Escala took his hand and gave it a little fairy kiss, light as a feather and strangely warm. Well, it was a good punch. Joss flexed his hand and winced, then remembered that he was supposed to be cowing Escala beneath the weight of his indignation. You promised no more scams. You lied to me. Escala sighed miserably and suddenly seemed the heart and soul of guilt. Her long antennae wilted, and her pointed ears fell. I'm sorry, because, you know, when you think about it, 
When we lie, we murder the truth. Yes. Puffing up with righteousness, Joss gave a dire nod. Well put. I agree. Escala put on her most gentle, wise, and sorrowful face. She laid one hand on the Justicar's shoulder and used her other hand to show him the glory of the trees. Autumn leaves falling, branches stark and withering, and within it all the acorns send green shoots into the soil. Beautiful, aren't they? The girl floated like a spirit of the wilds, while overhead tall oak trees soared. Each new green shoot springs from the loam. But do you know where that loam comes from? Just stood his ground and folded up his arms. Do tell. It comes from the dead leaves and trees that have gone before. Escala seemed full of an infinite, quiet, motherly love as she floated amidst nature's timeless wonder. New life springs from the death of old, and ideas are the same. Truths are just preconceptions, ideas trapped and put into a box. Sure, lies murder the truth, but when we kill truths, it allows new ideas to spring up in their place. A glorious profusion of nature, intellectual freedom, art and science and light and love. The avatar of a glorious future, Escala turned a pirouette up in the sky. Jos, we owe it to future generations. They deserve that intellectual freedom, and it's all in our hands, Jos. I say we owe it to the future to lie through our teeth right now. He stopped and stood there, arms folded and watched her patiently. Escala hovered in front of him, coyly biting one finger. Not buying it? Not really. Still, pretty hoopy speech, huh? A warrior for justice should not be amused at falsity. Just sniffed and kept a straight face. One of your better ones. Ha! Sorry, man. I drive you nuts. Escala flipped a finger as though tipping an imaginary cap. If you didn't love me, you'd never put up with me. Yeah. Juss's face cracked into a fond smile despite itself. Suddenly Escala met his eyes and matched his expression. The girl suddenly blushed, then paled and hastily whirred backward, thoroughly flustered. Aware that his ears were glowing an uncomfortable red, Juss cleared his throat, scowled, and turned to look along the stream. Escala cleared her throat and sped off to the wagon, busying herself by tidying an already neat pile of coins. Joss decided to walk along the stream and look for non-existent tracks. From his perch atop Joss's head, Cinders sniggered and hissed smoke. Funny. Choosing not to comment, Joss tugged his armor straight and went about the serious business of being the Justicar. Back at the wagon, Escala meandered in midair like a hummingbird surveying her domain. With a sly, self-satisfied little smile, she blew a strand of hair from her eyes, pushing her long, corn-silk locks behind her pointed ears. Remembering a hand mirror tucked into dark recesses of her baggage, the fairy fluttered down to pull at the satchel stored upon the cart, spilling her embarrassing collection of lingerie, old scrolls, and stale fairy cakes into the sun. Gold sparkled amidst the bric-a-brac. Busily propping up the mirror against the baggage, Escala flicked the gold a single annoyed glance. She stood before the mirror and turned sideways to admire her little figure, tidied her hair, and then frowned as the golden glimmer caught her eye once more. There, lying amidst a colorful scatter of underwear, was a tiny little necklace on which a single clear stone shone and glittered in the sunlight. Escala approached it, looking at it in startled disbelief. She touched it. The gold work was impossibly fine and fashioned perfectly for the scale and delicacy of a fairy. Incredulous, Escala lifted up the jewel and watched it sparkle. 
with the prettiest of little blushes, and Scala quietly put the necklace on. She admired it in awe, unable to believe just what was happening. The gold was a dark, rich orange that showed her hair to be of a far more precious hue. The clear stone hung between her breasts and seemed to shimmer and flow with all the colors of the forest sky. It caught the green of her eyes and turned it from a sly glimmer to a shade innocent as forest grass. Escala turned and gazed at her reflection in the mirror, looking at herself in blank astonishment. It had been custom-made for her, custom-made with infinite care. Escala turned and looked toward Joss. The man knelt beside the stream, carefully examining fallen autumn leaves in the mud. The fairy felt something akin to a tear well in her eye, even as she swelled her breast like a pufferfish about to burst. A blush spread from her ear tips to her toes. Suddenly girlishly shy, she found herself unable to move or even speak. The necklace hung fluid and gleaming about her neck, while Juss artlessly managed to avoid watching her. Polk corked his jug and gave a loud, satisfied sigh. He had given his astonished mule a slug of whiskey, and the poor animal now stood with its knees knocking and its eyes staring into different dimensions of space and time. Turning, Polk saw Escala's necklace glistening about her alabaster throat. He creased his brows and exclaimed, Jewels! The teamster scratched his head with a noise like sandpaper. Is that treasure? Ooh, definitely. Escala floated quietly into the air, feeling a strange, numb sensation. She hovered indecisively for a long moment, then tugged her skirt straight, took a deep breath, and flew over to the Justicar. He knelt, examining a fallen maple leaf, one of untold thousands that carpeted the banks of the forest stream. This particular leaf showed a tiny mark on the moist dirt that sheened its upper surface, a mark like a tiny footprint only a few inches long. Escala landed softly on the mold nearby, her hands behind her back and her body swinging from side to side like an embarrassed child called up before her school. She cleared her throat, just contrived to carefully lever up the fallen maple leaf and examine the indentation left in the mud below. The footprint could not have been made by a creature any heavier than a modest house cat. Escala took a step closer, and the sheer radiance of her blush made Just look up into her coy smile. Looking at him from the corner of her eye, Escala held her necklace stone in her hands. It's, uh, a beautiful necklace. Just knelt in the leaves before her, and Escala cleared her throat. It's slow glass. It sees everything I do and filters it out the back in a fortnight's time. She blushed a deeper shade of cherry pink. They're called newlywed stones. Just bared his head, slipping cinders down onto his shoulders and letting his unhelmeted head gleam in the light. Escala ventured a little closer, suddenly feeling an urge to pat the velvet stubble of Just's skull. She instead bit her lip and smiled down into the fallen leaves. This is just too, too sweet. Blinking, just looked at her from her tight little leggings up to the roots of her hair. The necklace suits you. Well, it is gorgeous. It's tailor-made. A girl half turned away, hugging herself and casting one eye back across her shoulder. Joss, I can't. This is, like, really expensive. Looking a little confused, Joss sat back on his heels. Muscles moved under his shirt, making Escala's heart flutter in strange ways. Just scratched thoughtfully at his chin and said, It does look expensive. But if it's what you want... Oh, oh, I want! Escala whirled, paled, blushed, and hid her face behind one hand. I mean, it's really appreciated. I know you think, well, that maybe I didn't understand. 
I just wanted you to know. Escala bit her finger, struggling her thoughts past her embarrassment. I just wanted you to know that, well, I've been thinking. Her cheeks were aflame. Escala pressed the backs of her hands against her face to cool them and felt a lump in her throat. I've, ah, uh, been thinking it through. I know that's what you'd want me to do. She felt her hands shake and hid them behind her back. I mean, we have to be careful about all of this. It's a change, not a bad change. But it shifts everything into, well, you know, a new light. Just rubbed at his nose, his confusion growing. He raised one brow and asked, What have you been thinking? Um, well, I've been thinking that it's all right. You've sort of grown. I've sort of grown. The girl swallowed. I, I think it's time. Gus's brows creased. Time? Oh, I know what you're saying. Escala whirled, all of a passion. I know size differences might seem a, well, you know, a bit of a problem, but, ah, uh, I think there's a spell somewhere that can help. You know, I could make myself a better scale. More able to, ah, uh, to share, ah. Uh. The girl suddenly blushed beet red and began prodding the tips of her index fingers together. Well, it just opens up possibilities. But we can wait. We have to wait. We might just have to be patient, you know, for a while, until we find the means. Sucking on a tooth, Just crossed his legs, collected the fairy, and arranged her on his knee. He hunched down to meet her eye in concern. Escala, are you all right? I'm fine. The girl almost jumped out of her skin. Just fine. Good. Just tilted his head to examine her as if she might be mad. Escala, what are you talking about? Escala felt the blood drain out of her whole body and go into storage somewhere on another plane. She wilted like a boiled lettuce as she stared at the Justicar. You didn't give me the necklace, did you? Still mystified, Just shook his head. Escala felt her whole life sliding into a horrible pit of embarrassment. You didn't give me roses, and you didn't give me the sweets either. Uh, no. Just scratched his head. A mind used to sifting tiny clues and solving crimes struggled with the events of the last five minutes. What was all that about scale? Nothing. Escala jumped to her feet in fright. Nothing at all. It was... The girl looked for something neat and glib to save her face. It was wing scales. Like butterflies. I need to change my scales. Dust them off, polish them, and it will take time. The girl fluttered like a mad moth in a bottle. Yep, time. Which implies anticipation. Lots of anticipation, all working toward... Ah, uh, fruit. No, not fruit. Cherry picking. The girl whirled and grabbed Joss by the armor. No, not cherries. Bananas. Apples. Yes, gotta have my wings ready by apple blossom time. Fairy tradition. Suddenly, Escala stopped, stared at Joss, and leaned away. You gave me none of those gifts. Nope. Not roses. Not my favorite sweets. Not this tailor-made necklace just for me. The Justicar spread his hands in innocence. Escala, really? Shh. The fairy's face went blank. She lifted a hand for silence as horrible thoughts skittered through her mind. It wasn't you. Sudden cold fear gripped Escala, and she whirled to stare around at the forest in fright. She fired off a battery of spells, an anti-scrying shield, then an illusion of herself and Juss still sitting talking by the stream. The girl grabbed Juss by the shirt and dragged him into a run, yanking him back toward the cart. Run! Come on! Run! 
She snatched her ice wand, Enid's stun scroll, and her spell books all in a single mad second. Polk began wrenching his cart around to follow as she dragged Joss out across the stream. The girl took one look at the cart and fired a swarm of little magic bees that slashed the mule's traces and cut them in two. Polk, get on the mule and ride! Hurry! My cart! Polk stared at the abandoned vehicle. My cart! Lose it! Escala whacked the terrified mule across its rump. Go! With a bleat of fear, the mule sped into the trees, plunging Polk through a bramble bush. Joss backed away from the stream, his hand on his sword trying to cover Polk and Escala's backs. What is it? What's there? Just run! Just do it! Escala felt tears of panic flood her eyes. Come on, man! I don't want to lose you! The girl dragged Joss away, and he broke into a run. He led the way past Polk and the mule, twisting sideways down a deep gully filled with leaves that helped cover their trail. They fled past fallen statues, past another giant's skeleton, and sped out onto an old road with weeds jutting up between the cobblestones. Escala danced in a cold fright, keeping her companions in the cover of the trees. They ran for a mile. Breathing hard, Joss stopped beneath a broken oak to look behind him. Nothing moved. The world seemed still. Escala shot out of the skies, her eyes roaming in fright across the leaves. Joss, if we get separated, meet me at the Hydra's lair. Just wait. Wait as long as it takes. She half tore out of his hands, surged forward, gave him a kiss, and broke away. You're my friends. I'm not losing you. Something unseen flashed through the leaves high above. Escala whirled, stabbed a spell into the treetops, and blasted a web across the trees. Something small and invisible struck the web, kicking and cursing. Escala shot aside, invisible again. A line of golden bees hissed from midair to show her position as she passed. She blasted the branches and tops from trees, sending a cascade of debris tumbling through the forest. Something invisible hovered in the falling leaves, something that cursed and threw up a shield to ward away the debris. Stabbing upward from below came another spell, and another of Escala's webs hit something full force and plastered a struggling shape against an old dead tree. Leaves jerked as Escala sped invisibly away, until a vast wall of fire suddenly thundered upward in her path. Escala's voice could be heard cursing, then cursing again as another firewall blocked her escape off to one side. In a sudden flash, Escala's invisible body was somehow outlined in sparkling light as an unseen enemy neutralized Escala's camouflage. Joss was already running to her aid. He tackled the girl, bawling himself about her as he leaped through the firewall. Cinders' pelt shielded them from the heat. Rolling to his feet, Joss released the girl. Breaking away, she sped hard and fast through the underbrush. Joss, keep back! A spell stabbed at her from above. Escala rolled aside, but the magic had never been intended to hit her. Instead, it lanced into the fern beneath, which instantly sprang into life and caught the girl about the waist. Struggling, Escala became visible as she fired a shower of little missiles into the plants and blew them apart. She flung out a hand and scythed a spell into a patch of empty space. A female scream echoed in the woods, and a small form smashed into the autumn leaves, flickered, and instantly became visible. It was a scala in mirror image, small, lithe, blonde, and winged like a dragonfly. Dressed in white lace, the fairy had a face and hair that could have been a scala's own. With a vicious screech, the newcomer scrabbled to her feet and threw a killing glance at Escala. Escala hissed, whipped open her hands, and the blinding sizzle of a lethal spell flashed into life. The other fairy snarled at her, matching Escala's motion and wreathing herself in dancing electricity. The two girls were about to open fire when a sudden imperious voice pealed out from above. Enough! It was a voice that hit with a tidal wave of matronly power. On the forest floor, the two young fairies jerked sullenly back as though struck a blow. Unused combat spells leaked off into the ground. 
Escola, Tiel, cease this at once. A regal presence shimmered into being above the two glaring girls. Lean and arrogant, blonde and beautiful, it was a female fairy dressed in icy splendor. Her body had a wild hauteur that almost stung the eye. Other figures shimmered into view. Fairies, male and female, in hunting costumes and in gowns. Their fashions were exquisite, their faces arrogant. Here and there, tiny dragons buzzed and hovered at a fairy's side. Looking stark in her black leathers, Escala stood and coldly wiped the spell taint from her gloves. Standing proud and arrogant amidst her peers, and keeping a good grip upon her battle wand, she stared at the magnificent woman floating above, and gave her a look that dripped poisoned icicles. The woman looked down at Escala, as though examining a slug found beneath a log. Hello, Escala. Escala matched the woman gaze for gaze. Hello, mother. Five. It was a world where dreams had taken shape into reality, a place of strange colors and spaces that shone like alien stars. A titanic tree stump made an island, and above the island the sky shimmered with little drifting points of light. A dark, cool pool stretched off into the distance. Wooden stepping blocks stretched off across the lake to other islands, far and near. The light motes reflected in the water, showing the shapes of fish and giant water beetles far below. Bullfrogs peeled from the shadows, while nightingales flitted between strands of alien flowers. All about the pool, nature had been put into good order, arranged as a careful piece of art. It seemed to be night. The sky was dark and starry, and yet everything shone as clearly as in the light of day. Sitting sourly on a pillow at the center of a little aisle, Escala swatted at a nightingale as the stupid creature twittered by. The garden upon the tree stump aisle had been sculpted perfectly. Plants had been shaped into tables, chairs, and couches, all overlaid with silk brocades. A satyr daintily served tea and scones, while plates of food and flasks of wine stood gleaming in the light. Surrounded by dreamlike plenty, Joss, Polk, and even the mule all remained frozen in shock. The satyr bowed, proffering jam and cream. Escala ignored the creature until it went away. Sitting alone with her knees hugged to her chin, the fairy kept her eyes carefully away from the scenery. She tossed a glance at the feast, then turned away. Don't drink the wine, she said without looking up, and don't eat the food. Polk jerked his hand back, already reaching for a scone. It's enchanted? Polk, don't drink the wine. Don't touch it, don't sniff it, don't even touch the damned cork. Ascala sat with her knees hunched beneath her chin. Unless you're a fairy... Fairy wine's instant suicide. Makes you drunk as a pickled thought-eater in seconds three. Oh! Polk eyed the wine glass nearest him, half tempted to give it a try. Really? The hangover comes about ten minutes later, Polk. Rumor says it's like having a pair of exploding wolverines mating inside your skull. Even Polk, inveterate drinker that he was, shrank away from the wine. Wolverines? Yeah, especially the vintage 63. Gives you violent tremors and convulsions in less time than it takes to scream. Polk kept a distance between himself and the nearest plate of scones. How about the food? Poison? The scholar shrugged and said, No. Should we eat it? No. Blinking, Polk scratched his skull. Why? Because we don't want to give my mother any leverage. Escala sat back against a rock and tossed a pebble at a nightingale. If she feeds you, she can ask for a favor in return. When she comes back, watch what you say. 
don't give her any information she can use. But she's your mother. Killer amoebas have mother's poke. I am not going to embrace any of those either. The fairies had opened a door in the empty air of the forest and had led Escala and her companions into this eerie fantasy land. They now sat amid the songbirds and the frogs, surrounded by a ring of ghostly elf hounds that kept them trapped in an unwinking gaze. Joss reached into his belt pouch, brought out a chunk of hardtack, and split it three ways between himself, Polk, and Escala. At his side, Cinders lay nose to nose with an elf hound. The hellhound leaked sulfurous steam from his nostrils, and the elf hound bristled, bared its teeth, then broke into a vicious growl. The growl turned into a yelp of panic as Cinders spewed a jet of flame that scorched the elf hound's back. Of all the travelers, Cinders was the only one with a grin. Funny. Kicking at the scenery, Escala stood and paced, watched by a dozen elf hounds as she walked. She stood at the shore of the island and stared off across the dark, reflective pool. They redecorated. Just joined her, sitting at her side, his hand resting too casually upon his sword and aware that the walls could have ears. So, this is the Seely Court? Ha! Huh, they wish. Escala gave a flick of contempt. This is just a pocket above the forest, a tiny alternative realm. Tons of places have them. Think of it as Flaness plus one. It runs about, oh, a mile wide. Escala looked about. The forest is still there. Any tree you find in here with an arch of branches is a gate to somewhere or other. Joss weighed the information, still wondering just exactly where they were. He carefully scanned the starry sky, checking the constellations. Does time move differently here? No, although on other planes it does. Escala used her hands to show her friends the horizons of the eerie fairy world. This is just a citadel. Thirty fairies, three hundred servants, and a ton of these damned hounds. Eyes narrowed, the girl carefully watched an elf hound that slunk watchfully nearby. Try not to look straight at anything. Try to look past the surface. Most of it's an illusion. You can get the knack of telling. Escala sounded sour. Careful of the wildlife. Anything about the mass of a fairy probably is a fairy. No trout is a trout, no cat's a cat. The bored ones can get pretty strange. Don't stare or they'll try and get pushy. Hmm, the Justicar grunted. What if we're attacked by one? Cut it fast and hard. Give it time to throw a spell and your dog meat. But don't do it. I'm almost out of spells. The girl shrugged. They have a dueling code. One-on-one -on -one fights are your own affair if you make it a formal challenge. Are they all magic users? Yeah, all of them. Joss rippled his fingertips along the hilt of his sword. Should we try to bring in Enid and have her bust us out of here? Not yet. Escala's antennae stayed stiff and high, testing magic currents in the air. I need a way to get you guys clear of here before I do anything cute. Heaving a frustrated, angry sigh, Escala paced, drawing Polk and Joss down beside her. Polk had filled his mustache with hardtack crumbs. He seemed to regard Escala with newfound awe. So this is a fairy palace, a gateway to adventure. Yeah, the girl gave a sneer. And I'm a princess. Polk and Joss both gave her an appraising look. Escala angrily waved her hand. I told you that when we first met. A fairy princess, I said. No one believes me. No one ever believes me. Can't imagine why. Just scratched his head and left it at that. All right. So what's the story? Why are they after you? Why are we here? Well, they aren't shooting to kill, so that means they want to talk. 
Escala ran her fingers through her hair in frustration. I hate this place. I hate these people. She turned her face away. Here's the rundown. This is Clan Nightshade, my clan. They're exiled from the Seely Court over some crap you and I could care less about, so Clan Nightshade is a rogue. Fought their way through three different planes and ended up here, holed up on the Flaness. Her voice was toneless. Fairies usually live in a sealed society, the Seely Court. It straddles several planes of existence. Very old, nine clans always stabbing one another in the back. Spawned a dark goddess once and has kept out of mortal affairs ever since. She leaned closer, her voice dropping to a whisper. Nightshade is trouble. They are my clan, so don't underestimate them. We learned magic the hard way. Ascala kept her face neutral and guarded, her eyes flicking left and right for signs of scrying spells. The Seely Court clans are a lot more inbred, more reclusive, more formulaic. Joss slowly stroked his fingers through Cinders' hair. But these are all fairies like you, right? Escala gave the man a sharp stare. Small, slim, and somehow sinister with her pointed ears and tilted eyes, she suddenly seemed no joking matter. Clan Nightshade is personally responsible for neutralizing and imprisoning a goddess. The girl narrowed her eyes. You're still thinking of elves and pixies. Don't. Fairies are the true folk. Imagine a race of magic-using flying creatures that can change shape and go invisible at will. The girl bitterly pitched a piece of grass into the wind. Elves are to fairies what skinks are to black dragons. Don't make the mistake of thinking that just because something's short, it can't splay your lungs all over the grass. Polk recoiled, looking Escala indignantly up and down. But you're not nasty. You've got honor and guts and good intentions. Polk, I'm the girl who didn't fit in and ran away. She hunched over, cradling her head in her hands. The Justicar dragged cinders over beside Escala. Heaving a tired sigh, the little fairy reached out to scratch the hellhound's ear. Cinders look after fairy. Thanks, man. You're my favorite pooch. Sensing that some of the plants were clearly spies, Joss looked at Escala as he spoke. What happens now? Why are we here? I have a few suspicions. Escala's hand tightened on Cinders's fur. I'm eldest daughter to the clan head. Whatever they want, it's no good news for me. Are you in danger? Not immediately. It's not like I broke any laws. Plus, I've already taken down some of the clan's best spell-slingers twice today. They know I'm not quite the same little girl who ran away from home. A fanfare of trumpets peeled out across the lake. An instant later, a row of brilliantly clad little creatures popped into view. They seemed to be a type of pixie, shorter than a scala and far, far sillier, with long cricket's legs and eyes like an insect's. The creatures blew on heraldic horns, then tittered with mirth as they rolled their eyes at Polk and Joss. Summon come, summon come, come to Biggie Lord. Leave mortals to play game with happy Griggs. Sharing a look of seething annoyance with Joss, Escala rose to her feet and said, Griggs, I hate these guys. The fairy planted her fists on her hips. Now hear this. These are my blood companions. A spell cast on them is a spell cast on me. The girl turned dire eyes on the shocked little Griggs. I mean it. Trixie, Trixie, payback doubles. The Griggs scuffled their feet and pouted. Mean. Yeah, well, I'm that one. Remember me? The mean lady is back again. Escala swatted at the little sprites, who scattered sullenly away. Half-wit relatives? You can bet your butt they don't have to put up with these little buggers in the real Seely Court. P. 
peeking out of cover all around the island were a host of tiny little shapes, all pixie-like, all small, all less formidable than the pure fairies Joss had seen. Joss settled cinders securely into place upon his helmet and looked at the forest sprites. These are all related to fairies? Why so many offshoots? Pixies, sprites, grigs, atomies? Chaos wars. Escala led her way through the ranks of hiding sprites. A lot of pure bloodlines were split up. Goblinoids, giants, dragons. Fairies took the brunt of it. That's why we turned reclusive. The girl had reached the shore, and here a party of lean, elegant fairies awaited them. We're summoned. Come on, let's go meet the family. Keep your eyes open and your mind straight. Joss and Escala both flexed their hands, each feeling for the rings that kept them safe from charm spells. At the water's edge, Escala's twin awaited them. The newcomer was pure fairy. The lean lines, the aristocratic face and air of cool intelligence instantly marked her. In shape and face, she could almost have been Escala. A little rounder in the eyes, far, far plusher in the bosom, but as alike as two sisters had a right to be. She had dressed herself in tight white lace with a glint of silver on her hand. Escala's leathers looked stark and almost primitive in contrast to the other girl. The lace-clad figure sketched a mocking little bow and said, Sweet sister. Yeah, whatever. Escala turned and jerked her thumb toward the other fairy. Guys, this is Tiel, my little sister. A total bitch. Polk doffed his cap. Joss merely gave a brief nod of his head. Turning back to her sister, Escala stared the other girl up and down. The two females exchanged looks that dripped with pure disdain. So, Tiel, you porked out? Yes, they are called breasts. Tiel looked at her sister with a sour laugh. Love the outfit. Is it uncured leather? Or is that smell all your own? Ha! You kiss so much butt, I am surprised you still have any sense of smell. Looming like a vast black giant above the fairies, Joss cleared his throat in a bass rumble. It brought the exchange of insults to an end, as both sisters flicked a glance up at the human. Tiel gave a wrinkle of her nose and said, You're summoned to the clan council. Escala gave a sniff and replied, Why do I give a damn? Daddy's asking nicely, and we have visitors. Tiel clicked her fingers to summon more fairies. Male and female spellcasters closed in to surround Escala and her friends. Tiel's fingers gleamed as the light fell on a tiny silver ring shaped like a spider. Oh, you'll like it. Mommy and Daddy have you foremost on their minds. As always. Escala sniffed at her sister and looked scathingly at the fairy warriors. I'm so intrigued, Escala shrugged. Nice ring, by the way. Tiel raised a mocking smile and used her other hand to indicate a line of stepping stones that stretched into the distance. Get moving. They're waiting. At least a dozen fairies served as escorts. Escala scowled. On a good day, she could cream almost anyone in the clan, but with her spells depleted from three combats in a single day, she no longer stood a chance. Whatever happened, Joss and Polk would catch most of the damage. Seething with hate, Escala tried to crush the helpless feeling of being dragged back into Daddy's house as she flew out over the lake. Come on, guys, let's get this done. The Justicar shrugged his armor into place, then strode forward on his strangely quiet boots. Behind him, Polk refused to move. Instead, the teamster turned to Escala with a vacuous smile. My dear, I really don't think this is any business for mortals. Escala planted her fists on her hips. What? Why, 
I think I'll wait here. Thank you, a scholar. Gosh, but the weather is nice. Turning her dire gaze upon the fairies, Escala snarled, Oh, ha, 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 you blitzed an idiot with a charm spell. Something flickered in the air. A charm spell shot from a fairy toward the Justicar and shattered on the shield thrown up by the man's magic ring. Cinders hissed, just jerked his head around and the hellhound's red eyes focused on an invisible shape lurking behind a tree. There. Escala threw up a hand and shoved a single spell toward the hidden fairy. A reeking cloud enveloped the culprit, sending him reeling and retching off into the bushes. Escala watched the fairy go, unshipped her ice wand, and noisily pumped the activation slide. What did I tell you about my friends? Try it again and I'll get nasty. Grinning happily, Cinders wagged his tail. Burn. Not yet. Escala looked at the stepping stones. Cinders, some of the stepping stones are illusions. Just keep your eyes open. Looking bored with it all, Tiel hovered over the surface of the lake and said, None of them are illusions. We have better things to do with our time. Good. Then let the Justicar carry you and hold you tight. Tiel looked annoyed. She made a pass with her hand, and half of the stepping stones disappeared, leaving only blank water in their place. Escala flew out to lead the way, hovering protectively close to the Justicar. Pork, come on, follow me. Why, yes, what a lovely suggestion. Polk beamed vacuously, his voice vapid and formal. May I just say how pert you look today? Polk, spell or no spell, nobody ever uses pert in normal conversation, all right? Just jumped and strode awkwardly from stepping stone to stepping stone, his heavy bulk strangely graceful, his armor and sword quiet through long habit of stealth. Polk bumbled along in his wake, leaving his mule staring forlornly after them. Escala flew along in silence, flanked by a dozen fairies and refusing to so much as even glance at her sister. In the deep waters of the lake, fish swam, giant cuttlefish and little stingrays, all fairies shapeshifted into animal form. In the trees overhead, animals watched the travelers, each creature showing intelligent fairy eyes. Watched from a dozen directions, Joss, Polk, and Escala made their way across the lake toward a giant garden that glimmered with bright flowers. At the shore stood a circular grove of gnarled ancient fruit trees. Escala jerked her thumb at the fruit trees as Joss passed them by. Plain trees. The Justicar turned. Plain trees? No, plain trees, like a tree of the various planes of existence. That grove leads off to other planes. Primal energy, negative energy, fire, water, that sort of thing. You need a key taken from the plane you're heading to. Amazingly useless. The garden made a ring of light about a fairy palace, an airy thing all made from pearl-gray wood. A long path led toward the palace doors. Beside the path, a lawn hosted a dainty party attended by a dozen fairy folk. The fairies mingled, gossiped, and intrigued. Fawn and satyr servitors poured drinks, while animated plants played music upon lutes. A bevy of female orcs knelt servilely about a fairy lord who was wreathed in fiery robes. All conversation stopped, and all eyes turned as Escala marched out from the trees. A fawn approached and bowed, ushering Escala along the path. Escala waited for Juss and Polk, keeping them at her side. Surrounded by guards and stared at by fairies and servants alike, the three companions walked slowly through the party and headed for the palace doors. The silence was nerve-wracking and irritating. Whirling, Escala turned to face her peers. Yes, it's me! I'm back! You all seen enough? And you? And you? 
the girl pivoted in midair, tugging her skirt tight. Escala sped forward in anger, shoving past two beautifully liveried centaurs and throwing open the palace doors. A vast hall stretched before her, a place of moving murals and carpets that shifted shape and form. A hundred fairies lined the way, most of them dressed in brilliant alien finery. There were guards dressed in bright red mail and fairy dragons fluttering through the rafters eating flower arrangements. Escala took one look at the crowds and sagged back toward the ground. Oh, bugger. Tiel whirred forward to whisper to a scowling major domo. Fairy maids in exotic fashions eyed Joss and whispered sourly behind their fans. Escala pulled in close to the ranger and whispered quickly in his ear. This is not Clan Nightshade. This is way more than Clan Nightshade. The girl suddenly spied a slim, hypochondriacal fairy surrounded by rings of courtiers. Oh, foots! It's the Earl King! Joss pulled at his nose and asked, The who? Oberon, hen-pecked consort to the queen bitch herself. Escala quickly looked for avenues of escape. I think this is the Seely Court. Turning, Joss regarded his friend. Escala, just what exactly did you do when you left here? Escala managed to look both annoyed and evasive all at once. Well, I may have requisitioned more than I was strictly allowed to. The girl waved her hands in outrage. Hey, fairies don't age, man, so letting your kids know they have an inheritance is unfair. So I just prematurely requisitioned what was mine. Joss regarded her with leveled brows. You stole Daddy's wallet and ran away from home? There was more to it than that. You had to be there. Polk beamed goodwill at the whole universe. Why, it seems to be a splendid place. Why ever did you leave? Cinders flattened his ears, scowling at the fripperies and gave a growl. Illusions. Old magic. The dog almost sneezed in disgust. No fun here. All spells. Escala applauded. Thank you, Pooch. Pork, we'll have a little shared lesson on mind-body phenomenology later on, if we're all alive. But it's so pretty. Escala glared. Pork, say... I am an idiot. I am an idiot. Great. Now shut up and enjoy your charm spell before I make you take off your pants. Joss looked disapprovingly about the room. It was pure luxury and opulence, and much of it pure illusion designed to stroke the senses. Dour and Spartan, Joss was the antithesis of the entire fairy way of life. Fairies kept well away, staring at the mortals as though they carried a disease. Tiel emerged from the crowds and looked her sister up and down. They want to see you. Do you care to dress properly first? Just tell me why I'm here. Oh, no. Little surprises are always such fun. Tiel gave a nasty smile. This way to Daddykins. Hop, hop, and do tell your mortals not to scuff the rugs. Today, Joss's boots had trampled through muddy streets, forest streams, and dirt, and he could not care less about the rug. Escala girded herself and flew through the parting crowds, finally finding herself confronting her mother, her father, and a host of unfamiliar faces. Her father turned, powerful and solid, for a fairy, his poise was somehow similar to the Justicar. His hair was long and steel gray, his beard pointed, and his eyes sparked the same green fire as his daughter. He took one look at Escala, split his face into a rough smile, and crushed Escala in his arms. Honey Blossom! He wrestled the girl from side to side, making her eyes bulge. 
With a great bass roar of a laugh, the lord of Clan Nightshade hugged Escala for all that she was worth. Trapped in her father's arms, Escala struggled upward until she could catch Juss's eye. Guys, this is my dad. Overjoyed, Escala's father ruffled the girl's hair. And this, this is my silly skelly. Cinder sniggered, thump, thump, thumping with his tail. Silly skelly. Just looked amused, and Escala spiked him with a snarl. Just keep laughing, Evelyn. Escala gave a long, suffering sigh. Gang, this is Charn, Lord Nightshade, my father. Daddy, this is Polk, a transport consultant. Cinders, a sentient hailhound skin, and here... The girl cast a look longing for help toward Joss. Is my friend, the Justicar. Big, solid, and rough cut out of pure honesty, the Justicar bowed to Escala's father. The fairies scarcely came up to his knees, but he managed to bow toward them with vast dignity. My Lord Charn. Capital! Capital to meet you! Escala's father took one daughter under each arm, Escala suffering patiently, and Tiel coldly smiling. So you are the ones who have served my daughter so loyally while she roamed in the worthless wilds. They're not servants, Dad. Of course not, dear. The man gave his girl a shake. But she's home. She has returned to home and duty at last. A silken movement came from the crowds. Escala's mother appeared, cool as ice, and regarding her prodigal daughter much as she might regard an insect specimen. Escala? Mother? You decided not to dress. Escala's mother took a drink from a tray proffered by one of the scantily clad orc servants. No matter. For our purposes, nothing could be better. Purposes. Escala's voice lowered the temperature of the entire hall. Someone tried to kill my friends this morning. Then some imbecile tried bribing me with candy and flowers. The girl ignored her father and faced her mother. Do tell me all about your little purposes. It is called obligation. I don't care to be obliging. Dusting herself off, Escala disengaged herself from her father's arm. Dad, why am I here? You are here because a great day is here! A family day! The fairy lord beamed. The court has rescinded our exile! Clan Nightshade is to be brought back into the fold! The news hardly hit Escala like a thunderbolt. Oh, whoopee! It's provisional! Escala's father took hold of her elbow and propelled her through the crowds. Scowling fairies made way as Juss and Polk lumbered in Escala's wake. But here, you see? Old comrades all together once again! Old faces to rediscover! Escala made a wry little expression. I've never seen any of them before that. We were exiled about a zillion years before I was born. But comrades still, kith and kin, even representatives from the inner court itself. Charn spread his hands to show his daughter that the palace halls were filled to overflowing. Many of them will be staying here with us while a few formalities are handled, but it's a new beginning for you. They want us to take the lead in wonderful new plans— it will be time for you, girl, eldest child of the clan head. Think of all the changes you can make. Nothing changes, Dad. An old bitterness and nightmare shone through Escala's words. You make castles out of clouds, mountains out of molehills, and nothing ever happens. Lord Charn looked left and right, used a spell to shield him from prying ears and whispered cautiously in his daughter's hair. 
There has been a change in the power balance, and Nightshade holds the key. The clan that defeated and imprisoned the Fairy Queen of Wind and Woe, the clan that knows where she is hidden. We are about to become a power once again. The man clamped Escala on the back, his voice picking up as his spell faded. And so, faces for you to know, new relatives, kith and kin, here is Fane, Lord Halfmoon. Lord Fane is knowledge keeper to the Seely Court and advisor to Queen Titania herself. A thin fairy with a long wisp of a goatee gave Escala a courtly bow. Several mages of the Halfmoon clan stood with him, all sharing a conspirator's smile with the scholar's father before appraising the girl. Her outlandishly stark clothes and aggressive air seemed to meet their secret needs. They inclined their heads and turned to one another with significant little smiles as Escala passed. Joss trod carefully behind Lord Charn. Escala was aware of him covering her back. She could feel the ranger watching her mother and her sister. Cinders's tail wagged. Towing her through the room, Escala's father dragged her from one knot of courtiers to another. Ah, Escala, here is Fariel, Lady Mantis. A sorceress and her entourage bowed in a rattle of outlandish insectoid costumes. Here is the priestess of Corallon and her acolytes. This is Jenna, princess of Clan Raven. Suddenly his eye lighted on his true quarry. Escala's father seemed to swell with new energy. Ah, and here is someone just for you. Waiting at the foot of a fountain stood a fairy cavalier, a youth eel-slim and armed with a delicate silver rapier. His black silk shirt had ribbons bound about the upper arms, kill ribbons from a dozen duels. The cavalier looked Escala up and down. Her leathers were tight as a second skin and showed an astonishing amount of breast and thigh. She half turned, her figure svelte as a velvet cobra, and raked her audience with a haughty glare. The fairy cavalier preened his mustache and whispered approvingly into a neighbor's ear, reaching out to take a tiny goblet of wine. Joss had seen the fairy cavalier before. He had worn a blue silk cloak torn by Juss's sword. Beside the cavalier waited a dark-haired fairy, the same flame-robed lord she had noticed in the park outside. Kneeling orc slave girls made a bizarre outlandish backdrop as they awaited their master's word of command. Lord Charn brought Escala forward to the flame-robed man. Ushan, Lord Sable! I present my eldest daughter, Escala Brightflower, the heiress Nightshade. Escala sniffed, looking dangerous, disdainful, and positively alien amidst so much splendor. Escala, Lord Ushan is Chancellor to Queen Titania. Clan Sable is the right arm of the throne. Escala shrugged. Her father happily dragged her past Lord Ushan and into the middle of Clan Sable. The young cavalier posed, smoothing his mustache as he awaited to greet her. Finally, a scholar, the best comes last. This is the valiant Tarquil, cavalier of the Order of the Sunset, scion of Clan Sable, and nephew to Lord Ushan. Eagerly paternal, Lord Charn faced Escala and Tarquil off against one another. Tarquil of Sable, I present Bright Flower Maid, Princess Escala. The man gave a vast, expansive smile. Your bride to be. Six. It was amazing just how long polished wood could burn. One entire corner of the palace had gone up in flames from Escala's fireball. Walking over the deserted lawns, Joss came over to the edges of the blaze. He pulled a choice coal out of the ruins of the palace and popped it into the hellhound's mouth. Cinders mumbled happily, making contented little noises. 
Polk sat beaming happily into the empty air. Joss sighed, sat down facing him, and carefully removed his protective ring. He slipped the ring onto Polk's finger, then slapped the man hard across the face. Polk's eyes rekindled with wits. He turned a hurt expression on the Justicar. Hey, son, that hurt. Good. Just relieved the teamster of his ring and put it back on his own hand. You were under a charm spell. Who, oh, me, son? Never. I was lulling, making a false impression, quieting their suspicions. Polk swelled like a turkey in heat. I've been freeing you for action. What are the fairies' plans? Do they have a quest for us? No. Just pulled his sword half from its sheath and inspected the weapon's edge. Sharp enough to shave hairs and flawlessly polished. They're trying to take Escala. Polk stared in shock. Will she go? I don't know. The thought of there being no Escala seemed like a chunk torn out of Juss's heart. Cinders fell quiet. Polk seemed to shrink. All three looked over the far end of the gardens where a distant summer house lay beneath a giant cherry tree. Just looked away, slamming his sword back into its sheath. Aware that hundreds of fairies spied on him from afar, he pulled cinders into his lap and silently brushed the hellhound's fur. In the summer house, Escala stood facing her mother. The older woman kept her hands folded in her lap, her slanted eyes cold and serene. The woman had the same thin face and long, straight golden hair as her daughter, but there the resemblance ended. Escala was a creature of pure passion, and she paced like a leopard in a cage. What the hell were you thinking? That I'd be a good daughter if you asked? That I never meant to run away? Escala whirled in a rage. What? Are you totally stupid? Escala's father and sister stood by the windows. Tiel looked over at the burning north wing of the palace and smiled. The prodigal returns. You can shut up for a start. You spend about as much time at home as I do. Escala flung a bitter jab at her father. If she wants to play at being the good girl, then have that sable idiot marry her. It must be the heir. Lord Charn paced, no longer the happy father as he glared at his willful child. To seal our return, we must marry our heir into the Seely Court. I'm not doing it. Escala flexed her fingers as though wanting to choke something. I can't believe you thought you could round me up like a wild cat and just marry me off. Escala's mother looked down her nose at the angry girl. If necessary, a spell might calm you. Just try it. Lord Charn chewed his mustache. Escala had moved to a far window, where she stared angrily out at her mortal friends. The fairy lord paced toward her, raising a spell to keep away curious ears and eyes. Daughter, this is the marriage of dreams. Clan Sable is at the pinnacle of the Seely Court. Well, those are not my dreams. The girl turned, and tears stood out in sharp green eyes that seemed so suddenly vulnerable. Not my dreams. Tired and trapped, Escala ran fingers over her little skull. It's been five years. For Arithnal's sake, how did you find me? You happened to fall in range of our scrying spells just when your mother needed you. The fairy lord twiddled his fingers. It's a big world. If you wanted to stay lost, you should have kept your distance and kept your shields up. I have other uses for my spells. I do stuff these days. Important stuff. Stuff that matters. Escala rubbed her eyes. Five years, Dad. Surely that was a clue that I'd gone for good. A mayfly flicker. Lord Charn waved a hand at the gardens. A scholar, the council is almost at war over this. Clan Half Moon has convinced the Queen to reprieve us. Clan Sable is furious. When Nightshade left the court, it was Sable that seized power. 
By welding Sable to Nightshade, we prevent a rift in the court. It is the only way to return and bring peace. Why do they want us, stand? Why now? Because they need what we can do. Lord Charn paced the room beside his daughter. We are the only clan with experience on the primal plane. We have spied and studied, intermingled and coexisted with the powers peculiar to this layer of the universe. It sounds thin. With the slow glass necklace clenched like brass knuckles in her hand, Escala turned away. Who's this Tarquil, anyway? A damned duelist? He's a sorcerer and a swordsman. A murderer! Escala tugged her clothing tight about her little frame. I won't do it! Escala's father put a denser shield between himself and his wife, then leaned quickly closer to his child. Escala, your mother knows how much you value those mortal friends of yours. You refuse to do this and she will kill them. The little fairy turned pale. She swung about to face the window. Behind her, Escala's father hissed quietly in her ear. Escala, do not underestimate your mother's ambitions for power. The court means everything to her. Nothing else matters. If you want your friends to leave here alive, do exactly what she says. She will watch you, Escala. Every word you say, every person you meet will be spied on. Your mother wants the Seely Court in her hands. Escala's father took the chance to kiss his daughter hurriedly on the ear, fearing his wife's ability to break his spell. It will be all right. You'll get used to it. I'm doing what's best for you. The moment passed. As Lord Charn's spells faded, Escala found herself staring blankly at a window pane. Outside in the gardens, music and laughter sounded as alien and distant as the surging of a sea. Numb, Escala flexed her hands, her mind blank of anything except her friends. Escala's mother waited. The girl bowed her head and looked blankly at the floor. I will marry Tarquil. Joss and Polk rose from the grass where they had sat waiting for a long and silent hour. Finally, they saw two small figures approaching them from the garden path. Dressed in sheer white lace, Tiel drifted coyly above the ground. Beside her, a little figure in mother-of-pearl silk flew in quiet misery. Escala landed before Juss and Polk. She wore her shimmering gray dress demurely. Her blonde hair had been pulled back, and her leathers were bundled in one hand. The girl dropped her clothes at Juss's feet and stared palely at the grass. Just a car. Lady Brightflower. Juss's voice was hoarse and quiet. He looked down at the delicate little fairy before him and felt infinitely sad. Escala curtsied to him slowly, unable to meet his eye. Just de car, there is a time in all lives when, when a change must come. The girl's voice caught in her throat. For the good of those we love, we have to to accept what has to be. Yes, my lady. Escala's head bowed. A tear fell to speckle the back of one daintily gloved hand. We... We have spoken of philosophy, you and I. Remember what we once said about what we owe to future generations? Can you picture it clearly in your mind? Yes, my lady, the Justicar remembered. You showed me the way that new ideas grow. Then you will know how much I owe to my family and my clan. You know that I now wish to leave my life of wandering and embrace the court. I must leave you and do what is right and proper. Joss bowed his head and slowly closed his hands. Yes, my lady. I... I will be married in three days' time. I do not think we will meet again. Escala jerked away and hid her face. Bored by the tedium of it all, 
Tiel clicked her fingers and summoned a serving girl. Just a car. Clan Nightshade wishes to thank and reward you for your services as guard and guide to our daughter. Tiel seemed in a hurry to be elsewhere. A scholar has indicated suitable gifts. The girl allowed her servant to pass out the items one by one. Pork, to you we offer this magic wine bottle. Speak into the bottle's mouth, and it will refill itself one thousand times with whatever liquor you care to name. Looking desolate and appalled, Polk numbly accepted the bottle. Tiel took another gift from the serving girl behind her. For the hellhound we offer this. It is a vial containing all the scents we have found in many worlds. A toy, but you may have some pleasure from it. Escala's sister turned a measured glance at the Justicar. For you, Justicar, we offer these scrolls. We are told spells are something you can utilize. Also, Escala says you have need of diamond dust. The huge man bowed slowly and said, I thank you. Escala asks that you take her old clothes with you when you go. She never wishes to see them again. Escala slowly walked over to stand before the Justicar. Still unable to lift her face, she held out her tiny hand. Goodbye, Justicar. Goodbye, my lady. The Justicar knelt, closed his eyes for a long moment, and quietly kissed her hand. Fairy tears stung salt into his lips. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to serve you. Fairy fingers squeezed Juss's hand. May justice forever be yours. He rose and bowed. A servant held out a hand to show him to a gate that led back to the world of summer rainstorms and morning frost. Escala turned away, unable to watch him go. One hand covered her face, and the other clutched tightly against her heart. Dawn in the Fairylands was an arbitrary affair. If it had been inconveniently pale, bright, or rainy, one or more fairies would have been sure to smooth it over with illusions. The illusions were easily seen through by those who could be bothered, but few bothered. The fairies drew few lines between illusion and reality, preferring to discuss the virtues of real versus unreal for long hours over steaming cups of tea, or possibly cups of not tea. Illusion had a way like that. Sitting in a room decorated for a good little daughter, Escala propped her elbows on her knees and sighed. These were not her old rooms. Those had been turned into guest apartments long ago, and Tarquil now snored in Escala's old bed. Mother had created a new room for her errant daughter, one more suitably fashioned to her image of the perfect child. The decor was mostly fuchsia pink. Escala felt her entire intestinal tract rebel. She sat looking into the snow glass gem. A white wedding dress as big as a whale hung from one wall, a dress covered with seed pearls and beautiful enough to stop any normal woman's heart. There were paintings on the wall real paintings. There were color-shifting rugs upon the floor, unreal. The view from the windows showed any one of a dozen illusory scenes of imagined grandeur. It all had the grainy, almost greasy quality that Escala had come to associate with all her childhood memories. All her memories before she escaped into the real world. Wearing a dress simply felt weird, but Escala bore it. She sat staring at the fantasies conjured by the windows until a knock at the door brought a presence sweeping into her room. With a flurry of servants and a flutter of gorgeous wings, Cavalier Tarquil stood at the entrance of Escala's apartment and sank into a rather oily bow. Bright flower maid, how much more refreshing than the dawn is your brilliant smile. Escala rose, flipped out her wings, and made a curtsy carefully measured to keep the suitor at bay. Even so, she felt his eyes travel down her cleavage as she bowed. Escala hissed, caught herself, and pulled part of her face into a smile. Her mother had spies all around, 
a scrying spell would be on her, and there would be an invisible creature lurking in every room. In a society of shapeshifters, any object of the right size and mass was instantly suspect. Escala had already kicked most of the furniture and felt tremors of pain in reply. They were watching her for spells, for any attempt to escape. They would be reporting Escala's right behavior to a mother who was as deadly as a Draco lich. Escala kept her face stiff and her thoughts to herself as she turned to invite the cavalier onto her balcony. Cavalier? The man had a bodyguard, a scarred duelist from his own clan that clandestinely cast a detection spell. Leading the way to the balcony, Escala caught the motion from the corner of her eye. Oh, I can assure you we are being watched. There's no point in wasting a spell. Ah, dear maid, it is not whether there is a spell, but who has thrown the spell? Tarquil's voice was polished and as silky as his silver sword. Sad to say, a man can sometimes acquire enemies. Cavalier Tarquil wore twelve kill ribbons on his sleeves, mementos of duels gone by. Escala gave a sarcastic lift of her eye and said, I can't imagine why. You disapprove of dueling, dear. Tarkle snapped his fingers. A servant ran forward to supply him with wine. It is a righteous sport. Sport? Of course. The cavalier gave a mocking smile to Escala. Shall the pot call the kettle black, my dear? You have an impressive kill record of your own. Monsters, creatures, brigands. It sounds like quite the little crusade. Escala bit back a savage reply, half turned away, then flew over the balcony railing to land in the garden. Today her father's gardens were a fantasy of roses. Even the grass seemed to be fashioned out of tiny little flowers, all illusory, all slightly false to an eye that loved the glorious imperfections of the real world. Escala walked onward for a way, then stood still as she felt eyes running over her from behind. She turned and glared at the cavalier. Quit looking at my butt! Your pardon, maid, but it is a most noteworthy rear. The cavalier toyed with his sword. When my father informed me of this match, I never once thought that it might prove to be so... beneficial. Escala flicked her skirts out to hide the benefits in question. The benefits aren't yours yet, Bob. No. A shame. The cavalier took a swift, searching look across the open garden. Shall we move into the shade? You mean into cover? Escala looked at the man in sudden intuition. Who's trying to bump you off? Perish the thought. A mere habitual precaution. Nothing more. She took him into a rose bower, a bower carefully searched by Tarquil's bodyguard before he entered. Standing in privacy with Escala, the man visibly relaxed. He leaned against a towering rose trunk and looked Escala appreciatively up and down. A flower in the wilderness. Yeah, that's me. Bloom, bloom, bloom. Escala lifted up the slow glass necklace that hung about her throat. This is yours? Of course. Slow glass is rare. Slow glass is beautiful. Almost as rare and beautiful as you. Oh, your clan must want me something awful. Where the hell did you find the slow glass? This stuff is rarer than hen's teeth. Tarkle twittered his fingers and replied, Your sister found it for me. Your family was keen to help me pursue my suit. I'll bet. Escala sniffed and turned away. A moment later she felt a very unwelcome presence behind her. Tarkle set his hands upon Escala's bare shoulders and leaned his face into the curtain of her hair. I am in your own old rooms. The mirror, the bed... Places where you must have dreamed so many restless, adolescent dreams. The man nuzzled at Escala's ear. Dreams can be so much tastier when we snatch them secretly.
Perhaps you want to sample a little piece of the cake before eating it becomes simply a duty to be done. Tarquil leaned much, much closer. Your old mirror might show you something you might like. He slid his hand onto her breast. In one blindingly fast movement, Escala whirled, balled her fist, and struck him in the face, the force enough to send him staggering. Touch me again, and I'll kill you. With a look of private amusement on his face, Tarquil touched at his cheek. You had best get used to it, my dear. The fairy hissed as he probed the bruise on his cheek. Yes, you are exactly as we thought. How gratifying. In a whirl of his blue cloak, Tarquil turned and left the bower. Escala watched him go, flexing her hands and trying to hide the fury in her eyes. No one touches the fairy! A slither in the shadows behind Escala told her that Mother's invisible spy was still at hand. Without looking at it, Escala angrily picked up her skirts and passed it by. Go tell Mother. No free samples until the deal is signed and sealed. Beneath a flame tree in the gardens, Lord Fane quietly approached Lord Ushan. Ushan of Clan Sable stood stroking his chin his eye on the distant rose bower that held his nephew and the bride-to-be. As Tarkal walked silkily forth, dusting at his clothes with a smile on his face, Lord Fane came to stand at Ushan's side. You seem agitated, colleague. New alliances always bring birthing pains. Ushan's flame robes made colors dance within his quiet eyes. Still... Romance makes interesting viewing. Quite so. Fane smoothed his goatee, his eyes on Escala as the girl walked disdainfully through an illusory bridge and stream. An interesting creature. She's a savage. Ushan glared at Escala as though she were an unwanted scientific specimen. She wallows in the real like a beast in mud. Fane made an exasperated sound. He turned on Ushan with his antennae held low and said, Ushan, the drow are moving. There is a dark sealy, my friend, a reflection of all that we are. The old court of the Queen of Wind and Woe has been approached by the Dark Elves, and with the Dark Elves comes the demon Lolth, the Spider Queen. Fane's voice hissed low in Ushan's ear. We have enemies gathering, Ushan. We need allies on the material plane if we are to protect our flanks. Lord Ushan clicked his fingers. Two of his serving girls brought a sedan chair to his side. The Queen of Wind and Woe was once Loth's mistress. If we handled the Dark Queen then we can handle her pet spider well enough. We did not handle the Dark Queen. It was Nightshade. Only they have the secret. Then if we give Nightshade what they want, we can trade. You have made your point, Fane. The sedan chair turned away. The wedding will proceed. Prepare your list of which court positions you want Clan Sable to abandon to the barbarians and present it to me tonight. Ushan's servants bore him off, leaving Fane standing upon the flowery grass. With an irritated sweep, Fane banished the illusion. He now stood upon honest moss, pacing up and down as he furrowed his brows. Two days until the wedding, Fane walked and watched the nightshade palace, his brows permanently creased into a scowl. 7. In the abandoned village amidst the giant's bones, the morning seemed miserably quiet. Outside in the frost, the Justicar practiced with his sword. The huge black blade made fast slices, thrusts, and parries. Stripped to the waist, Juss rehearsed his savage combat style, 
matching blade work with kicks, punches, head butts, and elbow strikes. His breath steamed as he worked, coming in harsh puffs as he repeated his movements for the eleventh time. Sitting on a pile of stones beside him, cinders hung limp and desolate, sniffing softly at a tiny little fairy vial. Inside the tavern stables, Polk and Enid leaned on a windowsill, the human dwarfed by the freckled sphinx. Both looked equally miserable. Both sighed listlessly and stared blankly into the morning air. Polk sighed yet again. His usual bluster was faded and gone. I left my bacon to cool this morning. No one stole the crunchy end bits while I was gone. Enid's tufted tail hung limp as an old wet rope. There was a dirty ditty folded up in one of these old books. But there's no one to explain it to me. Both companions sighed unhappily, feeling as though a vast weight were crushing their souls. They could hardly bear to look as the Justicar fought shadows in the tavern yard. His hard work seemed sad and futile. He was using action as a substitute for grief. Enid and Polk both nodded wisely, then turned away from the window with a sigh. On the tavern table lay a little bundle of goods, a tiny leather dress, gloves and leggings, plus a bundle of papers. Rather than magic scrolls, Escala's gift to Juss had simply been her own spell books, and wrapped within them had been her battle wand. Polk reached for Enid's curry comb to brush her pelt, but instead fell into apathy as he saw the sad pile of papers on the table. I guess she's really gone for good. Out in the courtyard, Joss could be heard sluicing himself down with water. He stomped into the tavern, dripping wet, breathless, dark and brooding. He dropped his sword on the table and proceeded to dry himself vigorously with a villainous piece of old sacking. The Justicar's heavy body showed a pale network of scars. Magic healing left few traces, although re-knitted wounds looked less weather-beaten than the rest of Juss's skin. He took the small silver mirror that always hung about his neck and propped it on a windowsill. Taking a razor from his pouch, Juss warmed it briskly in the tea kettle, then squatted down to peer into the mirror as he shaved his head. The harsh scrape, scrape, scrape of the razor set Enid's nerves on edge. The big sphinx arose and began pacing back and forth, swishing with her tail. She sighed in agitation. Juss shot the sphinx a look, turned back to his shaving, and finally knocked his razor clean against the windowsill. Perfectly calm, Juss drew in his breath, looked out the window, and then drew his brows into a frown. Smoke smudged the skyline. Juss shrugged on his tunic, keeping his eyes on the skyline. He found his armor and tugged the black dragon scale cuirass into place. He tied his sword belt with one hand and swept cinders about his back with the other. The distant smoke had a broad base, deep black and unmoving. It was a village burning, not a forest fire. Joss had seen enough towns destroyed in his time to know the signs. The big man checked the edge of his sword and then flung open the door. I have to look at something. Stay here and get ready to move. I'll be back by midday. The Justicar slammed the door behind him as he left. He took a deep breath of forest air and looked about the abandoned village. Only the birds and squirrels were stirring. This was how it used to be. Alone except for cinders. Alone in the silence. Joss closed his eyes for a moment and tried to savor it. The cool, the quiet, the isolation. He held it in his mind but the old perfection of it had gone. The ranger turned and strode down the trail toward Sour Patch, moving at a grim and silent speed. Still a ways from the village, he sank into the woods, feeling the breath and movement of every tree. Autumn had left the trees stark. Leaves lay in deep drifts, wet and heavy, muffling every footfall in the gloom. Joss moved fast. In the damp, sound carried badly, 
and few ears were sharp enough to hear him coming. He crossed three miles in brisk time, keeping his eyes on glimpses of the smoke cloud that smudged the sky. A scent struck him and he dropped. The wind had changed, and with it came a foul, bestial reek. The stink of it hit like a hammer, and just lay instantly invisible among the leaves. Nothing moved in the forest. There were no footfalls, no bending twigs. Even so, the stink seemed to come from an animal, or a vast swarm of animals. It smelled like a thousand putrid menageries, like rotting flesh and rotten fish and unwashed bodies festering with slime. Cinders? No moves. The dog winced. Smells bad. If it moved a hellhound nearly to tears, then the reek was bad indeed. Rising into a half-crouch, Joss sped forward from cover to cover and followed the source of the breeze. A towering hill of manure steamed in the chill. It marked the edge of Sour Patch, a town that now stood beneath a haze of smoke made from burning homes. Juss slithered on his belly through a patch of leaves, raised his head, and looked at the ruined village in silence. The tumble-down refugee cottages were all gone. Here and there flames leaped high, but most had already slumped into a sullen smolder. The fires had burned for at least two hours, time enough to sink into ashes. Every roof had gone. Most of the shacks were burned, though damp and rain had kept the fires miserably small. Doors in the crowded shanty town lay smashed where something had battered its way into every hiding place. Nearby, a body lay face down in the mold with a feathered javelin jutting from its back. Just took careful stock of the silent village, then slithered forward and inspected the corpse. It was one of the half-orc guards, just rolled the body over, looked at the obsidian javelin head that stood out from the corpse's chest, and then let the body lie. From here he could see other bodies. These had been physically torn apart, their heads and organs splayed in shocking patterns all over the mud. Just moved silently from cover to cover, and squatted down to stare into a dead face. It was an old woman. Beside her lay an old man, the other corpses all seemed to be the aged, the crippled and infirm. Here, a boy on crutches. There, a veteran warrior missing a leg. Someone had called the villagers with an obscene, callous brutality, discarding those that failed to meet their needs. The hundreds of survivors had been taken... Where? There were tracks in the mud. Human and... something else. Just knelt and inspected his find. The non-human tracks were long, clawed, and smeared occasionally by what looked like a heavy tail. Lizards. The bestial stink filled the air. Joss approached a broken door and carefully inspected a smear of oil that smudged the wood. The oil gave off a strong whiff of the stench. It gleamed slightly, showing where a large, oily creature had shouldered open the door. Inside the burned house lay the charred skeletons of babies. The Justicar breathed deep and slow, feeling the old, cold fire spreading into his soul, filling his very essence. Cinders growled, deep and feral. Joss narrowed his eyes and lay a hand upon his sword hilt, looking back across his shoulder as he backed into the street. There were no tracks leading into the village from the woods, just walked slowly around the village, finding nothing but the body of another man who had tried to run. The woods were free of the lizard stink. Frowning, Just returned to the village and stared at it in thought. Prisoners had been herded together in the street, called, then marched toward an ancient apple orchard. Just followed the river of tracks, perhaps two hundred prisoners with half as many captors, and then the tracks suddenly seemed to stop. The tracks simply shut off as though a line had been drawn across them. Just looked carefully at the tracks, and then stared upward at the crooked apple trees. Something seemed strange about the bend of two trees up above. 
the boughs leaned inward to form a perfect arch, almost as if deliberately tied in place. The arch rested directly above the tracks. Just circled it, passing a hand carefully into the empty space defined by the archway. His hand tingled as if expecting to find a door, but his fingers met no resistance. He touched only empty air. Something flickered in midair. Before Cinders could shout a warning, Juss had already turned, his sword a blurring arc of black steel. A javelin split in two as Juss sliced it from the air. He ran roaring at an apple tree that suddenly tried to blunder to one side. Just jammed his black sword through the bark and heard a scream. Blood jetted as he ripped the steel free, parried a claw, and hacked a savage blow straight down. His sword cleaved into a reptilian skull, and a reeking creature fell writhing on the dirt. Colors shifted. What had once looked like the trunk of an apple tree now lay sprawled over the leaves. It was reptilian, a huge bipedal lizard with a chameleon's skin. Colors faded as the creature died, its thick skull split open. Oil oozed from its hide, filling the air with its foul stench. Joss kept away from the creature's reach as it died and wiped his sword on a handful of wet leaves. Troglodyte. The secret of survival was knowledge. Joss had made it his business to study every creature in, on, or under the flaness. Troglodytes were a carnivorous lizard species, savage, cunning, subterranean dwellers. Hating sunlight, they would scarcely be likely to venture far away from their caves. Caves beneath this sort of soil seemed unlikely. Joss looked at the apple tree arch, knowing it was a fairy gate, and wondered just how far away it led. Intensely stupid, troglodytes would normally have killed and eaten their prey. Were they intelligent enough to herd their meat on the hoof? Perhaps, but no troglodyte could ever puzzle out a magic gate. Joss cast about the orchard carefully, then began inspecting every tree. A flicker of motion caught his eye on a bough high above. Joss scowled, sheathed his sword, and climbed into the lower boughs. Motion flickered again, and he found it. A single black silk thread had snagged upon the bark. Joss inspected without touching, then brought Cinders' snout close to the treasure. Can you smell it through the stink? Little bit. Cinders snuffled unhappily. His fairy smell. Joss sat in the tree for a long moment of silent thought. He carefully retrieved the fallen thread and stored it in a folded paper inside his pouch. It seemed he had work to do. Half an hour saw him home again. He passed a giant's crumbling bones and then walked into weed-strewn streets. Outside the old tavern, Polk's cart stood hitched to his rather nervous mule. Enid stood amongst her saddlebags and scrolls, awkwardly trying to fit them across her own back. Joss appeared silently, hitched the sphinx's bags into place, and tied the straps. She beat her huge, heavy wings to test the load, and then looked back at him in alarm. Heavens, what's that smell? Troglodyte. Just went to a rain barrel and took a handful of ash to scrub his sword and his hands. Polk, we're leaving. Move it or we'll be late. Bustling out of the tavern and looking as though he had been seeking the solace of his magic fairy bottle, Polk winced as he walked into the light. What is it, son? What's happening? Polk's bluster was weighed down by misery. We ain't late. There's nowhere we have to be. Nothing we have to do. We have to get to the ruined castle. Just tightened his sword belt, settled cinders properly in place, and then fastened a hand into Polk's tunic and lifted the small man onto the driving seat of the cart. Why the castle? The day's wasting. The Justicar began leading the way down the road. He could feel his two companions staring at his back. We have to get back to where I killed the Hydra. If we're not there by midnight, we'll be late. Enid hurried along, drawing anxiously level with the Justicar. 
Late? Whatever for? To meet a scholar. Joss felt a nasty inward glow of satisfaction at a secret well kept. When she comes, she'll be coming fast. Have you got her gear? Polk and Enid both sat in place. The cart stopped. The two travelers stared at Joss as he looked at them with an artfully raised brow. Polk blinked like a stunned owl. But, but she said she was staying with the fairies. It was all a pack of lies. It's what she does, Polk. The scholar says she owes it to future generations. The big man pulled a coal from his pouch and popped it into Cinders' mouth. He breathed deeply, filled with new energy. Suddenly it seemed to be a brighter day. She'll be escaping in a couple of hours. Come on. Looks like we'll be on the run from the whole Sealy Court. Cinders grinned like a mad piranha and energetically thumped his tail against Juss's backside. Fairy coming back. Fairy coming back. The Justicar marched down the road with a new energy in his step. Polk and Enid exchanged one brief glance of joy and then hastened after him. Son! Hey, son! Both father's wishes! Ain't you breaking a law or something? Law. The Justicar walked onward, his face wreathed in a smile. Polk. Forced marriages are unjust. The big man hitched his sword. Don't you remember? No one touches the fairy. Polk suddenly grinned, flicked out his reins, and drove happily off along the road. Hurry up, son, and quit your dawdling, or we'll be late. Eight. The morning dawned bright. It always did. Illusion spells saw to it, and if winter shadows seemed at odds with a summer sun, then a flick of the imagination whisked all one's troubles away. Escala rose from her bed and felt the air flicker with spy spells as her mother's agents kept a tight watch on their prey. The girl washed and dressed nicely in gray silk. The slow glass necklace had been thoughtfully placed to record her every movement in her sleep. Escala looked levelly at the thing, then dropped it over her neck before turning to the business of the day. She spent her first hour of the morning painting upon a papyrus, a painting rich with colors, if a little scant on skill. She propped it up to dry, paced agitatedly about the room, and then fluttered into the morning sun. Mother awaited her on the lawns. They looked at one another, one lean and sculpted, the other lithe and sharp. Escala's mother finally turned and signaled for her daughter to walk with her. You have been very curt with your betrothed. I expect you to treat him with more cordiality. He wanted to sip something, but it wasn't cordial. Escala proudly held up her hands as she stepped over the lawn. Are you pimping me now, mother? The woman glared coldly at her daughter. This clan has plans that reach far beyond mere woods and fields and streams. Tiel realizes it, but the gods have cursed us with having to seal our deal through you. Thank you, mother. I love you, too. Lord Ushan is still fighting the bargain. He wants none of his power lost to Clan Nightshade. Escala's mother could have been talking to the wind. We need the nephew's interest. Go to him tonight. I will not. You will. Your father may have forgotten the way you left us, but I have not. Escala's mother turned a bitter glance upon the girl. If this alliance fails, if you deny me the court, then I shall seal you to keep the queen of wind and woe permanent company. I'm sure you know the route. Escala's mother had given her birth, but merely to bind Clan Nightshade's lord to her in marriage. There was no love lost between mother and daughter. In Escala's view, detonating her mother might be the best favor that she could ever do for her father. 
The walk led about the house to the stables. A peculiar reek escaped the attention of fairy spellcasters, making Escala frown. With her mind fixed upon her plans, Escala's mother scarcely seemed to care. Go to your old rooms tonight, her mother said. But mind you, don't give him the whole cake. Enough of a nibble to prevent him wriggling out of the marriage tomorrow. Men are always fools enough to be caught by the glands. Escala gave a scornful sniff at her mother. As I'm certain father could tell me. At the stables, Tarkle stood admiring a prime young fairy dragon. Tarkle sketched a bow toward Escala, watched by her mother. Escala gave the man an interested appraisal and a smile. Mother approved. She retired from the field, leaving Escala to turn away and give a secret little smile. By evening, Escala's preparations had been made. Her mother had kept her well away from any spell books. Any attempt at magic would bring the spies running, and all the main gateways to the Flaness were set with alarms. But to a creature who had grown up here, who had played here and languished through a frustrated adolescence right here in the palace, there were countless other secret doors. As night fell, Escala walked to a particular patch of orchids beside a pond filled with swans. She waved the illusions away and found a little patch of dandelions closing their petals to the slowly sinking sun. She plucked a flower and tucked it carefully into her cleavage. Escala had dressed with care. She wore her slow glass necklace to please her mother's spies and wore a dress of white silk that fit her like a second skin. She posed, feeling a shift in the air that told her that her mother's invisible spy was pleased. With a last moment's thought, she picked up the little painting she had made that morning and tucked it underneath her arm. The palace lay quiet, deliberately quiet. Mother had cleared the way, using her own spells to shield Escala's tryst from view. Escala fluttered quietly onto her old balcony. Her sister's room next door still showed a little gleam of light. Escala sneered, then quietly sensed the way ahead for any spells. From the gardens, Tarkle's bodyguard saw her. The fairy gave an oily smirk and deliberately turned his back, hiding his view of the room and balcony. Escala seethed, then dropped lightly down to make her way into her own loved and hated haunts. The room had been repainted, but remained the same otherwise. A great arched mirror along one wall reflected the rock garden and a sumptuous bed. Lying face down, Tarkwell seemed to be sleeping rather easily for a man about to be married, although the reek of alcohol in the room apparently told why. If anyone expected much activity from Tarkwell tonight, they had sadly miscalculated. Escala looked at the figure sprawled unmoving on her old bed and gave a laugh of contempt. She hung her painting above the balcony door, looked at it, frowned, set it straight, then turned back to the bed. It was time to get to business. Escala hung her slow glass necklace from a door handle where it could overlook the bed. Mother must have her evidence. Moving with a deliberate, slow sensuality, Escala stripped away her outer clothes. She started with her gloves, doing a little dance for the inevitable audience. Next came her slippers, and then the dress. Finally, she stood in stockings and sheer underwear. She whipped the gauzy curtains closed over the balcony and walked sensuously over to the bed. Escala looked slyly back across her shoulder. The gauze curtains twitched and parted as something invisible stole softly into the room behind her. Boom! Enid's stun scroll, now framed and reversed with its back turned into a bad watercolor landscape, blasted magic downward as the spy crossed under it. A body jerked and thudded to the ground. Gotcha! Escala laughed, jammed her gloves into the invisible spy's mouth, tied him up with stockings, and shoved him beneath a pile of the Tarquil's laundry in the far corner of the room. Tarquil was still asleep, and Escala had thirty seconds to spare. 
What girl could resist? Escala took position in the eye of the slow glass necklace and gave a little wave. Whispering to the necklace, she slapped herself upon the rear. Hey, Tarquil, here we go. Look and weep into your damned liquor. Escala made a face into the slow glass gem, gave a traditional sign with her finger, then threw her dandelion flower at her old mirror. The mirror flashed, shimmered, and a new gate opened into another world. Escala took a running dive at the mirror and disappeared, the gate closing an instant after she plunged through. This was the route she had used for countless secret trips to the Flaness in her teenage years, a route her mother had never been able to pin down. Escala emerged half-clothed in a stream. It was pitch dark and cold as ice. The girl screeched, sending bubbles to the surface, then turned herself into a very long and wriggly eel. A pipe still led down into old irrigation drains. The eel sped along the waterway, stopping only to snatch a copper coin from a pile hidden in a sunken flower pot many years ago. The eel whirled, sped past a row of sunken archways, and reached a deep dark pool inhabited by a giant pike. The pike made a lunge, but Escala the eel sped nimbly away. An archway of fallen rock stood out in the filtered underwater light. The eel used its copper coin as a pass. The coin flashed and disappeared, the gateway opened, and the eel sped through, to find itself falling freely through a forest sky. The gate exited from the arches of an ancient aqueduct. Escala's body flashed as she shifted shape. An instant later, a rather large and fluffy owl flapped its way into the cold night air. To the south lay the seashore with its towns and boats and taverns, the world Escala had spied upon as a little girl. To the north, there lay nothing by the empty forest. With a smirk, the owl sped northward, scanning downward for a landmark it might recognize. There, a road with big statue heads. Escala swooped downward, lofted over a village scattered with giant's bones, and saw a distant castle with a teetering tower. Light glimmered beneath her as she turned a victory roll above the castle courtyard. She changed into her normal form and streamed down to be caught in a pair of waiting arms. Ta-da! Cradled in Jus's grasp, Escala threw her arms out in triumph. She's back, and she's here to stay. Escala felt herself crushed in a bear hug. Joss held her in silence with his face pressed into her hair. Escala felt her ribs creak, but clung to him with glad ferocity. Above her, Cinders's white teeth gleamed and his red eyes shone. Hi. Hey, Pooch, I'm back. Escala managed to make herself some breathing room in Joss's grasp. I'm back. Joss and Escala stood clasped together for a long moment. Finally, Escala drew a breath and looked into the night. Polk had warmed a blanket for her at the fire. The teamster swept it around her, grinning like a maniac, and puffed with pride, clearly giving himself credit for having arranged the entire escape. Escala opened her mouth to say hello, and instead found Polk's bottle jammed between her lips. Drink, girl. It'll warm you. Good for the blood. The adventuring blood. Polk pulled the bottle free as Escala turned green and gasped for breath. I'm fisping I double snake's head whiskey. That pixie bottle of yours is a gem. The fairy coughed as though trying to wrench her esophagus out of her throat. With tears in her eyes, she gave a thumbs up to Polk and Enid. Purring like a cage of satiated lions, Enid paced about in the background, putting out fires and cleaning up the camp. Joss handed Escala her cherished leather clothes, her battle wand, and her book of spells. How long have we got? he asked. Maybe an hour, until morning, tops. The girl dressed swiftly and efficiently, keeping one eye on the sky. There'll be fairy dragons, elf hounds, and fairies. Mother will probably summon eagles and stuff. What do we do? We head for a bolt hole and sit tight for a week. 
the group walked out of the castle and followed Escala toward the old moat. The girl hummed happily, hugging her ice wand tight against her heart. Behind her, Enid politely fluffed her wings. We're terribly glad to have you back. How did the wedding preparations go? Oh, pretty good. Shame to miss it. They made a cake and everything. Escala turned and eagerly waved her hands. You should have seen the dress. Pure white and bigger than a land shark. Walking at Escala's side, Just flicked her a glance bright with secret delight. A white wedding dress? Hovering indignantly, the girl bridled. Hey, I'm entitled. Oh? Everyone turned to stare in amusement at Escala, who instantly panicked as she felt her reputation fall to pieces. N -n not to say that I'm not experienced. Juss's teeth gleamed. Yeah, how about with another person? Keep it up, Baldy. The fairy had turned a shade of scarlet. Right now, I'm thinking you'd look pretty good as a size 11 frog. Flying haughtily on her way, the fairy swept down to the castle moat, trying to ignore the amused looks from behind her. She tugged her clothing into place, sniffed importantly, and hovered beside the pond. If you people are quite finished, shall I show you how a true master's escape is done? Cinders looked at her and sniggered happily. Funny. Cinders, I don't think a hearthrug with teeth has any call to be mocking my love life. Escala shook out her wings. Right. Now, can we please get going? Joss looked up at her and stroked his chin. The fairies can fly, have magic fairy hounds, and use scrying spells. What's the best way to evade them? Don't know. Escala gave a happy shrug. We're lucky. They'll miss us somehow. Don't worry about it. The girl snapped her fingers. Trust me, I'm a fairy. Polk, Enid, Joss, and Cinders all simply looked at her. The Justicar sucked on a tooth and said, Trust to luck? That's your whole escape plan. Look, I just escaped from the whole Seely Court. I can't be expected to handle everything. The fairy waved her hands in indignation. Some of the details I have to leave to you. The Justicar looked at the forest and gave a tired sigh. Are all your escapes like this? From a tree overhead, there came a sudden weary sigh. Most of them. Joss whirled, his hand on his sword. Escala's father sat on a tree bough, looking old, tired, and glum. Everyone stared up at the fairy lord. An uncomfortable silence reigned for long moments. Putting on her best innocent grin, Escala gave him a timid little tinkle of a wave. Hello, Dad. Ah. Uh... Escala gave a hopeful little flip of her antennae. Why all the excitement in the forest? My dear, I believe they have come to ask you why you murdered Tarquil. Lord Charn looked at his daughter and gave a heavy sigh. This time you've really managed to outdo yourself. Nine. When you wanted a fire in a hurry, Cinders was always ready to oblige. Sitting happily in the cellar of the ruined castle, the hellhound breathed little licks of flame from his nostrils to warm just his battered old camp kettle. The brew steamed, and just loomed above the kettle to pour himself another serving before seeing to his guests. The Justicar patted Cinders on the head as he passed, making the hellhound thump his long tail against the floor. Thanks, Cinders. Welcome. Above the castle, an illusory light blinked and flared. It matched the movements of real fairies searching for the fugitive Escala. For a while, at least, the magic would keep the fairy hunt at bay. Deeply annoyed by events, Escala sat high up near the ceiling on a jutting stone, her knees beneath her chin and a look of total annoyance on her face. 
She was in a magnificent sulk, seething and muttering as she shot clandestine looks at her father. Answering the implied question, Lord Charn snorted as he settled by the fire. It's my realm, girl. I picked it because of all the damned gates I found here. Frowning in annoyance, the fairy lord sipped tea from an old tin mug. I just thought of what route I'd take if I was trying to avoid the wife. The pikefish told me the rest. Finding a stone big enough for him, the Justicar sat down. Pike? What pike? Carnivorous fish. Big one. Wife can't stand them. Lord Charn made a face as he tasted just his abominable tea. I put no end of things near gates to stop the wife going through. The fairy lord gave a snort. I have to have somewhere quiet to go. You stay in the woods here? Rather than the palace? When I can, let's me get a bit of peace. Carefully setting his tea aside before it could poison him, Lord Charn fluttered his wings. Now there'll be no damned peace till all this nonsense is done. Perched upon her stone, Escala shot a petulant look at her father. Dad, I did not kill that stupid cavalier. Don't be dense, girl. Lit by the hellhound's nostril flames, Lord Charn's face took on sharp, wicked shadows. If I thought you'd killed him, I wouldn't be sitting here with you drinking tea. Tired and annoyed, Lord Charn made the mistake of sipping the tea again. Wincing, he put the cup far away and turned to carefully regard the Justicar. The fairy lord's eyes sparked as he measured the big warrior across the fire. You went to White Plume Mountain? You were the one who did in Coraptus's disciple? Escala, Cinders, Polk, and myself. Yes. The fairy lord sipped tea again, which distinctly tasted of the onion soup that had been made last night in the same pot. Is my daughter any good? Just made a gruff noise, shifted his dire shadow in the gloom, and said, She's damned good. One of the best I've seen. Above them, Escala beamed. Well, she'll need to be. Charn gave another sigh, then kicked irritably at a pebble. She doesn't belong with us. The fairy lord spoke a spell, opened up his hands, and provided bottles of decent wine. Here, it's not fairy wine, and certainly not the sixty-three. That particular vintage seemed to have scarred some lives forever. Sit, drink, and let me tell you a tale or three. Polk immediately shot forward, ignored a glass, and took a bottle for himself. Enid the Sphinx sat down to clumsily nurse a glass between big furry paws, sneezing as the bubbles tickled at her nose. Joss waved the wine away and contented himself with his awful tea. Lord Charn swirled his wine inside a tiny thimble glass and began. We need to come out into the world. My daughter is the test. Fairies could be an instrument for good or bad. I suspect we might verge toward the bad. We've spent too long looking after our intrigues. Lord Charn heaved a sigh, then leaned toward the Justicar. Intrigues have a way of excusing evil. Tarquil's dead and in my own house. Clamoring over Enid's head to fetch a glass of wine, Escala shot another angry look at her father. I told you, I didn't kill the booger. But there's evidence enough to slam you right into the hands of the fairy council. Just leaned forward, listening. Polk leaned forward, thieving more wine. Sitting beside the Justicar, Lord Charn laid out the situation for his daughter's companions. Lord Ushan's valets came to Tarkwell's room to summon him. Tarkwell was discovered dead lying on the bed. There was an empty cup. Looks like the man was poisoned. When the palace was searched, it was discovered that his scholar had gone. 
My wife's maids knew that a scholar had arranged a secret tryst with Tarquil in his room. Juss stroked at the harsh stubble of his chin. Beside him, Cinders listened with pointed ears, his red eyes gleaming. No spies in Tarquil's room saw anything? His own alarm spells had been disabled. However, a scholar had apparently spent at least two days making sure that she would be unobserved. Scrying shields in place, careful blanking of spying spells. Her mother had a spy following her. A scholar knocked him out when he tried to follow her into Tarquil's room. The fairy lord leaned closer. What's more, Tarquil's bodyguard saw a scholar sneaking into the room just before the body was discovered. He remembers that she seemed stealthy. Escala remembered the bodyguard and gave a vicious curse. He knew why I was supposed to be there. Escala leaped to the ground and paced in anger. That bastard! I'll... In good time. Her father turned to the girl. Did you see anything? Any evidence you can remember? Escala planted her hands against her heart and squawked in indignation. I didn't do it! That's not going to be much of a defense. Father glared at daughter. You had motive, you had opportunity, you blanked out scrying spells and knocked out the spy who followed you, then you fled off into the wilderness to escape. Escala sank into nervous anxiety, then suddenly shot up, filled with energy. Ah, the slow glass. I hung the necklace from a door handle overlooking the bed. Escala smacked her fist into her palm. Ha! There you go. It'll show him alive and me leaving. Everything you need to know. Just what we need, Lord Charn shrugged. But no one reported seeing a necklace in the room. Still, we can search for it and see. What about spells? The Justicar's meat and bread came from investigating injustices and crime. Can you speak with the deceased? No ghost is present. It must have already fled. The fairy lord rose to his feet and paced in agitation, his head level with Juss's thigh. Escala sat irritably down by the fire and cursed. Poop. Poop indeed. Lord Charn made a rock float over to serve as a chair for the girl, bringing her to sit between himself and the Justicar. Now listen, your mother is going to use you as a sop to Clan Sable. They want a murderer, and by slinging you to them, she will be able to save her ambitions. Through sacrificing her own daughter, she shows that she is a true member of the court, and she will still have your sister to marry off to the Sable Clan. Charn's antennae slanted. Apparently there was no love lost between himself and his wife. Your sister and mother have great plans. This is almost better for them than having you and Tarquil safely wed. Meanwhile, Clan Sable screams out murder and assassination, calling for our eternal barring from the Seely Court. Just thought about the situation, his face its usual mask of sharp intelligence. You want a scholar's name cleared? Of course I do. She's my girl. My girl. The resemblance between father and daughter in mind and spirit was certainly remarkable. I let her go to the world because it was what's best for her. Ha! A scholar gave a sour sniff. Don't talk rubbish. If you'd known I was skiving off in the first place, you would have stopped it. Mother must have given you hell. The girl gave a sniff and sipped her tea. Probably took you a whole week to realize I was gone. By failing to pay attention, I was obeying unconscious higher motives. Lord Charn clearly shared a heritage of glibness with his daughter. I knew it was right and proper that you take your place within the world. Oh, bosh! Bosh yourself. 
Sean dusted imaginary crumbs from his tunic. Who was it that showed you where the dandelions grew in the first place? Miffed, Escala sat cross-legged on her stone. Fine. So I'm too incompetent even to run away from home by myself, and my own mother is conspiring to have me executed. Anything else? Speaking for the benefit of the ever-patient Justicar, Lord Charn refilled his glass. Lord Fane is with us. He is chief advisor to the Earl King and is in charge of the investigation. He will let us clear a scholar's name if it can be done. If we show a love of justice, that will be better evidence of goodwill to the court than throwing a scapegoat to the dogs. The anxious father glanced at Escala, running his fingers through his hair. Just a car. I know you have experience here. I am at a loss. As you love and value my daughter, please help us clear her name. Just nodded slowly and thoughtfully. Rising from his seat, his vast bulk loomed like a giant above the fairies. Is it possible for me to see the body and the murder site? It can be arranged, but it must be now, before the fairies return to the palace from the first hunt. Lord Charn rose quickly from his seat. There is a gate at an archway high above, but we'll have to run. Escala, Polk, and Enid all rose together. Lord Charn looked at them in alarm. No! Escala, stay hidden. This must be fast. If your mother spies see visitors, she'll follow you and strike. I'll take the Justicar alone. If we're not back here in an hour, then go wait for him in your spider bubble in the pond. Lord Charn kissed his daughter, gripped her shoulders, and then whirred up into the air, his wings sparkling. Behind him the Justicar seated his sword in its belt. Cinders swept about him like a cloak, the hellhound's grin gleaming as the creature was fastened in his rightful place. Following him to the cellar door, Escala anxiously wrung her hands, then came to hover in front of Juss's face. Juss, I didn't do it. He looked into her frightened green eyes for a long moment, then reached out to touch her cheek. I know. He nodded, then turned and walked away. Once he was gone from the room, Escala's night seemed suddenly frightening. The ruins of the keep yielded an arch, and the arch had long been overgrown with ivy. Lord Charn hovered nearby as Juss hauled his powerful frame up the sheer stonework toward the magic gate. There are gates everywhere, of course, Sir Justicar. People just can't see them. This forest is a nexus a place where dozens of them congregate. It's why we settled here in the first place. The fairy lord plucked a sprig of fennel from his purse. There, this should be the one. Hanging from a sheer stone wall thirty feet above the ground, Joss paused while searching for a handhold. Fennel? A key for the gate. Charn put his other herbs away. Each one is triggered by a different herb or token. A copper coin, a dandelion, splash of wine. You can trigger them by accident if you're unlucky enough. That's why mortals think the whole forest is haunted. As Just reached the rough stone precipice below the ancient stone arch, Lord Charn gestured toward it with his herbs. This gate leads to the palace lands, but I don't quite know where. Stay hidden until I can find Lord Fane, and we'll bring you to the murder site. Just nodded. Lord Charn hovered before the door, then tapped the blank space of the archway with his sprig of dried fennel. The fennel flashed and disappeared. Suddenly the archway shimmered. No! With a heave, Just shoved himself upward. He stepped through into a soft gray light and found himself on all fours upon a fragrant forest floor. Illusions were transparent to Cinder's eye. The dog sniffed and then hissed in Juss's mind. Trees is trees, 
Leaves is leaves. Flower bushes is illusion. Joss chose the real concealment of the leaves over the illusory comforts of the bushes. An instant later, he lay in a drift of leaves, perfectly still and quite invisible, with only Cinders' black nose showing above the mulch. When Lord Charn appeared, he looked about in brief confusion, then shrugged and whirred off on his way. Just saw that he was lying amongst the plane trees, the gateways to universes of fire, flame, and antimatter. The fairy lands were no place to wander carelessly. One wrong turn might be your last. Lord Nightshade returned long minutes later with another fairy at his side. Cinders sniffed the scent of them long before they arrived. Escala's father, one other fairy, a male. Joss heaved upward, shedding leaves like a leviathan shedding the ocean floor. Two fairies hovered nearby, impressed as the big man emerged from total invisibility. Joss brushed wet leaves from Cinders's fur and looked levelly at Lord Charn and his guest. The newcome fairy was slender and affected long grey hair and a wisp of a goatee. He sketched a bow as Lord Charn made the introductions. Drostakar, you remember Lord Fane? My Lord Fane, the Drostakar is something of a specialist. The elves of the Celadon trained him. The elegant, calm Lord Fane looked coolly at the Drostakar. What temples does he favor? The Justicar's dark, dire voice seemed to fill the wood. Justice flows from the heart, not from God's. Nodding noncommittally, Lord Fane turned in midair and said, Come then, we have cleared all eyes away for a short time. We will show you what we can. Just strode like a dark giant, the black hellhound skin wreathing him in shadow. You have interviewed everyone who might have been near the room at the time of death? We did what we could. Truth spells are seen as an insult, and at the moment, insults are something we cannot afford. Lord Fane flew pace by pace with the Justicar, detecting a kindred spirit in the mortal's mind. A certain amount of conspiracy has taken place. Maids and servants have contrived to be absent. There is only the bodyguard who identified a scholar. Indeed, she left her dress in the murder room, and he could describe it to us exactly. Escala's mother organized a tryst. And might have reached the Sable clan guards and servants. Fane ushered the way toward a balcony. It is here. I'll tell you nothing. Your own untainted impressions will carry better force. The palace had not been made with human scale in mind. Still, there were enough humanoid servants to require high ceilings and large doors. Just carefully approached the balcony, eyeing a place where he could use a tree to lever himself up and over the fragile-looking balustrade. He then knelt in the leaves below and let the hellhound go to work. Smell anything? Fairies. Cinders thoughtfully sifted scents. Male once walked here, two, three hours ago. There were tracks consistent with a single fairy walking slowly below the balcony, probably the bodyguard. Since fairies could fly, tracking was hardly likely to reveal real clues. Just looked carefully at the eaves and railings, then heaved himself up the tree and onto the balcony. The room had a wide window screened by curtains of silken gauze. The curtains had been thrown open and the room trampled by enthusiastic, clumsy investigators. Even so, there was much to see. The body had been moved, but where it had lain the bed was indented. The pillows and sheets seemed otherwise undisturbed. If Tarkwell had come here to sleep, then he had lain down and found no time to toss and turn. Beside the bed was a table that seemed a little like doll's furniture. Just knelt carefully on the carpet, going onto all fours to examine the half-sized furnishings. A wine bottle stood open beside a pair of glasses. 
One glass stood untouched and full, while the other seemed half empty. Juss sniffed the cup, and Cinders confirmed his suspicions. Bad smells. Wine poisoned. Holding the half-empty glass up to the light showed a faint, oily film down one side. Poison had been trickled into the glass from an outside source. The wine was poured carefully back into the bottle, and just surveyed the results. Nodding, he put the empty glasses aside, then cast carefully back and forth across the room. No necklace hung from any doorknob. Various hands had wrenched open cupboards and curtains looking for would-be assassins. Yet a gleam came from the carpet, and when Just bent down to examine it, he found the tiniest of tiny golden links, a piece of delicate chain from a necklace that had been broken clean through. Cinders breathed assent and shivered his long black tail. Escala's skin. Just so. The Justicar looked carefully at the door that led through the apartments and into the palace. He opened the door and looked into a passageway lined with brilliant animated murals. Searching the empty corridor with a long, hard glance, Just turned away, returned into the room, and caught sight of a single black thread hanging from the door jamb. He trapped it, laid it in a folded paper, and put it in his pouch beside the golden link. Rising, Just carefully dusted off his hands. Where have you put the body? We are about to take it to the chapel. Lord Fane swung open the door to the passageway and looked carefully out into the deserted palace. We have lain him out in the drawing room down here until then. Come quickly. One man, one hellhound skin, and two fairies swept quietly out into the corridor. They moved three rooms down and edged into a room guarded by a fairy warrior. The warrior looked studiously away from the Justicar, ignoring his presence entirely, but nodding to Lord Fane. In the long, cool room beyond lay the body of the Cavalier Tarquil. The corpse seemed pathetically small, like a child sleeping in the grass. They had laid him on his back, with his hands out at an angle from his body. Just knelt beside the corpse and removed its cover sheet, looking at the clothed body in professional, dispassionate chill. Is this how you always lay out a corpse? No, but the body stiffened in death rigor, and we could not cross his hands decently upon his breast. Nodding, the Justicar inspected the body's mouth. The lips were not inflamed, nor the inner mouth burned. Joss opened the cavalier's shirt and pulled up his inner clothes. The blood had pooled on the body's belly side, leaving a purplish color, but it was already on the move again now that the body was laid out. Soon the corpse would be as pale as ash. How long ago did you find him? One hour. Lying on his face? Joss levered the body over on its side and then began methodically to strip it naked. Shocked and reluctant, the two fairy lords half started forward before leaving the man to his work. Joss inspected the corpse's skin inch by minute inch, then looked beneath its nails and through its hair. Finally, the big man sank back onto his heels, looming vast as an ogre as he nodded slowly in thought. Joss let out his breath and spoke. He was poisoned, but not by wine. Lord Charn raised his brows in silence, but Lord Fane chose to speak. Not by the wine? No. Here on his scalp and hidden by his hair is a puncture wound. The fairies leaned in to see. The Justicar parted the black hair of the dead cavalier to show a small hole in the scalp, far broader than a needle puncture. It had oozed a clear fluid, and the hair strands beside it were silvered with a dried mucus or glue. Just let the hellhound's nose nestle close to the puncture hole. Cinders? Cinder smells fish. Yes. The Justicar sat back in cold triumph. Cinders smells fish. The two fairy lords looked at him in silence, and the Justicar enlightened them. See the dried slime? 
It's from a cone shell, a venomous mollusk that uses a puncturing tongue to kill. Instantly lethal. Small, concealable in the palm on anyone gloved and confident enough to use it. Even a fairy. Lord Fane scowled. And where might a cone shell be found in a forest? Nowhere. This is a Kuatoan assassination technique, right down to hiding the wound in the hairline. You have encountered it before? I've read about it. The Justicar wiped his hands. This is my profession. I am the Justicar. Sitting back on his haunches, the Justicar thoughtfully regarded the corpse. Cone shells come from tropical reefs. This has been carried a long, long way with the intention to murder. Juss stroked his chin, black stubble rasping in the quiet room. The wine glasses were a decoy. When the wine was put back in the bottle, it made the bottle totally full. There was not even half a mouthful missing. It reached the stain line inside the bottleneck. Escala's father grinned a predatory grin, apparently extremely pleased to witness the Justicar at his work. Yes, lad. Now what else was in that room? What didn't other eyes see? There is one link from the gold chain that held Escala's slow glass pendant. It was by the windows, probably where Escala tore the necklace off and broke it. The necklace itself is gone. Is it valuable? Perhaps a thousand times the value of a similarly sized diamond. Joss made a soundless whistle. Such a necklace might conceivably buy an entire castle, garrison it, and pay the troops wages for a year. It was time to retire from the room. Joss found a balcony and leaped over it, then let the two fairy lords follow him into the woods. Hidden by the trees, the big man sat and laid out tiny paper packets on his knee. The body has been dead longer than two hours. There was rigor. I'd make it three or four hours dead. Meaning he'd been dead before Escala was seen entering the room. Stroking his goatee, Lord Fane nodded. A hostile mind might argue that the effects of the poison caused the muscles to freeze in spasm. Yes. It's not proof. Joss stroked his chin. But the mouth was red at the back of the tongue. He was orally poisoned, and then stung later by the cone shell. The shell wound hadn't bled, not even a bead. His blood was already cold when the puncture was made. Pacing carefully back and forth, Lord Charn cleared his throat in thought. Was someone making certain of his kill? A poison draught. Then the more definite poison administered at a later time? Possibly. The poison glasses were a decoy, though. There was no burning of the victim's mouth tissues. I find that interesting. Joss opened up one of the tiny packets of paper on his knee. Inside, carefully pinned in a slot of the paper, lay a single delicate piece of black thread. He gave it to the fairies, who leaned over it and thoughtfully stroked their beards. A thread from clothing? Juss shook his head. It seems too clean. Threads ripped from clothing show furred surfaces from the abrasion. Juss leaned in closer. This is a thread I found elsewhere, identical to this second thread from Escala's door jam. They're the same length and neatly cut, like threads bunched and all cut to a length. There was a sudden, cool flood of understanding from Lord Charn. Gateway tokens. Gateway tokens. Joss held up the threads. Keys used to travel through the forest's magic doors. Escala's father sat on a tree stump that had been colonized by orange fungi. The fungi gleamed like fruit peel as the fairy lord used the shelves to rest his boots. I have a master list of the gates and keys we know of. I will look and see which ones require black silk. Just nodded and asked, Where do the gates go? From here? Only to the forest. Within the forest there are gates to other places across the Flaness. 
The forest seems to have served as a travel nexus. The man rose to his feet. What are we looking for? Who killed Tarquil? A fairy. A fairy who travels through a gate triggered by black thread. A fairy who could not resist taking the slow glass necklace for his own. The murderer had access to a marine cone shell and knew how to handle it and had the means to keep it alive. And he was able to pass your guards without suspicion. Unhappy, Lord Fane plucked at his beard and said, I cannot use this to clear a scholar's name. There is evidence enough to convict her if Sable presses for a judgment. We must catch the murderer and link the cone shell, black threads, and motive to them. It can be done. Just kept the tiny golden link broken from a scholar's necklace in his hand. This gold link was part of the slow glass necklace. We can use it for a location spell to find the rest of the necklace, if you have a mage capable of casting it. We have mages capable of casting it. Charn arose on whirring wings. I will arrange it, and I will fetch the master gate list. Then we will find your murderer. Juss arose, his knees cracking and autumn leaves drifting from his clothes. We have the tools. We merely need the time. Back at the castle cellar, Enid, Polk, and Escala were busy stuffing themselves with a favorite delicacy. Ham sandwiches made with fresh white bread and butter. With all due seriousness, Enid sat holding a little sandwich between her great paws. The mule stood in one corner, its eyes nervous as it listened to creatures hooting in the night. Meanwhile, Polk slathered butter upon more bread and let his voice boom into the gloom. Don't worry, girl. False accusations are all part of the deal. Without false accusations, you don't get righteous indignation. Without righteous indignation, you don't get mighty oaths. Without oaths, you don't get gods interfering with heroic souls. And we can't have heroic souls running about doing stuff without being guided by the gods. Stands to reason. Worried and annoyed, Escala looked at him across the surface of a titanic sandwich. What are you on about now? Gods, girl! Heroes are heroes because they're tools of the gods. Polk, what's heroic about being a theological hand puppet? Anyway, have you seen the names these gods give themselves? Escala took a mouthful of bread and ham. Near for God, whose name reads like something from an apothecary's shelf. Her freckles living a life of their own in the gloom, Enid licked butter from her paws and said, I made a glove puppet once. Stones shifted at the door. Without looking up, Escala made another sandwich filled with extra ham. Hey, Jus. The big man loomed in the blockaded door checking that all was well. We're moving out. You ready? Yep. Spellbook's read, and I'm all charged up. You didn't set a guard? Invisible servant. You just passed him. If it was anyone else, he'd have smashed a bottle on the castle wall. Escala rose and looked at Joss, handing him the sandwich and trying not to appear as anxious as she felt. So did you go and, you know... See the dead guy and all? Yes. Joss looked levelly at the girl. Tell me, were you quiet when you went into the room? Ah, uh, maybe. You never noticed he was dead? Um, well, he did seem a little subdued. Escala blinked. So he was dead all the time? Looks like it. Joss helped shift rocks aside clearing a path into the castle. Your father's here. The murderer took your slow glass necklace and we have a locator. We're going to look at a gate we've found. It's the one the murderers used to escape. Oh, hoopy! Escala instantly cheered up. So you can get me off? Nope. Unless we get the slow glass necklace back, you're toast. Joss ushered everyone outside. Come on. 
Lord Charn awaited his daughter and her friends, keeping a worried look upon the nighttime sky. The distant sound of elf hounds could be heard off to the south. It signified nothing. Hunters could be lying invisible almost anywhere. Escala's father took his daughter's hands and drew her up into his arms. Joss began to mount the way back up to the magic gate above the castle courtyard. He called down, We have to get the murderer before the hunt gets Escala. She's safest on the move with us. Polk, get climbing. The archway above the castle yard was a small window, too small for a sphinx. Enid eyed it unhappily and tested her wings. Can I fly and meet you where the gate empties out? Best not. Just cursed and then jumped down to rest a hand on the sphinx's soft brown hair. Look, set up shop back at that old deserted tavern. Take Polk's mule with you. Read your books, eat sturges, and make it look like you, Polk, and I have set up camp. We'll be a while. Just wait. We'll come back quick as we can. Just shoved Polk onward and pressed a sprig of fennel into his hands. Polk, go to the art and just stay put. Son, maybe I should stay with Enid and... Enid will keep her mouth shut if any fairy hunt comes by. You get to come with us. Just propelled the man skyward. Now hurry up. Escala fluttered over to the unhappy Enid, kissed her on the nose, and then shot up toward the gate. As the arch flashed with light, the fugitives slipped through in haste, ending up in the forest near the palace in the fairy realm. Lord Fane awaited them. He quickly ushered the way to a stone gazebo just out of sight of the family wing of the palace. An archway showed the recent scuff of boots. Joss ushered his party together, then turned to lift a hand in farewell to Lords Fane and Charn. Lord Nightshade held out a piece of silver wire and thrust it beneath the gazebo's arch. Magic flickered. Joss stepped through, dragging the wailing polk underneath his arm. Left with her father and Lord Fane, Escala fluttered unhappily. She flew to the gate, stopped, rushed back to give her father a kiss, and then shot through the arch an instant before the gateway flickered shut. Standing alone with Lord Fane, Escala's father suddenly felt his world turn a little dim. 10. In the dark of night, the stink of corpses hung foul and sickly sweet. There was a reek of smoke and a stir of rats and night creatures fleeing from gnawed carrion. Standing beneath an ancient stone archway, Escala, Joss, and Polk looked about, listening to awful, furtive little noises in the dark. Sour patch. The shanties were burned, and the bodies of slain refugees were hanging rat gnawn in the gloom. At least the stink would have driven away any fairy courtiers. Surveying the wreckage, Joss rested his hand on his sword and pointed the way over to the apple orchard. This way. Escala looked around, appalled by the half-seen corpses in the gloom. What the hell happened here? Massacre before dawn this morning. It was a slave raid. They killed the old and weak, then took everyone else through a gate over there in the apple trees. Escala had found the body of one of the familiar half-orc guards. She flew slowly backward, trying not to stare at the corpse. Who? Who did it? Troglodytes. Yeah. Escala looked bitterly at the stinking dead. Troglodytes led by a fairy. The Justicar looked over at her with his steadying dark eyes. You all right? I'm all right. Escala blurred her wings and headed for the apple trees. I'm getting sick of this. Let's get them. A dead troglodyte lay near the gate tree. As Joss fished the carefully folded black threads from his pouch, Escala wincingly drew close to the bisected troglodyte. A javelin lay glittering in the grass nearby, the head severed from the shaft in the telltale sign of Juss's celebrated parry technique. Ick! It stinks like an orc's outhouse. 
Oil. The Justicar wrinkled his nose at the stink. They excrete an offensive oil when roused. It worked. I'm offended. Escala looked at the hideous splay of troglodyte organs lying on the ground. You have a key to this kit? Joss held up a glimmering black thread and said, I'm pretty sure I do. Then try this locator spell thing of yours. Let's see where the slow glass necklace is hiding. Lord Charn had cast the spell on the necklace. The broken link of Escala's necklace had been glued to a small sliver of enchanted wood, and the wood had been hung from a length of thread where it could quiver and swivel like a compass. Holding her battle wand casually beneath her arm, Escala hovered in midair and watched intently as Just dangled a little charm and let it slowly twist and settle. The needle pointed south and hung quite still. The Justicar looked at it intently, then bundled the charm back up again. Your father said it would start to quiver as we got closer. Well, it's pretty damned still. Escala ran her fingers through her long blonde hair, letting it spill like a waterfall down her back. Damn, that was one greedy piece of work, snitching the necklace. We're lucky they seem to value it. Joss settled the fairy into her accustomed place, setting her on his shoulder. How long until the light passes through the slow glass jewel? Fourteen days. We'll have plenty of time. Escala shrugged. We're only an hour or two behind them. How far can they get? Walking around and around the dead troglodyte, Polk heaved a sigh, then unshipped a heavy ledger from his pack. He licked his pen, forgetting it was a pen and not a pencil, and took notes with blue ink now staining his tongue. One troglodyte, the little man scrawled awkwardly, using spelling he invented on the fly. Was it a mighty battle? Fierce? He chucked a spear at me and I cut it in half. Oh, I see. I'll put it down as a mighty blow, then. Polk sniffed, partly from troglodyte stink and partly in annoyance. Son, do you have any idea how hard it is to keep accurate records around you? Look into my eyes and see how much I care, Polk. Just jerked his thumb toward the gate. Now come on, let's get out of here before the fairy hunt finds us. Wait, hold on. Escala hovered with her spellbooks open. She dusted herself in diamond powder from her kit packs and sent spell syllables twisting through the air. Her skin took on a brief gleam of magic, which faded cleverly from view. There we go. Joss glowered. What was that? Stone skin. It's brand new. You'll love it. The girl posed, admiring her perfect, pure, white little arm. Protects you from cuts, punctures, bites, and swords. Can I have one? Tomorrow, man. What? You think I'm made of high-level spells? Escala ushered the way to the apple tree gate. You've got armor, muscles, and stuff. Now come on, let's get weaving. Joss held out one of his pieces of black silk thread. As it passed beneath the arched apple boughs, a gateway shimmered into life. Polk immediately walked past Joss into the gate, his quill pen behind one ear and a half-eaten apple in his mouth. Joss made an annoyed noise and stepped after the man, Escala flying along at his side. They stepped out into a wilderness of charred, dead bones. It had been a town once, a healthy place with earthen walls topped by a palisade. Wooden houses and temples now lay burned and broken, making shocking silhouettes against the night stars. An ancient dolmen made an arch overhead, an arch tall enough to shelter a giant. Joss straightened up, cinders glistening like new iron in the starlight. He listened for sounds, then strode into the ruins, surrounded by the moan of wind traveling through the weeds. As Polk crunched on his apple, a voice suddenly echoed from the dark. Hold! The voice was very excited and very, very young. Joss, Polk, and Escala turned. A young man slithered down from the earthen ramparts, holding a crossbow in his hands. 
Chainmail rattled and a long sword on the boy's belt threatened to spill him head over heels. He stumbled in his eagerness to keep his captives covered as he yelled out into the dark. Sergeant! Sergeant, I found them! I've got the takers! Escala instantly turned invisible. Joss held his peace until three more men arrived in a clank and clatter of chainmail armor. One of the newcomers took one look at the youth and bellowed in rage, Private Henry! Do these individuals look in the remotest way reptilian? No, Sarge, but... Do they perhaps have claws or scales of a lizard-like persuasion of which I am unaware? Uh... The recruit waved a hand in vindication. But, Sarge, see, the big one's wearing black. Private Henry, you are a pustulous canker on the hallowed butt of the Border Patrol. Annoyed by his recruit, as only an old soldier could be, the sergeant looked Joss and Polk carefully up and down. He kept his voice loud and his hands resting near his weapons. Gentlemen, Keltane is a strange place to be taking a stroll in the dark. The Justicar made a bass growl in agreement, then nodded slowly in the dark. I'm on a private commission, hunting a murderer. Just looked about at the ruined town. Someone raided the refugee camp of Sour Patch. The whole adult population's gone. With a bitter huff of breath, the sergeant relaxed. His martial fury gone, he revealed himself to be a very tired soldier. The man shook his head and pointed across the ruined town. Well, I guess they must have come through here. Gods know how. It's at least twenty miles from here, but someone did see movement in the ruins just before dawn. The man turned and led the way along through the ruins. Found a trail. Looks like a couple of hundred people. The trail just seems to start right about here, and we lose it about half a mile farther on. Lose it how? The sergeant gave the helpless shrug of an angry, frustrated man. You got me beat. Come and see. The man clicked his fingers. Private Henry, you light one field lantern in the approved fashion. Now, boy! It took Private Henry a good three minutes to manage the mysteries of his tinderbox. As he worked furiously away in a corner, a little patch of svelte perfection popped into existence beside Joss and produced a brilliantly glowing stone upon a string. Hey, J-Man. Hey, guys. Escola waved to the soldiers. In the interests of the preservation of social skills, I am a scholar, the one with the big nose is Polk, and the man with the dog skin is your pal and mine, the Justicar. Escola produced her packets of sweets and began to hand out all around. Here you go, good for the soul, Private Henry. Good tinderbox man. You really know how to strike those sparks. Stared at by astounded soldiers, Escola slapped her hands and rubbed them together. So... What have we got? The Justicar laid a level glance upon Escala and said, My partner, Escala. Just bent down, producing his own charmed lightstone, a gift from Escala many weeks ago. Did anyone see who made these tracks? No one answered. These were the same tracks as those in Sour Patch, troglodyte footprints flanking a horde of human tracks. The line of march headed straight toward a gap in the ruined walls of the town. The Justicar stood, looking carefully over the burned ruins nearby. What happened here? Old history, my friend. The Takers came here a month ago. The town began missing its people five by five, ten by ten. They sealed the gates and gathered together in the temples. Then the Takers came and got them in one go. The sergeant gestured to the dark. Must have burned about two hundred folk alive in the temples. The rest were just gone. Six hundred folk lost without a trace. The Justicar turned a slow survey of the ruins. These takers, you know what they are? Reptilian chameleons. Vicious. They're like troglodytes, only smarter. They have magic. They hit fast, they have brains. No one sees them come or go. No trails ever last more than three miles. 
The sergeant flexed his hands. All over Keeland, it's the same. I ain't seen anything like it since the Giants. Giants? Three, maybe four years ago. Giants raided the whole kingdom, killed hundreds. Walking along beside the trail left by the tankers, the sergeant beckoned Escala, the Justicar, and Polk to follow. The forest march is in ruins. We must have lost, what, two thousand people in the last two months? Polk ceased crunching on his apple and goggled. Two thousand people? Son, you've got a problem. Escala drolly raised one alabaster brow. Thanks, man. They may have picked up on that one by now. The trail led straight through the shattered town ramparts and then into overgrown fields. Old cabbage crops had gone to seed, and the trampled plants showed the path of the prisoners and their reptilian guards as they headed off toward a wilderness of scrub. The sergeant motioned toward a flat patch over to one side of the trail. Found us a dead one there. Half orcish boy, about ten, maybe twelve, shot in the back. Bending carefully over the indicated spot, the Justicar searched carefully amongst the cabbage stalks. You buried him? Yep, buried him at midday. Turning to the sergeant, Juss suddenly tilted his head. You said shot, not hit by a javelin? The sergeant shrugged. Could have been a javelin, no weapon left in the wound. But you said shot. A soldier's instincts were not to be ignored. Just knelt down over the trampled patch of earth and leaves. Was he found on his front or his back? Lying on his... ah, uh, on his back. Escala and Polk crowded close, watching in interest as the Justicar combed the dirt with bare fingertips. It was soft black loam, well seasoned with manure by patient gardeners. His fingertips struck something buried in the muck. He brushed dirt aside, and then carefully began digging down into the soil. An arrow lay buried in the dirt point upwards. It was a short shaft, the point snapped off by the victim as he spun and fell. The arrow shaft was ludicrously small and fine, like a scale model of a crossbow bolt. Escala looked at the thing and gave a little frown. It snapped off right down at the end. No. I think it was made this short. The Justicar carefully blew dirt from the business end of the shaft. See, there's a metal shank in the shaft where the point broke away. This arrow was made this long. It only measured six inches in length. Escala picked up the arrow, examined the wood, the feathers and the knock, then pitched it away from her in disgust. It's from a hand crossbow. Drow the Dark Elves. Only they used such weapons, and drow haunted the dark places of the earth where troglodytes might dwell. Joss and Escala looked at each other in perfect shared knowledge, then stood up and flanked the sergeant. Where did you lose the trail? The soldiers hurried them through the brush, looking left and right to scan the darkness. Half a mile ahead, it just vanishes. The sergeant waded over tall cabbage stalks and broccoli. We've seen it before. Do you know how they do it? I can guess. Just pitched the broken crossbow bolt away. Take us there. Just's voice seemed the one iron-hard, dependable thing in all the world. The soldiers had never once asked for proof of his identity or authority. The big man moved with a solid, tireless step, his eyes scanning for danger, and his thoughts kept to himself. The sergeant followed close behind like a pup trailing a wolf. Half a mile's walk in the pitch darkness was no laughing matter. The scrubland seemed full of roots and stumps designed to trip a man over on his face. As the terrain separated the party out from one another, Joss beckoned Escala over to his side. What do you know about Drow? Usual stuff. Escala sat on Juss's shoulder, where she could whisper in quiet to Juss and Cinders. Evil, live underground, slave takers, spider obsessed. Females are more powerful than males. Oh, 
and the females have a dress sense that makes me look like St. Cuthbert's maiden aunt. The girl stroked her chin, a motion unconsciously copied from the Justicar. They are poison users, too. Can we handle that? It's no problem. Joss mentally counted through the spells and powers at his command. I can neutralize it with a spell. Whoopee! So as long as you're not the one that gets hit, we are all in clover. Escala sighed and rested her chin on her hand. No one's tied the drown to this before. Why hasn't there been any sign of elves? A bright mad grin shone in the darkness. Cinders smelled. The hellhound seemed immensely pleased with himself. Cinders smelled them, yes. Elfy pixie fairy smell. Smelled at Sour Patch first time. Yep, got me there. Escala nodded acceptance and patted the dog. You sure did, Pooch. We just forgot to take note. Escala gave a sigh. Sorry, I owe you a tail rub. Welcome. The scrub thinned. Just ahead of Just, the sergeant stood in the light of Private Henry's lantern, wearing the triumphant look of someone about to share confusion and perplexity. The trail of crushed and broken bushes ended on a broad, roughly circular patch of grassy ground. At the middle of the huge clearing stood a ring of standing stones. The stones were massive slabs of granite, moss-covered monoliths that seemed to have sprouted from the flaness itself. Each pair of stones was topped by a capstone to form a titanic arch. The trail ended at the base of one archway, the footprints once again cut off as though sliced with a knife. It was a familiar enough sight. Escala looked the offending archway up and down as she hovered before it in midair. Jus, check the locator thingy. The ranger opened his pouch and duly produced the charm. It swiveled, settled, and hung pointing south without making so much as a twitch. Escala looked at it in interest, then paced busily up and down. Damn, they're still miles away. No matter. Storing away the charm, the Justicar arose and looked at the stone circle. The murderer must be linked to these slave raids. It looks like they might be following the same route. Yeah. Escala's frown faded, then suddenly was replaced by a look of sly, brilliant joy. Yeah. Sliding past Polk, the girl ended up beside the sergeant. Sarge, say, this king of yours. Escala tapped the fingers of her hands together, suddenly the heart and soul of avarice. If we were to free these poor lost citizens of yours, and maybe detonate whoever's behind these raids, do you feel the king might express his joy in a physical, maybe fiscal type of way? Huh? You know, in a material fashion. The girl excitedly waved her hands. An open-handed expression of esteem. Royal pleasure demonstrated through means of treasury assets. The sergeant scratched his head, giving a confused look at the little fairy girl. You mean, is there a reward? Yes, if you want to get all uncouth about it. Well, ma'am, that is, miss, I believe the reward stands at ten thousand gold pieces. Ten! Goggling, Escala waved her hands, almost lost for words, then came racing up to shake the sergeant by the hand. Kick back, man. Relax. We'll deal with it. The fairy halted suddenly. Does this king of yours have a name? Um. Great. Tell King Um that a scholar's on the job. The girl turned a backflip, ending up beside Polk, who was sneaking yet another drink from his fairy bottle. Polk, let's get busy. Time to show these guys that their worries are at an end. Always happy to see activity, Polk corked his magic bottle. The man had apparently been sneaking more than just a wee drink or two to sustain him on the march. He wiped his mouth and gave a happy, addled cry. That's great! Well, come on! Time's a-wastin'!
the little man picked up his feet. Let's go! Joss wearily uncoiled the magic rope from his belt, a shortened, somewhat scorched souvenir from a battle with an Arinese, and whipped it out to entangle Polk. The Justicar hauled Polk in like a flapping fish, took one sniff at him and gave a huge, threatening growl. You're drunk. Never, son! Polk seemed far happier than any man on a murder investigation had a right to be. It's just high spirits! Glad we're on the job! Joss growled. There were too many things to occupy him. Looking at the stone circle, the ranger called, Scala, just tell me how we're supposed to trigger these damned gates. Is there a spell to tell us what the keys might be? Sure there is. So throw the spell. I can't. I don't know it. Escala waved innocently. Like we use it every day. Come on, man, we're going to battle. I just tanked myself up with shields and fireballs. Just pried the ever-full liquor bottle away from the complaining polk and asked, So how do we find the key? Hey, J-Man! The girl circled, taking possession of the ever-full bottle. You've got to think practically. The trick with these gates is that sometimes you might get here and not be carrying the right key. So you always hide a few spare keys somewhere you can reach them. Our murderer came here about an hour or two ago, so just look for any place real close that looks like a hiding place. Escala searched the column tops and the crowns of a few nearby trees. The sergeant, Private Henry, and their unnamed companions spread out with lanterns to look beneath toadstools and stones. Just dragged Polk along by the scruff of his neck as he set about searching for anything out of place. The pure white of his lightstone showed his face grim and seething. Polk struggled, and the Justicar snarled in dark, dire anger. Polk, don't you ever, ever get drunk on the job again. But son, I'm making your chronicles. It's to help my creative flow. Polk waved his hands. It was the kelp, wasn't it? All right. I can change the beer when we're actually on the job. Polk, you get the bottle back at rest stops. One cup at lunch, one cup at night, and nothing more. The hapless teamster wailed like a child deprived of his only toy, but just dragged him on. Ten minutes of fruitless searching yielded no surprises except one edible truffle and a family of voles. Annoyed and still battling with Polk, the Justicar yelled up to Escala as she flew amongst the monoliths. Escala, did you find anything? No. The girl seemed miffed. I looked in all the good places. It's always somewhere to close. I mean, what if you were in a hurry? You're supposed to be an expert. The fairy lost her temper. I am an expert. You people think you could do a better job than just fly up here and do it yourself. Losing patience, Just stood and bellowed. Just tell us what the damned key's likely to be. It could be anything. Equally annoyed, Escala flew backward as she spoke. It could be a herb, a fruit, a rock, a flower, diamonds, silver, a flute, a dead rat. For all we know, it could be the golden hairs from a virgin's. Escala passed through the arch above the tracks, and suddenly magic flashed in a sharp white light that lit the entire hilltop. For a split second, Just saw a look of astonished embarrassment on Escala's face, and then the girl was gone. The gateway still shimmered with magic. With only seconds to act, Just picked up Polk, ran toward the gate, and bellowed over his shoulder. Sergeant, thank you. We'll be back. Just leaped through the gate, cinders swirling about his back. There was a flash, then just landed on dry soil that stank of sulfur. Cinders made an appreciative noise, sucking in the stink of smoke and flame. The night sky above was lined by the vicious teeth of a mountain range, teeth backlit by hellish volcanic flames. A natural archway of rock formed the magic door behind them. Polk sat blearily looking at the volcanoes, leaping about like a mad locust doing an interpretive dance, 
as Scala clutched at her groin and pranced about in pain. Damn it! Asa frasa frackin' damn it! The girl made a mad little dance in the dark. Holy hanali, that stings! Just rose, disoriented by his passage through the gate. What stings? Mind your own business! Ow! 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 Just poised himself to investigate further, when suddenly there came a flash and fresh light flooded through the gate. Private Henry sat up in the dust, blinking in fright. The young soldier sat up, then yelped as Just hauled him to his feet with one mighty heave of his hand. Too late, the gate snapped shut, its eerie light cutting off to leave the archway dead and dim. Just planted himself before the young soldier and roared, What are you doing here? Sir, um, well, sir. Terrified, the boy looked up at the vast, grim figure looming over him. He helpfully offered his lantern. I... I brought a light, sir. That's wonderful. The Justicar turned to the fairy. All right, Escala, send him back. No. Just turned to look in astonishment at the fairy, who hovered unhappily nearby. Joss, I can't. She looked embarrassed, pained, and evasive all at once. I haven't got any key material left. The gate took it all. The gate took it all? Just blinked, recoiled, and for two heartbeats his countenance froze. Then his whole face lit into a smile. The big man suddenly folded forward and bit his fist. Huge shoulders shook, then a laugh escaped him to shake and shatter the night. He laughed for the first time in public memory, laughing all the harder once he saw Escala's face. The Justicar laughed so hard, he cried. Escala stood flapping her mouth in indignation, then turned away, her ears flaming bright. Oh, right, sure, sure, now it's funny. What happens when we need to go back? Cinders snickered like a mad thing, his tail whirling madly round and around. Funny. Joss was having trouble breathing. One look at Escala set him off laughing again. A white wedding dress. The girl swelled up in righteous anger. All right, yes, I admit it. I qualify. I qualify for a white wedding dress. Right? There. Are we all happy now? Just almost choked. No one touches the fairy. Escala seethed, folded her arms across her breasts, and turned away. Oh, go bite a purple worm's butt. In the pitch-dark world of the Dreadwood, tiny lights dipped and swirled through the treetops. The forest floor glowed the sickly colors of dreams as savage little shapes tore through the woods in search of prey. Beside a burned and ruined village, among corpses and old apple trees, an elf hound ran sniffing wickedly at the ground. The creature leaped up to land upon an upper branch and found a scent clinging to the bark. He gave a long, flute-like howl. Two fairy warriors flashed into visibility. They flew up to the branch and joined the elf hound, then pulled out a hunting horn and blew a low, moaning note that echoed above the trees. Long minutes later, Lord Ushan arrived. The fairy lord still wore his robes that swam with all the colors of flame, but now the fire ran blue and white instead of red. The lord knelt beside his hunters and fingered a single strand of perfect golden hair that had caught upon the apple bark. He breathed a long, slow breath of triumph and turned his face toward the waiting apple trees. The warriors watched and waited while Lord Ushan of Clan Sable let his thoughts drift with the wind. The gate could lead almost anywhere, and pursuit was no longer the top priority. A great many plans had worked well tonight. It was enough. Lord Ushan made a slashing motion with his hand. The warriors sheathed their swords, then flashed back into invisibility, their wings whirring as they shot off into the gloom.
Twenty minutes after their arrival, the group stood at the lip of a chasm that plunged deep into the earth. Volcanoes lit the distant horizon, ebbing and pulsing like blood. The red light made the shadows seem darker and more filled with menace, and the whole landscape seemed to shift and move in hunger. The air held a stink of sulfur, ash, and acidic rain. Cinders breathed it in like a breath of holiday air, while his companions' noses snorted from the hellish stink. The tracks of hundreds of feet led down treacherous paths toward the chasm floor. Skeletons and corpses glimmered in the ebbing volcanic light, showing where some captives had slipped and tumbled to their doom. In this grim scene, the only sounds were the distant hiss of steam from the volcanic range and a sudden snicker from the Justicar. Stung and indignant, Escala shot the man a dire glare. Will you stop it with the laughing already? Enough! The girl tossed her golden hair. I just happen to be saving myself for Mr. Wright. While well, dressing like Miss Wrong? No one likes you, Juss. We took a poll. The fairy waved her hand toward the chasm. Now, if we are all quite ready, would you take a reading with the locator spell? Juss and Polk were utterly incapable, their hands still weak and shaking from their suppressed laughter. Seething, Escala relieved them of the locator needle and stood at the precipice, unraveling the needle's string. As she made ready, Private Henry stood over her, looking skinny as a beanpole and about as dangerous as a mouse. Escala saw the lantern quiver and shot the boy a glare that could have shattered stone. Kid, don't you say a phrasing word? No, ma'am. The young soldier blinked in the lantern light. His face seemed to be mostly composed of freckles, and he seemed to be in absolute, worshipful awe of her. Not one word, not one. For once, someone seemed to be treating her like the legendary Sylvan overlord she really was. Escala sniffed importantly, absurdly soothed, and smoothed her long gloves. The girl let the locator needle dangle, taking a reading on the whereabouts of the slow glass necklace. The needle pointed straight down the canyon at a good sharp angle. The needle actually quivered, wavering happily from side to side as though excited by the proximity of the prey. With a professional sniff of disdain, Escala put the locator needle away and flew over the path. This way! Escala magnanimously gave Private Henry a magic light. Here, Private, I will lead, and you may light the way. Having been given a magic light by a real fairy was apparently the high point of the young soldier's life. He looked up at Escala in amazement, held up the magic light, and proudly began walking down the path, crossbow in one hand and magic light in the other. Escala made to go after him when Juss suddenly lumbered over to the trail. Escala, we can't take him with us. Well, he can't stay here. He'll get eaten. The fairy gave an expressive shrug. He's safest with us. With a sigh, Joss acknowledged the point. Finally composed, he unsheathed his sword, the blade long, black, and comfortingly lethal, and walked to the path. All right. Have him bring up the rear behind Polk. He can be rear guard. You take the point and I'll be right behind you. The Justicar looked up at the fairy girl. You got your spells memorized? Sure. And you? Healing, anti-poison. So it's all hoopy. We go in, kick troglodyte tail, release a few thousand prisoners, catch that murderer, and retrieve the evidence. The girl gave an airy wave of her hand. What could be simpler? The trail seemed long, the chasm deep. Backlit by volcanic fires, Joss stared down into the depths. We only have a few days of rations and about one gallon of water. Don't worry about it. It's a dungeon. The girl flew backward without a care in the world. It's just a hole in the ground, Joss. How deep can it possibly be? 11. Through a darkness so absolute that it hung like velvet folds, the party descended into the depths of the earth. 
It was a well-traveled route, a tunnel partly natural and partly carved by hand that formed a roadway plunging into the heart of the Flaness. The tunnel floor had been leveled roughly flat, but the jagged roof dipped and soared into vaults and dripping ceilings. A reeking little rivulet led the way ever deeper, twisting left and right, then splashing down into a limestone cave. The tunnel descended, down, 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 first a hundred yards, and then a thousand. Soon all memory of the outer world, all breath of sulfurous air, all light of sun and moon, had almost vanished. The long, cautious descent plunged the party half a mile below the earth. Neither Escala nor the Justicar suffered from delusions of collapsing walls or crushing roofs. Even so, the sense of so much rock above and the infinite earth to either side made the tunnels seem horribly oppressive. Finally, a wide limestone cavern opened before the party. Escala flew with her little light out into a massive void. Long stalactites hung down like spears overhead, while drips of water fed into trickles that joined into the single stream. Joss held up a hand to halt Polk and Private Henry, then lifted his magic light to spill its glow into the cave. The light shone as brilliant as day, flooding into the cave to strike sparks and highlights from countless outcrops of wet stone. While comforting, it was also a trifle blinding. Escala swirled up toward the roof and tried to peer down into the maze of shapes below. Hey, Jos, she whispered, there's a dead guy down here. Her voice carried strangely, the strength of it lost amidst muffled echoes. Just lowered himself down a gigantic limestone shelf and frowned. What killed him? Don't know. I can't see. Escala flew to hover above the corpse. Oh, wow. Hey, guys, I see it. Whoa! A stalactite detached itself and plunged from the ceiling, almost spearing her. Escala sped aside, and the stalactite missed her by a country mile. It fell to the floor with a heavy thud, righted itself, and fixed a beady eye upon Escala above. The creature seemed to be a tall, thin mollusk with a shell shaped like a razor-sharp stalactite. It began to make its way slowly across the cavern floor, toward a wall, traveling with the glacial bubbling pace of a gastropod. There were other stalactites near Escala. The girl eyed them with clear suspicion, readying her wand. The ceiling's alive with these things. Don't get under them. Thanks, Jos. I don't know where I'd be without your constant good advice. Escala swerved to the ground where a human body lay. It had been pierced from the neck into the abdomen. Nearby there lay the empty shell of one of the stalactite mollusks, still smeared with blood and lined with goo. I think one of these shell critters killed a captive. The trogs must have eaten the shell creature. Escala hastily backed away. Ew! And ate most of the dead human, too. Damn! Palled and angered, Escala circled the body. She had found the main exit from the cave another huge tunnel that led due north. Moving to join her, just thumped down to the floor, sliding down the rock slope in a pool of light. He caught Private Henry and helped the boy to the ground, steadying his crossbow with one big hand. Son, do you really know how to shoot that thing? Sir, yes, sir, the teenager blinked. Well, kinda. I scored thirty out of fifty on the target range. At what distance? Um, thirty yards. Wonderful. Just set the boy to watching the rear, then caught Polk as the teamster came sliding noisily down the limestone slope. Still annoyed with the man, Just dragged him onto his feet. Don't fall behind. Keep between me and the boy and keep your eyes open. Sure, son. They're open. Polk still reeked of fermented kelp. I just stayed back to watch the lights. Real pretty. Now that's what adventure should be all about. 
Pretty things and the unexpected. Surprising vistas, boy. A fitting backdrop to heroics. Joss fixed the man with a suspicious glare, while cinders leaked a wisp of smoke and flames. Are you still drunk? No, son. Just look behind us, see? The whole place is real damned pretty. Joss knelt and waved a hand. Private Henry, Escala, and even Polk all settled down in silence. Joss covered his light and waved the others to do the same. With the light gone, the eyes were shocked into blindness, but it was a blindness that slowly filled out with little points of light. Bands of minerals on the walls slowly began to glow in blues and greens. Lichens on the ceiling gave off a weird yellow glow. Piece by piece, as their eyes forgot the brightness of day, the underworld began to come alive with light. The air felt dank and cold, moving with slow breaths from tunnels and caverns in the far-off dark. The only sounds were subtle, far-off twitterings, bats, rats, or worse. The drip and echo of distant water filled the huge tunnels with a quiet stir of sound. Dung made a foul stench along the tunnels. Some of it seemed to be human, some reptilian, and some came from creatures best left unidentified. Toadstools grew in the compost, their caps shining with a sickly green and yellow luminescence. Clinging to high tunnel roofs, other lights shifted and moved in the gloom. Luminous beetles, slugs and worms going about their daily grind. Joss hid his magic light inside a pouch and shoved it through his belt. Escala followed suit. The light spells were brilliant enough to blind creatures used to this pale phosphorescence. It seemed best to keep them as weapons, moving through the tunnels with more stealth. Over at the new tunnel, Joss looked carefully at the dim, dark shadows and touched a troglodyte footprint still fresh in the mud. He thoughtfully dried his fingertips. Escala inspected her friend's work and asked, Recent? About half a day's lead. Know what we're going to do when we find him? Play it by ear. The Justicar arose. Locator? Escala produced the magic pointer. The little compass swung to point straight north down the tunnel. The pointer no longer quivered. The quarry had gained many miles of lead. With a curse, Escala put the thing away and unslung her battle wand. The Justicar nodded. Escala turned invisible and took the lead position, scouting far ahead of her friends. The Justicar settled cinders on his helm and felt the hellhound lift his ear and begin carefully scanning the gloom. Moving with a stealth that was perfection to behold, the big man paced down the wide tunnel on Escala's trail, his hand poised on his sword hilt for a lightning draw. Polk watched his companions, reached for his whiskey bottle, and then remembered that his drink had been confiscated. With a concerned look at the tunnel, the man ran to catch up with the Justicar. Son, this is no lair. This ain't a dungeon. Polk's voice carried shockingly far in the gloom. Are you sure we're on the right track? Just never spoke a word. He turned, glared, lifted a finger to his lips, then swung about to keep up his silent march. Polk went into a huff. With his hands jammed into his pockets, he stomped along ten feet behind his friends, kicking at any toadstools that came in his way. Behind him, Private Henry kept a nervous rear guard, chainmail jingling with every step, and his pace slowed as he turned constantly to point his crossbow at empty shadows far behind. The party walked cautiously onward into a tunnel that never seemed to end. Long hours of walking went by. The massive passageways were a squalor of life and violent death. Great phosphorescent beetles preyed upon the slugs. Slugs chewed into glowing fungi, which in turn grew on compost left from dead beetles, old bones, and dung. Other things lived and ate here as well. The gnawed bones of humanoid creatures had been left here and there on the passage floors, 
sometimes elf bones, sometimes human, always gnawed clean with skulls left grinning in the dark. There were frequent alcoves, side caves, and sinkholes all along the way. The party sat down in one such alcove as they shared hard bread and rested their feet. Polk's magic bottle was produced, and much to his pain, all the travelers were served a measure of good whiskey, carefully monitored by Juss before the bottle was sealed away again. Sipping prime-aged whiskey from a tin mug, Escala kept a watch upon the corridor. Escala had long since given up her invisibility on the march, coming to hover close to Cinder's and the Justicar. After half an hour, invisibility wreaked havoc with her hair. Swigging back her whiskey, Escala turned to the task of gnawing upon a rock-hard piece of bread. Daunted by the task, she finally used the bread chunk as an elbow rest. Juice, how far do you reckon this tunnel runs? Honestly? Yeah. It's a road. The Justicar was repairing one of his bootlaces, working with big, efficient hands. The Trogs must have a nest down here. Probably a drow settlement, too. The thing must run for miles. Escala gave a sigh and idly dangled the locator needle on its string. It pointed north, straight down the tunnel, and gave not a quaver of life. The opposition must have zoomed at least ten miles ahead. Bugger, the girl sighed. How much food do we have again? Not much. The Justicar finished fixing his boot. Fancy slug stew? Pass. The girl took a long look down the tunnels. There must be something big enough to make a meal of down here. Rising to his feet, the Justicar looked into the gloom with a growl. That's what I'm afraid of. The tunnels had been eerily empty so far, but it couldn't last. The takers would hardly leave their gates unguarded. Somewhere farther along the tunnels there would be a guard post. Beyond that lay the horrific kingdom of the Underdark. Just pondered the trouble they were sinking deeper and deeper into, and looked about the dripping cavern walls. Any ideas who the murderer might be? Just asked. Deep in thought, the fairy sat shadowed by the bright splay of her wings. I've been trying to narrow down my list, the girl hissed. My mother, my sister, my mother and my sister, or Lord Ushan, or even Lord Fane, or perhaps my mother, my sister, Lord Ushan, and Lord Fane. Escala sat sifting her relatives and their allies through her mind. Do you see now why I fled to the real world? Yep. The Justicar sighed, shook his head, and made a tour of the alcove. He walked past Private Henry and patted the boy on the shoulder as he passed. Having been set to thread thin strips ripped from his own cloak through the bottom layers of rings of his chainmail hauberk, the young soldier looked anxiously up for approval of his work. Just knelt down to inspect the results, shaking the armor to make sure that its noise had been reduced. Good job. You did it just right. Thank you, sir. Private Henry seemed pale, but his eyes were awed as he looked up at the imposing figure of the Justicar. Is there anything else I should do? To make my gear better, I mean. How do you fight? Um, just with swords, sir. Kind of. The boy looked pale. He had been given a long sword as part of his equipment and its weight still felt awkward on his belt. We haven't really done much practice with it. Huge and solid, the Justicar rested a hand upon the boy's shoulder and said, If we get into a fight, just shoot, go to ground, and leave the battle to us. If you get caught at sword point, fight defensively and call for help. We'll cover you. The big man stood. When we get the time, I'll teach you how it's done. Joss looked over the gangly boy's equipment. He sniffed at the sword belt, a typical botched affair, good for horsemen and useless for everybody else. Taking up the worn leather, Joss showed the lad how to wear his sword horizontally through his belt. 
You get a faster draw this way. You might need it. He helped the boy to don the heavy equipment, then shared a last drink of beer from his canteen. All right, let's go. Escala took a careful look out of the alcove, ducked back, looked one more time, and then fluttered up into the air. Joss strode out into the corridor, his heavy boots strangely quiet. With his cherished friend at his side, he moved into the tunnels with Polk and the teenage soldier traipsing behind. Polk automatically reached for his water bottle, discovered that for once it actually did contain only water, and almost choked. From up ahead, Joss turned and glared at the little man, silently ordering him to close the line of march. Shooting seething glances at Escala, Polk hauled out his book and wrote awkwardly as he walked. He scribbled down scathing paragraphs on the subject of teetotalism, tyranny, and the mental benefits of alcohol. The whole process kept him occupied for at least the next two long, slow, and silent miles. To an eye attuned to the sinister pulse of the Underdark, the tunnels ebbed with life, echoing to the endless drip and flow of time. Water trickled, creatures squeaked, and deep crevices sometimes carried sounds that rang with terror. Hidden amongst rock outcrops and stalagmites, two figures sat silent in the gloom. They were drow, the ebony-skinned, silver-haired elves of the Underdark. Each wore a long cloak made to conceal them in the dark. They sat several paces apart, each facing in the opposite direction, sentries halfway through a long, tedious watch. With hand crossbows at their sides, the two elves passed the time. One was chewing on some sort of meat, while the other carved patterns in a piece of knuckle bone. Around them, the tunnel echoed, time dragged by, and water dripped like blood seeping from a dying world. Into this tedious quiet came a shockingly familiar sound. A coin fell tinkling upon stone. It echoed from the southern tunnel, ringing faint but clear. The southernmost sentry jerked his head up, covering the passageway with his crossbow as he scanned the darkness. The weapon's sharp bolt gleamed sickly black with poison. Heat images swam in the eerie shadows of the tunnel. The wall mold glowed sometimes hot, sometimes cool, but amongst the smallest of small shapes upon the floor, a figure appeared, a little creature moving fearlessly down the corridor. A coin rang yet again, and now both guards craned forward to look, the northern guard standing up to peer past his partner. A rat, a very large, well-muscled rat, was scuttling along the edge of the southern tunnel. Thirty yards away in the gloom, even drow eyes could scarcely pick out the slightest detail. The rat moved away and disappeared into the dark. Moments later the sound of busy digging came, a sound very faint against the tunnel noises. Soon the rat returned, seeming extremely pleased with itself. Gold glittered briefly in the tunnel, the rat dropped a coin that it had held in its mouth, making a pile with other flecks of gold in the corridor, then pranced off to continue with its digging far away. The watching sentries leaned forward, staring in amazement. The gold was real. The drow looked behind them at the entrances to the guardrooms and the tunnels behind them, wary to see if they had been missed. There was no point in sharing treasure with too many other grasping hands. Gold clinked again. The rat could be heard digging, and flecks of dirt and bat dung scattered out onto the floor. The two drow raised their hand crossbows, the bolts glistening with venom. With short swords in their other hands, they advanced side by side up the passageway. They glared at one another with no love lost, then stalked forward, walking over the rat's little pile of coin. Both moved faster and faster in pursuit of the busy rat. They passed outcrops of rock, passed loose soil and gravel left over from a crumbled wall, and watched the rat as it flitted toward its treasure hoard. The elves saw the rat stop to dig at a half-buried skeleton. 
They gave a grin, hefted their crossbows, and strode toward the rat. Behind them, buried underneath the gravel, a pair of red eyes suddenly gleamed. There was the softest whisper of sliding gravel. Then the two sentries seemed to fall apart. One heartbeat, they were half turning as movement flickered in the dark behind them. The next instant, one elf's body stood without its head, and the other jerked as the Justicar's sword blurred down through his skull and into the torso below. Without even watching his victim's fall, the Justicar swept his blade free, flicked it clean, and sheathed it all in one smooth curve. The two dead drow fell to the tunnel floor, their blood pooling into a gruesome mud on the floor. Joss shook himself free of dirt and gravel. From far down the tunnel, Polk and Private Henry peered out of hiding, looking pale. The rat came out into the middle of the corridor and waved them closer, turning to look up and whisper to Joss, Think they heard? Joss shook his head, then knelt to drag the twitching corpses out of sight. The big rat shimmered, changing from its furry form and into a very naked Escala. Her clothes had been stuffed out of sight in a rock crevice. She dragged on her leggings, then wriggled her bottom into her undergarments. At the sound of a little noise behind her, she looked archly across one shoulder to see the shocked eyes of Private Henry. Already pale, Private Henry hurriedly turned to face the wall. Escala gave a wry smile and began pulling on her long gloves. What's the matter, kid? Never see a girl before? Yes. The teenager looked a tad unsteady on his feet. Well, sort of, but you're a lady. Escala paused, brightened, and instantly radiated a glorious goodwill to all creation. She jerked on her dress and fluttered up to kiss the boy upon the cheek. Now you're a gem. Where have you been all my life? The boy came forward with Escala, his crossbow with the ready, but the two drow were most deeply and sincerely dead. The Justicar, spattered here and there with dark blood, had relieved them of small pots of venom sheathed beside their crossbow bolts. He tossed these to the young soldier. Henry stared aghast at the corpses. Escala looked at him, and for once, without any laughter in her eyes. They are drow. Don't waste time feeling bad for them. These bastards are worse than orcs. She jerked one of the drow's clothing aside. Check it out. Their boots are made from human skin. Escala let the clothing drop. They skin girls to make the softest boots. The longer the victim stays alive and screams, the better the boots are supposed to be. Henry took a tighter grip upon his crossbow and choked. My gods! Kill them. Kill them any way you have to. The fairy nodded her chin at the Justicar's back and gave a grim smile. It's a bad day to be a drow. Justice is coming. Twelve After hiding the bodies in the gravel scrape and covering the blood with dirt and gravel, the Justicar turned to watch the dangerous spaces down the tunnel. Just past where the two sentries had sat their watch, two caverns opened out from the main tunnel, each most certainly housing more guards. The party intended to move down the corridor to creep silently past the two caves on either side of the passageway. The destruction of the entire Drow Nation, although desirable, was not their current mission. Escala patted gravel in place over the corpses, started after Juss, then stopped, reversed and hovered directly above Private Henry, her newest admirer. Hey, kid, here. The girl sprinkled powder across Private Henry. Her eyes closed as she spoke a powerful charm. He jumped as he felt his skin ripple with strange force, and an eerie glow seemed to soak into his skin. Escala breathed out a sigh, then dusted off her hands. There you go, kid. Stone skin. Keep you safe. The girl wrapped knuckles on her own skin. Best insurance policy in the world. But, but, what about the Justicar? He'll get one tomorrow. You're a bit spongier than he is. The girl put her finger to her lips. Now creep along quietly. 
and we'll sneak past the guard rooms. The Justicar stole slowly and carefully forward, his sword held ready. He walked with cat-footed care, his boots touching at the heel, then the outer sides, then planting flat and sure. Escala kept behind and to one side, her battle wand ready. Joss reached the cave opening on the left, lay flat against the stone, and let Cinders' ears and nose search the air inside. He then carefully crossed the passage to the cave on the right. Cinders slowly waved his tail and sampled the damp, dull breeze. Drow here. The hellhound's voice echoed softly in the minds of Joss, Escala, Polk, and also now to the startled Private Henry. Maybe ten left, ten right. Bad girly girls on right. The hellhound grinned. Cinders burn. Joss held up a hand to halt the hellhound's antics. The big man lifted up his hand, and a spell spread slowly out around him. A sphere of total silence radiated from the man, and he walked back to fold his companions in the spell. There were two caves, one with three small entrances on the left and one with a wider, more opulent single entrance on the right. The five companions moved together down the corridor, hugging one wall. Joss brought them swiftly, ushering Polk and Private Henry past and taking the last position as he covered the nearest cave mouth with his sword. They were past the dangerous cavern mouths and already heading for safety, when suddenly a male drow carrying a basket of food came out into the main tunnel. He saw the Justicar only a few paces away, stared, and opened his mouth to scream. No sound came. The spell made the drow blink, and he turned to run into the cave. Just moved, but then something flashed past his flank. The drow jerked, spun, then smashed against the cave wall with a crossbow bolt protruding from his heart. Private Henry stared, his empty crossbow still held on target, amazed at himself, then could only watch as the perfectly matched team of Juss and Escala sped into activity. A second drow appeared, looking back over his shoulder and talking to someone behind him in the cave. His voice cut out in his own ears, and then his entire body fell severed diagonally through the waist as the Justicar's black blade sheared him in two. The drow fell, his hand spasming to fire his crossbow. The bolt sped into his home cave, struck sparks from the stone, and suddenly black figures surged upright in the gloom. Behind Joss, Escala shot toward the other cave. With the air of a master craftsman at work, Escala fired her wand. A silent blast of frost solidified into an ice wall that sealed the opening to the cave. Escala left only one small hole high up in one corner of the ice. As vaguely seen figures on the far side of the barrier began to appear, Escala whistled happily, licked her index finger, and fired an ice storm through the little hole. Violence broke out inside the sealed room, with figures jerking back and forth as shards tore into their flesh. With just now at the far side of the passage, Escala had left the protection of the silence spell. As muffled screams of pain came from the cave, Private Henry stared at Escala utterly aghast. She looked at him and shrugged. I have a nasty side. What can I say? At the far side of the passage, all hell broke loose. A male drow charged from the cave mouth, saw Polk and Henry, and fired his hand crossbow. The shot went wide. The drow ran forward, his shout silenced, but six other drow came from the other caves and joined him in surging straight toward Private Henry. Two died in a savage instant of horror, their blood misting as the Justicar struck from hiding. The drow turned, and Cinder shot a violent blast of flame straight into their eyes. The flame took one elf in the face, blasting the flesh from his skull. The other drow ducked wildly and turned, their black cloaks sweeping around to take the flame blast. Fireproof cloaks shielded the elves, but the instant of blindness cost the lead drow his life, as Joss cleaved downward with his sword. More drow came running from the caves. Already facing two enemies to his front, Joss poised, his sword ready, 
looking at the six elves behind him from the corner of his eye. The drow hesitated, looking at the savage splay of dead around the Justicar. One of the elves hurled a javelin, while another fired a crossbow bolt. Joss scarcely seemed to move, and yet as he slid one step and turned, the bolt shot past him and the javelin clattered to the floor, split neatly in two by the ranger's black blade. The drow warriors drew short swords and bucklers from their belts, paused, then sped forward in a surge of maddened hate. Escala clung to the wall above the cave mouth. Below her, two drow noblemen strode forth, one dressed in fur robes and the other armed with a pair of sinister silver swords. With a shout of triumph, Escala flicked open her hands and fired. A lightning bolt stabbed downward, blasting the drow warrior from his feet, but failing to even scratch the elf in the fur robes. The warrior fell and the fur-clad elf turned. Dodging sideways, Escala fired a stream of her magic bees straight at the fur-clad foe. Again the spell failed, the bees disappearing the instant before they hit. The drow with the silver swords rose, snarling, but he went after the Justicar after a curt jerk of the noble's head sent him away. Dragging a hand crossbow from his belt, the remaining elf took aim at Escala and opened fire. Escala tumbled wildly, head over heels, the crossbow bolt missing her by a hair. She whirled in her roll and fired her wand, and this time the spell blasted home. The elf slammed back against the wall, ripped by ice shards. An instant later, he lifted a hand and blasted his own ice storm straight toward the fairy. The impact smashed Escala into the wall behind her, sending her tumbling to the ground. In the passageway beyond, Joss moved with a wild blur of steel. Drow leaped in and out, short swords and bucklers flashing. Joss spun and kicked one elf in the head, breaking the drow's jaw, then parried a short sword with his blade before running its owner through. The elf screamed a silent scream, staggering aside and gushing blood. Short swords stabbed, and one ripped a mark across Joss's thigh an instant before the elf behind it fell back with his arms severed. Cinders fired flame, and two elves staggered while others ducked beneath their cloaks. Steel flashed as the fight swirled in a maelstrom of blood. Back down the tunnel, Escala's enemy moved to cast a spell. Stunned, Escala flickered into invisibility and shot to the ceiling. A lightning bolt blasted inches beneath her, hit the ice wall, and smashed back into the dark elf. Killed instantly, the creature fell steaming and hissing to the floor. The ice wall cracked. Something struck at a blow from behind the melted impact point, and the entire sheet of ice began to break and fall. Escala took one look, then threw herself behind a stalagmite. Joss, we got visitors! The drow bearing twin swords ran toward the Justicar, joining the only survivors, two scarred drow veterans. The nobleman signaled one to go left and one right while he struck sparks from his swords and faced the Justicar. With his back against a wall, Joss stood with his sword on guard, cinders wreathing the scene in a sulfurous smoke. The ranger loomed above the elves like a sinister black giant. To his left and right stood Drow with swords and bucklers. Before him stood their war leader with twin blades weaving. The three Drow paced for a moment, then sped suddenly backward as Joss lunged at one swordsman with his blade. Evading the huge man, the Drow lunged at Joss, parried the savage black sword with crossed weapons, then flew backward as Joss's kick crashed into him with enough force to shatter steel. The elf leader instantly scythed high and low with his blades. Joss turned, still leaning sideways from his kick, and parrying one blow and letting the other crash against his cuirass of dragon scales. Sparks flew. The elf drew blood, but just spun, trapped the blade beneath his arm, and hammered a blow down onto the drow's elbow. Bone broke, and the drow leader howled in silent agony. Cinders blasted flame at the third elf, making the creature cower within his cloak and winning just an instant. The big man stood with legs bent, sweeping one arm up, back, and over to crash the elf leader across his knee. The drow's back broke and as his victim fell, Joss whirled to face the remaining elf. A short sword ripped through cinders and cut Joss's back, 
but the man smashed the skull hilt of his sword into the elf's teeth and whipped the blade in a savage blur, shearing open the drow's abdomen. As sheet ice shattered like an exploding wall of glass, Joss drove his black blade through the final swordsman, twisting the weapon free and beheading the dark elf as it fell. The ice wall splintered, and a half-dozen female drow came raging into the corridor. Frost-burned and smothered with blood, they hurled themselves straight at the Justicar. Escala swung out of cover behind the elves and fired her wand. Two drow jerked and died, while others leaped untouched out of the storm. The drow whirled, saw Escala, and opened fire with a shower of crossbow darts. Screaming in fright, Escala covered her face with her arms, bolts smacking into her and ricocheting free, victims of her stone-skin spell. Hugging the cave wall, Private Henry watched anxiously, panting as he saw the Justicar charge savagely into the attacking elves. A silver-haired head fell to the floor as the drow scattered to surround their foe. One leaped spectacularly above the fight, landing behind the Justicar. Pale with panic, Private Henry ran forward, dragging his unfamiliar sword from its sheath. He charged with the heavy blade held in front of him like a battering ram, crashed into the elf from behind. The drow whirled, Henry's sword jutting through her ribs, and felled the boy with a backhand blow of her fist. She loomed over him, grinning in insane bloodlust, as she stabbed a short sword down at his chest again and again, the blade striking sparks as it struck against Escala's stone-skin spell. Henry screamed and tried to fend her away with helpless hands. An instant later, her head snapped back with a crossbow bolt buried in her face. Private Henry looked up in shock to see Polk standing and reloading the crossbow. The teamster shook his head in annoyance and having to work so hard for his drink. Female drow fought with a wild, manic indifference to life. They leaped like acrobats, spinning handstands and dodging madly from side to side. Looming like a bear amidst a flock of sparrows, Joss hacked one in mid-flight, sending both halves of her smacking to the ground. He fought fast and furiously, kicking another, catching her by the skull and pulping her head against the cave walls. Two elves held back behind the fight, both trying to cast spells, and both finding that the silent spell blocked their chance. Escala fired her wand again, the frost blast failing against one but staggering the other. As the last female warrior died, the two sorceresses flicked a look at Escala, then leaped into the air, shooting like lightning bolts down the corridor in magic flight. Joss dived forward, rolling to come up with his sword moving. As the sorceresses flew past, he whipped out his magic rope, making it crack like a lash as it fastened about the neck of one of the fleeing elves. The drow jerked like a victim on a noose, clawing at her throat. Escala shot past in hot pursuit of the remaining elf, who rolled to fire a spell at the fairy, snarling in anger as Escala's shields wrenched the spell aside. Escala sped like a meteor, dodging spell fire left and right. She cranked the focus ring upon her wand and blasted a bolt down the corridor. The fleeing drow rolled, the bolt shot past beneath her, and the evil sorceress gave a cackling screech of mirth. An instant later, the drow smashed into an ice wall at top speed. The crash broke half a dozen bones and sent her tumbling to the floor. Escala fell on her like a diving hawk, screaming out a spell that blasted at the stunned drow. Once again, the magic seemed to die an instant before it hit. Broken and staggering, the drow snarled and swept her cloak about her body. She shimmered and changed into a sinister gray manta that flew up into the air, fanged mouth open and screaming. The manta plunged down and folded around Escala, intending to crush the fairy to death. The manta swirled, clamped its mantle around its prey, squeezed with all its might, and died. Running with blood, the manta changed shape back into a drow sorceress. The drow's corpse lay curled about a deadly little shape, a steely urchin studded with vicious spikes. The spines had punctured the drow like a thousand knives. As the drow fell slowly to the floor, the urchin changed shape back into a scala. 
and a scarlet dressed in a few torn clothing threads and horribly drenched in dark elf blood. My clothes! Wiping blood from her face, Escala looked down at herself. She looked as if she had been swimming on a slaughterhouse floor. You filthy drow bitch! Look what you made me do! The instant transformation had ripped Escala's clothes apart. She threw the ruined scraps of her clothing away. Cursing and muttering, she began to search the dead, bleeding elf. From far behind her came a thin little cry, the voice of Polk. Girl, you all right? I'm fine. Escala dropped her voice to a mutter. Except for dripping with drow body fluids. She yelled across her shoulder down the tunnel. I got her. How's Joss? Poisoned. Gold glinted from the hair of the dead drow. A true kleptomaniac, Escala swooped and plucked out a golden spider pin. Swearing like a dock worker, Escala sped back to join her friends. The tunnel section between the caves looked like a slaughter yard. Parts of dark elves lay amidst an ocean of blood, black and gleaming in the dim phosphorescent light. With a look of raw fury frozen on his face, Juss sat slumped unconscious against a wall. Polk sat on his heels, looking puzzled. Private Henry wrung his hands in panic. Cinders merely grinned and wagged his tail. Wincing, Escala dropped to the floor. It felt like half her ribs were broken by the impact of the drow's ice spell. Hurting and dazed, she waved a hand at Polk and Henry. Dripping with filth and feeling violated, the fairy dragged herself over to Joss, took his pulse, then saw the bolt from a hand crossbow lying by the man's injured thigh. What happened? The sorceress he caught in the rope attacked him. Henry pulled at a drow's cloak to make a bandage, then hastily dropped it when he found it to be soaked with blood. She stabbed him with a crossbow bolt. Wiping her blood-soaked hair back from her face, Escala wearily trudged over to Juss. Her naked body dripped blood as she stepped onto him, and she saw Polk and Henry's eyes go wide in alarm. It's all right, guys. Drow blood, not mine. Escala winced and held her ribs. He's alive. Don't worry about it. Drow put a sleeping drug on their missile weapons. He'll come out of it in about ten minutes. The girl folded over, clutching herself. Just time to, uh, to check his pockets for small, small change. Racing forward, Paul caught the girl as she fell. Lolling in agony, Escala could only croak and close her eyes. Thirteen. Cracked ribs, bruises, concussion. This had not been one of Escala's better days. Her stone skin spell had stopped punctures, but had transmitted the shock right through to the bones. Painfully awake at last, Escala felt herself being tended to. Wounds were tended, and her face wiped semi-clean. Sitting cradled in Juss's lap, Escala smoldered, thinking dire thoughts about the drow. She opened one bloodshot eye and said, So, fireproof cloaks? Poisoned arrows, they use magic, move silently, and are immune to magic at least half of the time. Extremely miffed, the girl lifted her arm and suffered to have another healing spell across the ribs. Apart from that, we're pretty even. Bandaged and grim, Joss merely kept on with his work, healing the fairy. We got them. Yeah, and they almost got us. Unconcerned, Juss shrugged and said, Almost still makes them dead and us alive. He poured water onto a cloth and handed it to Escala. How do you feel? Like crap. With dried blood crusting her hair and skin, Escala looked a mess. My ribs are better, though. Good. Juss arose. He had a puncture in one thigh, as well as numerous gashes and painful bloody cuts. 
he lowered Escala to her feet and handed her a long strip of silken drow cloth as a dress. Escala used it for cover, and she tried to rub herself clean and shot a concerned look at the Justicar. Hey, man, you're still ripped to bits. You needed the healing more than I. Joss moved slowly and heavily now that his wounds were stiff with pain. I'll have more healing spells tomorrow. Damn! Escala threw her washcloth aside. We can't go treepsing along these tunnels without you in full fighting trim. We'll get wiped out. The girl roughly tied the sheer black silk into a dress. We're going to have to hole up for a day and let you rest. The huge ranger sighed heavily, then looked at the drow corpses lying splayed and smeared about the tunnel. Not here. They might have a relief. They are side alcoves. We'll get in one, and I'll cover the entrance with an illusion spell. The girl flew up to hold Joss by the hand in concern. You sure you're all right to walk? I'll manage. Come on, then. Let's get the loot sorted out, then we'll walk for half a mile and hide. The girl heaved an irritated sigh. I feel like such an idiot. Virtually everything I threw at them was blocked. Change your strategy. Use spells that affect the area around the drow, and not ones that attack the drow themselves. You got it. Escala scowled and tried to think. I've got to hole up and redo my spell list. Working with the diligence of a true monomaniac, Polk had been searching the drow lairs. Apparently the proper cataloging of spoils was a vital part of adventure. Polk sat cross-legged amidst his chronicle and pens, carefully recounting every single sword blow, dodge, and spell. Escala threw the man a happy little wave and was given a grumble in return. Hey, Polk, nice crossbow shot, man. I didn't know you could shoot. Hard to save the boy. Polk sniffed in self-importance as he went about his work. The boy's no hero. Can't interfere with a hero, but the boy needed help. Escala kissed Polk upon the cheek and said, Well, thank you. Here's the magic bottle. She placed the fairy bottle into Polk's lap, big and already brimming with a whiskey so concentrated that it could strip paint and raise the dead. The girl shot Polk a dire glance. And no fairy wine, especially not the sixty-three. Infinite happiness filled Polk's soul. He wrenched open the bottle, filled a tin mug, then drew in an important breath, rose and presented the liquor to the Justicar. He poured more drinks for Escala and for the teenage soldier, then contented himself with drinking straight from the bottle. Here's to adventure. Next time we'll bash a hundred more. The whiskey traveled down living gullets as though it had spines and claws. Private Henry almost coughed up a lung. He fought for breath, tears in his eyes, a look of horror on his face as he saw Escala raise her little mug to him in salute and take a second draft. Here's to you, kid. Polk happily arranged items from the looted drow in a line along the floor. There were a few scant pieces of gold, a few platinum coins, Short swords, daggers, bucklers, crossbows, poisoned crossbow bolts, and blood-stained clothes. Most intriguing of all were scroll tubes lined up side by side. Escala raced over to pry open the tubes, only to be frozen in place by one hard glare from the Justicar. The ranger picked up the tubes one by one, checking them carefully. Cinders sniffed for magic, then happily began to wag his tail. Clean. Whoopee! Escala pounced, ripped the cap off a tube, and found only a piece of parchment covered with lines and squiggles. She hastily moved to the next tube, opened it, and found that it was the same. Oh, man, these aren't scrolls. She scowled petulantly at the parchments, turned them around and around. Can't these drow even get treasure right? The Justicar winced as he sat down with the first piece of parchment spread out across his knees. He examined the carefully inked lines with notes and pointing arrows scribbled beside the diagrams in a different hand. 
he held the drawing up in the shine of Cinders's flames, checking carefully for secret messages and invisible ink. Escala wound up draped over his shoulder from behind, staring at the diagrams. What is that thing? Dark elf doodles? No. Joss smoothed the parchment in grim distaste. It seemed to be made from human skin. It's a map. Yeah? To Escala, the squiggles hardly seemed map-like. How do you figure that? A simple one. A map of the Underdark. The map was made of simple lines, interconnected with symbols marking many of the junctions. See, this arch is the gate outside. This is the passageway we're in. The area marked here with an eye. It's this position here, the guard post. Hoopy. Escala squinted carefully at the map. Polk and Private Henry gathered near. Lots of notes beside those symbols. Do you read Drow? No. You have a spell or something that can do it? Sure. Escala cast the appropriate spell. There you go. They all craned forward with interest, even Polk, whose spelling skills were dubious at best, and Private Henry who feared to admit that he couldn't read. Escala ran her fingers over the lines of scribbled symbols, and for an instant thereafter their meaning became sharp and clear. Main way. Patrols. Eklavdra clan. The fairy read the symbols scribbled beside the main route marked on the map. Here's us. Says post one. Incoming secret adits one and two. Fairy of the motherkin allowed to pass. The girl wrinkled her freckled nose. Motherkin? Follower of Lolth, our quarry. The Justicar tapped the map. Looks like the paths diverge just down here. What are the notes on the next junction? Ah! Escala glared at the magically transformed writing, trying to make sense of it, then decided that Drow simply couldn't spell. Ill... Illithids? The girl jerked forward in alarm. Illithids? Standing awe-stricken behind the Justicar, Private Henry blinked like an owl. What's an illithid? Mind flares. Oh, they're great. You'll love them. Escala waved her hands theatrically about her head. Imagine a super-powered, mind-blasting psychopath that can stun your mind at will and wants to eat your raw, ungarnished brain. The fairy jotted marks across the map. This says illithids, plural. The girl circled the location hard and sharp with a pen procured from Polk. I want to meet a bunch of illithids like I want to be fed rot grub. Definitely we go around. The Justicar looked at the maze of minor tunnels marked on the maps, each one marked with a danger symbol by the drow. The main path might be faster, he said, if we can pass the mind flares. Joss, you pass the mind flares. Those of us with tasty, delicious brains in our craniums might elect to just avoid the dinner invitation, all right? The girl shot a grumbling look at the Justicar. We go around. All right. Anyway, fairy brains are more highly evolved than human ones. They're tastier. With her spell slowly failing, Escala shook her finger to jazz up the magic, then hurriedly went back to the map. There are other caves definitely blocking the way. Here's the first. Reptile caves. Pass security level one. I'm guessing that's where the trogs hang out. Escala's finger traced paths and still more symbols changed. Next zone down, Kuatoa, security pass code two, whatever that means. Evil sentient fish. Just glowered at the map. Go on. Well, that's about it. Escala traced lines that finally led to a giant symbol far to the north. A huge cave topped with a drawing of a black spider. The passages all pretty much lead there. I'm guessing that's home. The locator needle seemed to agree with the map. Whoever carried the slow glass gem 
he was heading northwest, straight toward the Drow Citadel. It would take a superhuman effort to make the journey, recover the slow glass, and fathom the motives of the murderer. Fortunately, Escala considered herself and her friends superhuman. She helped herself to a swig from the ever-full bottle, now mysteriously full of peach brandy, and clapped her hands as Just noisily rolled up the map. All right, people, let's move on. The girl marched about the place like the leader of a circus troupe. Henry, poison your crossbow bolts with the drow drugs. In fact, take the whole poison pot and dip your sword. Pork, let's get going. The drow had carried small brooches coated with patterns and squiggles. Just knelt and seized a random selection, then began the hard march into the dark. Half an hour later, a tiny campfire made from lantern oil and fungi spread a yellow light about a nasty little cave. Dinner sizzled and gave off an amazingly offensive smell. Sitting cross-legged in her black silk dress, her bottom planted upon cinders, who lay staring in fascination at the fire, Escala wrenched another piece off the roast and tried to fit it in her mouth. Look on the bright side. At least everybody gets a drumstick. Each sitting with a leg from a really big spider in their laps, both Polk and Private Henry managed to give watery smiles while wondering how to hide their food. Joss sat in silence, crunching upon spider meat. With his armor lying spread beside the fire, the Justicar was a mass of bandages. The magic whiskey bottle wet the cloth a scholar used to dab his wounds. Joss heaved and bucked in pain, snarling imprecations at the fairy. She sat primly in place, holding her washcloth and looking at the Justicar through hooded eyes. Don't be such a baby. We have to get these clean. They are clean. They are not. These tunnels are filled with fungus. We'll clean you up and use nice fresh bandages. Then in a few hours your healing spells will make you all better. Escala moved with a matronly, possessive air as she tended the Justicar. You're my pal, so we have to take good care of you. Joss dragged his sword from his belt and lay it on the floor beside him where it could no longer jut into his ribs. Plumping up blankets on a nice dry patch of floor, Escala made the man a bed. Now you sleep. We need you at your best. The sight of a tiny fairy tucking in the large man seemed ludicrous, but Polk and Henry were too busy wrestling with their dinners to speak out. Sleep tight. Lying painfully down, Joss gave a dissatisfied sigh. Who's on guard? I am. Escala forcibly closed Joss's eyes. I have to stay up and relearn all my spells. Polk, Henry, and I will take care of it, so go to sleep and relax. Busying herself about the campsite, Escala dragged out her spell references, a scrap of parchment, and a pen. She perched a rather attractive pair of spectacles upon her nose and looked across the rims at Joss, gave him a rather sardonic, challenging little smile, and then set about her work. Her pen scratched, the fire crackled, and slowly the Justicar began to sleep. Polk and Henry turned in, each wrapping themselves in drow cloaks to keep away the chill. They kept weapons close at hand and slept far away from the entrance. Private Henry watched Escala, so prim and pretty in the firelight, as she jotted down her notes. He managed a nervous smile when the fairy caught his eye. Escala waved her pen. Good night, kid. It's all right. She tapped her tall, pointed fairy ears. Anything comes waddling down the passageway, and I promise Pooch and I'll scream. The youth half wondered if it was a joke, but he decided not to look foolish and rolled over, too tired to stay awake. The fire crackled, Escala wrote, and slowly and surely her companions sank into a dead, silent sleep. Cinders grinned. Escala thoughtfully fingered his rents and cuts, then flipped through her little scrolls. Hey, Pooch, repair spell time. No, make Cinder sleepy. The hellhound's teeth gleamed. 
Cinders stay ripped. Stay awake. Don't worry about it. I'll be up for hours. Escala smoothed out the dog's pelt, then carefully spoke her spell and made the hide and fur go back to its usual pristine self. There we go. Now you just lie there and let it do you good while I warm my fairy butt by the fire. The hellhound purred, the repair spell stealing through him from nose to tail in a warm, delicious haze. His voice actually sounded sleepy as it drifted into a scholar's mind. Nice fairy. You know it. Escala wriggled in Cinders's fur, then leaned over to give the dog a kiss. Nighty-night. Night. The tunnels were remarkably quiet. There was no time, no night, no day, no heat, and no rain. Water dripped, and the campfire slowly died. Keeping happily to her work, Escala wrote and studied for an hour. While Juss slept, she dusted the big lug with a stone-skin spell, then made up her lost spells with another hour of careful thought. Finally, she looked at her list and nodded carefully, stifling a yawn as she tried to see if there were any possibilities she had missed. Another yawn came, this time wider than the last. Spell shields, black tentacles, lightning bolts, couple of magic walls. Cinders's fur was obscenely soft and silky. Escala lay with her head propped on her elbow, a little blanket drawn up over herself as she worked. A few... Another yawn. Few utilities. A charm. Charm monster spell. It seemed a good idea to rest her eyes for a while, then awaken Polk for his turn on guard. Full of good intentions, Escala never even felt herself slide beautifully off into the world of sleep. The fire died down. The uneaten bits of roasted spider cooled. Cinders lay in a warm, fuzzy daze, his tail occasionally twitching. In the caverns, all was peace and quiet as the water drip, drip, dripped endlessly from the mildewed walls. After a long, peaceful time, the sound of movement came from the passageway. Bumbling along the tunnel came a single, silly shape, a creature questing forward behind an absurd pair of long, thin feelers. Armored in a sturdy shell and searching the dark with addled eyes, the creature hunted after a particular delicious smell that seemed to quiver in the air. The scent came from the traveler's cave. Edging forward, the creature pat-pat patted with its feelers, tasting eagerly at the air. It stole forward just a little way, saw Escala lying on the hellhound skin and the other figures wrapped in blankets by the fire. The creature shrank and kept perfectly still, timid and frightened. But the only sound was Escala making little chipmunk noises in her sleep. The scent struck, sharp and utterly delicious. Overcoming fear, the creature edged slowly forward, then suddenly saw its prize lying on the cave floor nearby. Its feelers reached out toward the Justicar. A long tail tipped with strange propeller-like blades waved happily in the darkness as the creature carefully began to feed. Several minutes passed, then quite suddenly, Escala shot bolt upright in bed, her eyes wide open and staring at the dark. Dad, the sculptures of me were all fakes, I swear. The creature froze, then bolted off in panic, its belly full and its legs galloping off into the gloom. Far behind the fleeing creature, Escala collapsed back in bed. Sleeping the deep sleep of the just, she snored raucously for many long and uneventful hours to come.